Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kaboomen. This is a quick desktop support tutorial on how to share an extra drive over the network. So why would you want to do this? If you want to have a centralized point on your home network and you want to share a drive that has, for example, some media files on it or some important files that you want to have quick access to or simply take up a lot of space, and you want to be able to sit and simply access it from another computer on the network, this is how you would do it. One way to do that is to share it. So let's go through this and how to do it. Does it say that this drive here is the drive I want to share? It's called new volume and it's under letter E. We're going to right click it and we're going to select properties and then we're going to look for a tab that says sharing. We're going to select sharing and then underneath what we're looking for is a button called advanced sharing. We're going to select that and then we're going to simply do a check mark right here which says share this folder. And uh, one last thing that we have to do here in order to be able to you know read and write on our share drive over the network we have to change the permissions here which is super simple. We're going to select permissions here and we can see that by default everyone is allowed to do so which normally is fine and this is why by default you can only read but you cannot change or write or anything like that and especially you don't have full control so if you want to simply select full control and allow everyone that's on the network have access to this you can certainly do so and that would solve your problem however i like to add my own login because i don't want everybody to access it so in order to do that, I'm going to remove these. I'm going to leave it read only so that everyone can see it, but they can't make changes. And I'm going to add my own login. So if, if I click add, I can add my own login name, which is used for this computer where this drive is located. This is incredibly important. You want to use the login for this computer. So login name for my computer is Kaboomman0. And I'm going to, you can simply double check by click check names if you want, but I, I know it exists obviously. So I'm just going to click OK. Now we can see that it's there and it's under the name of the computer, which is called Kobuman, and the login name is Kobuman0. So this is important to remember here that the name of this computer where this drive is located is called Kobuman. So before we leave this pop up or before we leave this uh, box, we have to make sure that our login is selected and then we select full control. Because if you go down to here, we can still see that everyone only has read option. And then if we do select Kobume, we can still see that it is full control. This will allow us to create new files, folders, drop, drag and drop anything we want and full access to it. Incredibly important. All right. Now let's click apply and OK. After you click apply and OK, you can see that now this drive is being shared and it's indicated by two little guys here as an icon. Now let's go to the other computer and see what we can do to access this. Here we go. Here's our other computer that we're at. And now we just need to access it. So how do we do that? We remember the name of the computer, which is Kobuman, correct? We're going to type in backslash backslash Kobuman, and then another backslash, and we're going to type in the letter E, which was the drive letter for our drive that is being shared over there. I'm going to hit enter and there we go. We have access to it. But wait, this is under everyone. Remember, we didn't put in our credentials at all. It may ask you at some point if you're doing this for the first time to actually put in your credentials. But if you didn't get a pop up, you'll be using it on the default, which is everyone. So how do we rectify that? I mean, it's great. If you got the pop-up, you can just simply put in your login information, but this is just us able to access it. Let's go ahead and create what would look like just like a regular hard drive, and that is called mapping the network drive. So we're going to select our computer and we're going to select map network drive. Now let me go back, make sure you're at this tab where it says this PC and then select computer up here and then select map network drive. And here we can leave the drive letter to whatever we want. And then we're going to type in again, backslash, backslash, name of the computer, which is Kobuman, and then backslash, and then drive letter. One thing to make sure to do is place a check mark right here, which says connect using 
different credentials. This will let us specify the login we want to use with full control. And with a pop-up here, uh, we can see that um, I already tried this earlier, but let's go ahead and this is how it looked like. I'm going to click, you know, use different account. And then I'm going to type in the name for the login on the remote computer, which is Kobuman0. And then I'm going to type in my password and select, remember my credentials. You know, kind of remember to select that. Click OK. And now we're inside of our drive. You can see now it comes up as a network location. Another way to do this is add a network location, but I just map it as a network drive. So now that we go inside of it, we have direct access to it. We can create new folder. We can go inside, create new files, drag and drop, whatever we want. And it's all great and dandy. This is also a good way to use a remote drive as a backup location if you are doing desktop support. For example, let's say you're you know, reimaging a computer and you need a remote location to use as a backup for users profiles. This is a good way of doing it. So you have a backup. Also, if you're replacing your hard drive or something like that, that you need a good remote place to quickly backup all your files. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please share it or like it. If you have any questions, I am here to help you answer them. So feel free to ask me anything. Thank you and have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I will talk about Gmail in comparison to Outlook. Here's the thing. A lot of businesses are actually moving away from Outlook to Gmail, probably because of the operation cost when it comes to running Outlook servers and, and this and that. That's besides the point. The point is that I'm going to teach you on how to at least try to make Gmail look like Outlook, because what happens is a lot of users that are converted to Gmail from Outlook, they're going to look for similar features that are not apparent when it comes to using Gmail in comparison to Outlook. So these are the things I'm going to teach you real quick. So that way you can have an easier time dealing with the transition to Gmail for your business. And of course, this could also be very helpful if you're just trying to learn about Gmail for personal use. So let's look at some things that are actually identical when it comes to Gmail and Outlook. You can see on the left hand side, we have inbox and typical folders that come with Outlook. So when it comes to sent mail, drafts, um, you know, all email, spam and trash. Um, when it comes to some other things like categories, social promotion, updates and forums, these are not available in Outlook by default. Right. So when it comes to the left hand side functionality of Gmail, it's I'd say pretty identical when it comes to Outlook comparison. So that, you know, of course you can see that there is a button to compose and that's kind of self-explanatory. You click the compose and then you can create a new email just like in Outlook, right? So that's pretty similar. So what is here that it's kind of different that you kind of notice right off the bat? Well, you can see that Gmail kind of looks plain and that actually Google has been working on a little bit. So the reason I'm actually mentioning this is because this is an older version of Gmail. So what we're going to do is actually switch over to the new version of Gmail, which is what most people are starting to use now. So on the right hand side here, there's a little cog here. So for the settings, you can click it and then select try new Gmail, which should be the very first thing that shows up. So it's going to be look different. There's a new icon that loads up and it looks look nicer and it probably has quite a more quite quite a bit more functions that are better from comparison to the classic gmail which you can also go back to if you really wanted to as well right you can see now that on the left hand side things got changed a little bit and this is why i didn't talk about them initially first uh too much about them initially because it's slightly different we have a couple of different buttons there that are different so let me go over these real quick just so you guys familiar what they are you know what the inbox is i don't have to tell you this where all the main the main email comes through just like in outlook the second thing is called start here you can see there's nothing there well the point of this is actually same thing as if you were to flag 
as an important email in Outlook, right? Except it kind of groups it into one. So the way you do that is just select a little star, right? You click on it and it's just called it starred. All this is just kind of marked as important. So if you go back to starred, that that email is actually there. You know, that's like one way to marking like important emails. So if I disable that, it's not going to be in there again. And here you can snooze emails, meaning that you can, uh, you know, read them later, basically. So you can just set a different time and you can read them later. And I'm going to go over this real quick. And then we got sent ones, which is basic. And we got drafts, right? So when it comes to that, that's exactly what it said. And of course you have an important tab, which you can also use to um, mark other important emails if you want. In my opinion, I just use stared because I find it more convenient, but if you want to explore this, you can certainly do so. And of course we get chats, which is not available in Outlook. And we also got all mail, right? We have something like this similar in Outlook. So basically that happens in Outlook whenever you search for something, you can choose. So let's say I'm searching for a test email, then in the right hand side right here, when it comes to Outlook, and let me show you here. This is just something I was looking at previously. This is a broken Outlook, but I can show you nonetheless. If I type in test here, I can use a drop down here and just say all mail boxes. And it's gonna search all of them, right? Same difference when it comes to this here. If you select all mail, it will show all mail that is available so you can search through it, right? And of course you got spam and trash, right? All right, moving on to other comparison things that we need to adjust. So we make it look like Outlook at least so that the users have an easier time transitioning over. All right, so the next thing that most people are kind of missing here is a preview pane. Right now, if you select on this email from Andy from Google, it's just going to pop it up and some people like this, you know, this is fine. And whenever you click reply, and by the way, when I click reply here, it will pop up on the bottom like so. And it kind of looks like a chat box, doesn't it? This is one thing I don't particularly care for when it comes to Google, but it is their design. But nonetheless, it's similar when it comes to Outlook, except in Outlook, it a lot of times it's just another pop-up box. Um, of course, if you have preview pane enabled, which we will do right now, um, it's kind of similar to Outlook when it comes to that, right? So by default, the Outlook has a preview pane. Let me go back to inbox so we can demonstrate the preview pane. So whenever you select an email, it will have a preview. By default, the preview pane is on vertically on the right side in Outlook. So we're gonna enable that. If you go to settings here, which is a little cog here, it's gonna bring us, it's gonna bring us to our settings. So the next thing we want to actually look for is advanced tab, which is third to last right here. And this is why I didn't want to go through this on the classic version because it's a bit different. And you know, this one actually has more things when it comes to uh, settings. So it's going to be a third to last tab. And then we're going to look for our preview pane, which is going to be down here. So we're going to have to select enable for the preview pane. And we're going to select save changes. Now it's going to reload Gmail. And then we're going to have a another button that we can actually use to create different types of preview panes, which is actually right here. If you look on the right hand side, if you hover over, it says toggle split pane mode. And if we do that, it's going to toggle the mode. However, if you do a little drop down here, you can specify which do you, which one you want. So if you select vertical split, this is how it's, this is how it looks like. So if you select on any of these emails, let's click on Andy's email. We can see that there's a preview pane, just like in outlook by default. Of course, you can change this to horizontal split and it's going to bring it down here, right? Simply some people like it that way, you know, so that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I'm just going to go back to default, which is this, right? This is how it looks like, looks like on default email from uh, Outlook's default uh, format when it comes to email preview pane, right? So if we go here and select reply, it's going to pop up with our little reply. And this is kind of what Outlook does. It just looks slightly different, but Outlook kind of does the same thing when you have preview pane enabled, all right? So let me go ahead and remove that. And I'll actually go back to the reply part of it just so I can help you out. 
some some very basic things that we actually need to work on when it comes to setting up our Gmail properly to make sure we have a smooth transition. Uh, but let me show you how to change something real quick, which I personally don't care for. And that is a default feature within Gmail that basically groups all the similar emails into one group of emails into just one. For example, let's see here's a, a email from Google and there's another email from Google. Um, Gmail has a habit of grouping these similar emails into one group. So instead of just having two emails like this, it would say two just here and then when you click it, it would expand and you have the ability to actually use other, you can see the other related emails that came through and I don't like that because it kind of groups them together right i like to see individual emails like so right just like it is in outlook so we have to make sure that this is disabled if you are like me and you don't like your emails grouped right um so if you go back to settings here on the right hand side and then select settings this one is actually going to be in our general tab so we don't have to switch anything up here and if we just have to scroll down and look for conversation view and this is the thing that i was telling you about when it sees the emails that were the same topic are grouped together it's going to group them together if you have things that are with similar topics right or same topics if you will and it's disabled oh it's it's enabled by default so if you want to disable it just select conversation view off and now all the emails will be individual and that's how they would show up and that's the way i like it because I simply want to keep track of every single email that comes through. I don't want it to be to group. I don't want them to be grouped because that way I can miss, especially if there's, you know, I don't know, 20 different emails related to the same thing, you know. This is um, the way I'm setting it up to have an Outlook default feel. So we're just going to keep going with that theme when it comes to this. So the next thing we need to do is set up our reply signatures, right? You know how we can have automatic reply signatures same thing we we can set this up in gmail and then we if we go back to settings once more right we open up settings it's still going to be in our general tab and if we scroll down if we scroll down we just have to look for our signature tab it's very simple by default it's turned off but if we go here and select our radio uh, tab uh, we're just gonna click it right radio button i should say and we're gonna type in you know the typical stuff that you would type in you know and then you can sign off you know at i don't know cobalman.com you know and then type in your phone number you know 555 let's see 555 5555 right so typical type of signature that you know whatever you want whatever is custom for you once you insert that you can select save you have to always select save if you want any changes to take effect so if you go back here and we want to reply to andy we say reply right we can see that you know where where's where's our signature right we you know usually we would just say thank you and then we would type in body of the email you know and then blah blah right and i'm like okay where's where's my signature i like my signature to be right after i type things right after the body i wanted to finish off there here's the problem with when you set it up by default it actually doesn't do that and i i personally do not like that so what happens is if you if i click here show trimmed content it's actually going to show it that it's, it's going to show it as in the last thing after the initial email sent to me which doesn't make sense to me whatsoever why should i sign off on an email that was already sent to me by somebody else I don't like that. I want this, I want this to appear, to appear right up here, right up here, right? And if you're like me, this is how you will do it. Let's go back to settings, right? Settings. And then we're going to scroll down once more. And the only thing we have to do now is select here, this little checkbox. It says, insert the signature before quoted text in replies. And that's exactly what we want. Of course, we're going to have to save again. And now we go over here and try to reply to Andy. We can see that it inserted our signature right where we want it. So if I type in thank you, body of the email, blah, blah, 
I can see that my signature is inserted there automatically exactly where I want it to be. One last thing as a kind of a tip that a lot of people also ask is how to change this so it doesn't look so bright. I don't like it bright either, you know what I mean? So let's go ahead and change the art theme. But before that, let me talk about the calendar as one of the last things that I almost forgot to talk about. A lot of people, you know, like to use their calendar. I do, I love it. I love the reminders in Outlook. It's one of the best things that are part of Outlook. In this case, our calendar is on the right hand side here. And this is only available, I'm pretty sure, in the new version of Gmail. So if you're using a classic one, it means that it may not be there. I, we can double check. Let's go back to classic real quick. And hopefully it doesn't mess up my other settings. And sure enough, it's not there. You know, you have to kind of go over here and then look, you know, for the calendar. So if we go back to new Gmail, we can see that our calendar is actually on the right hand side. As soon as it loads, I know I selected it. There it goes. Okay, now we have our calendar which is kind of similar as Outlook, except Outlook's calendar is on the bottom, uh, like here, you know, that's where it's at. And uh, unfortunately, it's on the right hand side when it comes to Gmail. Uh, so uh, I don't think there's a way to move it, unfortunately, but let's go ahead and have a look how it, you know, just take a look how it looks like. So if we select the calendar, it's going to load whatever's available. And it says, welcome, you know, that's fine. And now it's just going to show it as default just for our for today right so if you have anything set up here it's going to show it just for today or you can just click on previous day forward you know any type of days that you want to look at right this this is something i don't necessarily care for because if you if you go back to calendar here it kind of shows the whole calendar right in outlook so unfortunately the only way to actually get to the full calendar thing that I know of, and I'll be very curious if you guys know a better way to go about this is to actually open in the new tab, right? So now, you know, now we have our calendar and we can actually change this to a different type of calendar that will show not just days or weeks, but even months or a year. So if you select that to months, we can see there are kind of looks like the Google's calendar in comparison, right? This is how I like it, right? So you can do that. And unfortunately, I don't think there is a way to do it. The, any other way to do it, unless you actually open it in a new tab as in like a full window, right? So that's one way you can make it closer to how Outlook looks like over here, right? So as I promised, last thing we're going to do is change the theme. So it's not so bright. If we go here, <laughs> on our settings tab and then we select themes we can choose from a bunch of different ones i personally i mean there are a bunch of colorful ones if, if you like that then you know just kind of play around i personally like really dark ones like this black one and then when i switch to that it looks so much better and easier on the eyes in my opinion of course this is one of those personal preferences so there you have it guys now we have our gmail set up to look as, as best as we could as the outlook, right? All right, guys, I hope you liked this video. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Share this video with friends if you like it. Leave a like if you like it. Hey, if you dislike it, click a dislike. That's fine too. But again, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I have a lot of other desktop support, help desk, network administration, system administration, web development and all kinds of other it videos including hardware if you want to check that out all right guys thank you so much for watching i wish you best of luck and have a good day hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. in today's video i wanted to talk about the program data folder this is different from app data folder which is something i talked about in my previous video if you're interested in that there will be a pop-up link right up here also at the end of the video it's totally different because it's not user specific. So what do I mean by that? So let's go ahead and find our program data folder. If we go to root of C, um, program data folder is actually within here, but you can't see it because it's set to be a hidden object. If you enable hidden items, program data folder will 
show up. So it's root of C and then program data. Once we go inside of it, you can see there are a bunch of different folders in here. So what is it? Th what is this used for? In my personal experience, especially when it comes to desktop support or PC support or any kind of administration, it's related to program data that it's not user specific. So for example, let's say we have an antivirus software, which in this case, this is it right here, ImmuNet. This is what I have installed on this computer. If we go inside of it, what we'll have will be just a simple data that's shared across all users that are using this computer. So you can see here, all it is, is just an installation part of it, right? So this is where it stores it. However, some older applications will actually have an entire application installed within program data. And then it's then used and shared by all users that are using this computer. Again, this is different from app data, which consists of configuration files and it's found under local profiles. And again, I highly encourage you to watch the video on, on app data. If you go to inside of local profile, you can see the app data folder and it has local, local, low and roaming. This is all configuration settings and data for specific programs within these files. Again, this is on another video. And if you want to watch that, please do. So if we go back to local C and pro, um, root of C and program data, it will have similar files within here. And this could be anything from entire application that's shared across all users that are using this computer or configuration settings like so you can see there's a bunch of them here right and this can also have just different executables that are related to any application that's being installed this is what i typically see nowadays and it can also have cache data and everything else but the main thing to keep in mind when it comes to pc support desktop support or help desk is that it can have settings or even entire program within program data. So this is usually, again, this is usually older program that may exist. Again, this is used for shared data across all of the users that are using this computer. And most of the time it's just data that you don't have to worry about. Again, if you go in, into any of these, you can see that it's just mostly just temporary data that you don't necessarily have to worry about or backup because it's shared, right? So whenever user, you know, is logged into this computer and they're using new profile they will have access to that and every and if the user decides to move the most important part that are within uh, their local profile which would be in roaming will be carried over anyways right so there you have it guys now you know in the nutshell what program data consists of and what its purpose is all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like it, share it, leave a comment. I'll answer any questions you may have. Don't forget to subscribe. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to Desktop Support Training Medley. This video serves as a training for someone who wants to do desktop support. So what I've taken is two of my very popular videos and created 18 various problems and solutions scenario for you to learn or test your desktop support skills. If you find that you can answer or deal with any of these issues on your own, well, congratulations, you are ready to apply for desktop support. If you like this video, please share it or like it. I really appreciate it and I wish you best of luck. Have a nice day. Welcome to top 10 desktop PC issues and problems. In this video, we will talk about top 10 desktop PC issues and how to resolve them. Of course, there are multiple ways to resolve any computer issues, and the ones presented here provide an example of that. If you know a better solution, please leave me a comment. I would love to learn about other possible solutions for any of these issues. If you are interested in additional educational material, my channel youtube.com forward slash Kobuman has over 300 videos that you can enjoy. Additionally, if you'd like to support me, you can do so through patreon.com forward slash Kobuman, link in description below. Number one, blue screen of death. Cause typically caused by driver or hardware conflict. Solution. Take a look at the dump file to figure out exactly what the cause of the error is. Alternatively, update hardware drivers 
or consider the situation in which blue screen of death happen. For example, you've installed new hardware or software. Also, you might want to run hardware diagnostics. Number two, missing DLL files. Cause, typically caused by incomplete software installation. Solution, reinstall software, find the missing DLL and copy it to system32 and or syswow6432 folder. Register DLL if needed through command prompt. Example, regsvr32 space and then the name of the DLL. Number three. Software or application will not install. Cause, not enough drive space. Newer version already installed. You didn't install prerequisite software. For example, VC Red Disk X64 ms.net or DirectX or not compatible with the operating system. Solution Free up space on hard drive. Look for previous installation of newer software. Install all prerequisites. Acquire compatible OS. Number four. Software or OS is running slow. Cause. Lack of resources such as RAM, CPU, or hard drive. Virus or malware infection. Missing updates. Solution. Open Task Manager and look for RAM or virtual memory allocation. Any applications use all of the RAM? Adjust virtual memory if necessary. Check CPU usage levels. Check your hard drive space. Through Task Manager, check the system processes and look for sketchy names using a lot of CPU or RAM. Virus can have similar name to common Windows components. Perform full system scan for viruses. If you have a virus that you can't remove, consider OS reimage or reinstall. Install all updates for your computer. Let them finish reboot. Updates can take up resources and time. As a side note, you can also upgrade to an SSD storage for a huge boost in OS performance. Link in description below. Number 5. Computer restarting multiple times. Cause software or Windows updates, or a virus. Solution. Let the Windows updates finish. Windows updates alone can restart the computer many times, 
and take a long time. Run virus scan. Number six. Suddenly, applications or computer behaving abnormally. For example, software keeps crashing, missing files, or runs slow. Cause. Virus infection or hard drive going bad. Solution. Run virus scan. Check Windows system logs for NTFS system errors or other or other hard drive related logs. Replace hard drive if necessary. Number seven. Internet or website issue. Error. 404 page not found. Cause. Page is missing or deleted. Wrong website link or website is down. Solution. If specific page is missing, search the website for desired content. Double check the website link because it may have been changed. If all pages are 404, contact website owner. Number 8. Computer is running hot. Overheating. Cause. Poor airflow. Not enough system fans. Dust or dirt accumulation. CPU fan not working. CPU heatsink is loose. Power supply unit fan is not working. Computer case is open. Overclocking, room or ambient temperature is too high. Solution, add system case fans. Clean your computer from dust. If CPU fan is not working, replace it. If CPU heatsink is loose, attach it. If power supply unit fan is not working, replace power supply. Close the computer case. Stop overclocking. Lower room temperature or move the computer. Number 9. Low memory RAM or hard drive storage. Cause. Too many programs open, such as games, video editing software, large Excel spreadsheets, and etc. See Task Manager. Hard drive storage too small. Solution. Close application that use too much RAM and only use one at a time. Perform this cleanup to free up space. This should remove recycle bin, download folder, cache data, temp files, old operating system restore points. Alternatively, you can purchase more RAM or add a second hard drive link in description. 
Number 10. Very slow internet. Cause. Too many downloads at the same time. Too many computers sharing internet connection. Bad Wi-Fi signal. A virus or malware infection. Solution. Limit downloads. If too many people are sharing internet, you can limit or set max speed in router for even distribution of bandwidth. Check Wi-Fi signal distance and adjust in router. Check PC for virus or malware infection. Reset router. Call internet provider. Question number one. When using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not reachable by using a host name. What would be the troubleshooting steps to take in order to resolve this issue? Keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on and on the same physical network. First, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. Also, would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the main if it has been added. Second, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, it would determine my next step. For example, if message is cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. Third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable with IP address. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it could indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. Lastly, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. However, this is unlikely if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for the same time. Question number two. A user has transferred to another department within company and their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? First, I would ask the users if they move to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. Second, if user has not moved to another machine, I would check the Active Directory if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for user's new department are affecting the ability to create, view, or edit files, which could also be the reason for not seeing certain desktop icons. Third, user may have received a new domain login ID, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. Lastly, if any of the situations described apply, I would act accordingly to resolve the issue. If users' files are located somewhere else, and if permitted by the company's policy, I would transfer them back to user. Same goes for any software that is missing. Question number three. Your office receives a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. How would you go about installing this printer in direct IP printing setup? First, I would unpack the printer and make sure that it has all parts and cables. Then I would connect and plug in the printer into power and network port available at designated location. 
Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it and acquire a driver package for a specific model of the printer unless the printer is set up to push the driver automatically and upon request. Typically, printer would push the driver. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added to the domain, and this can be done by assigning a printer hostname and adjusting GPO settings that allows the users of that department to use that printer. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. Question number four, what is the best way to install OS on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any automated systems available. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to domain. This can be assigned through Active Directory. Third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS install media to use, for example, CD or USBs. Afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. Lastly, upon image completion, I would ensure that each computer has a host name attached and is added to domain or workgroup. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. Let's just pause for a few seconds here. As you may have noticed, all of these questions require you to explain your way of doing things. I also have top 20 desktop support questions and answers that talk about specific technical aspects of the interview. Link in the video description below. Question number five. From a desktop support point of view, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? How would you deal with users affected by this change? First, I would make sure that users and their management is aware that this change is coming and how it will affect them. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This can be communicated with the network team. Third, I would reach out to department managers to coordinate the switch so that the production impact is minimized. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. Lastly, once all testing on a new domain is successful, a green light would be given to convert all other host machines to the new domain. Question number six. The entire building is switching over to the gigabit network and you are to assist with this process. How would you handle this project? First, I would work with the network team to decide on the new IP network ranges and make sure that certain machines receive static IP addresses. Second, if any network cables need to be upgraded, it would be coordinated with members of desktop support and the network team. For example, CAT5E is a minimum cable rating for gigabit speeds. Third, if any changes affect printers and other static devices such as servers, this has to be communicated to users and make appropriate changes to each machine. Lastly, the most important thing would be the testing part before deployment because there is a chance that certain applications require firewall exceptions for their IP or our range of IP addresses. Question number seven. One day you come into work and find that major systems are down. However, you also see that ticketing system has 50 plus unassigned or unworked tickets. How would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with both problems? First, I would ask which systems are down and how many users are impacted. This will determine which issue to work on first. Tickets would be the last priority. 
Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own if possible. If issues are not related, in that case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assigned individually if manager is not present. Third, I would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manage specific aspects of systems affected. In this case, support team is essential to resolve major issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. Lastly, once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work, then I would concentrate on resolving tickets unassigned. Of course, it goes without saying that during crisis issue, all of the management would be notified of progress and solution, and lastly, the root cause. Question number eight. Explain a situation which you had to deal with difficult problem and how you went about resolving it. First, an example in which I had difficulty resolving happened all the time, and this is due to not having immediate access to systems involved. Anytime I had to deal with a server network or website issue that I don't have access to, I would have to involve other groups or members of IT, IT team to assist. Second, a more specific example would be a web-based systems application stopped functioning, which affected 500 plus users. And since I don't have access to the application server, the support team for that application was immediately contacted because the issue was affecting multiple users, which means the issue is not local due to that fact. Of course, the first thing I would look at is the error information that would provide clues to what the issue may be. Third, I would gather all information related to the system outage, which would typically include number of users, specific errors, example computer IP addresses affected, time the issue occurred, and also test to see if issue persists using alternative methods. To make sure that this issue res is resolved as fast as possible, this information is crucial. Upon having this information available, appropriate support teams would be contacted. Lastly, I would work with the support team and users affected to help resolve the issue by providing feedback and testing as required. In the meantime, it is also important that management is aware of the situation and receives regular updates on the matter. This includes IT and users management. If you appreciate this video, please leave a like or share this video. Thank you so much and I wish you best of luck, my friends. Hello everyone, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today we're talking about an extreme situation in which we have to configure 1000 computers as soon as possible. What has happened is, in this situation, your manager, your boss comes to you and he says, okay, last night, 1000 computers received this brand new application. However, it failed to configure and we need to configure it now. And we don't have time to redeploy this application with configuration files that are needed to make it work. So we need to do this right now as soon as possible. So how do we go about figuring out how to resolve this? Let's have a look. So let's get this going. First thing we need to figure out is the host names for 1000 computers. So host names or PC names, right? It's the same thing. Piece host name or PC name is exactly the same thing. What are they for 1000 computers, right? What are they? We need to find these out because we need to find this out because we need to connect to them remotely, right? So how do we find out what our PC name is? Well, we would just simply go to our computer properties and look at what the PC name is, right? In our case, See where it says computer name, um, it's test-pc. So let's say this first computer is test-pc. Chances are the next computer on our network will be test-2, test-3, and so on, right? So we need to know what are the 1,000 PC names that we need to connect to, right? 
and I'm sure you can get this, right? The reason I'm explaining this like this because a lot of beginners in desktop support are watching my videos and I'd like to explain things just like this, you know? So now that we have 1000 computer names, we need to figure out how to configure this new program. For the sake of demonstration, let's assume that Immunet here, this program is the program that we need to configure on one of 1000 of these computers, right? So in this case, let's just go ahead and open up and see where it's, where it's located. So if you right click it, if you right click it, you can select open file location, and now we can tell where it's installed, right? This is the installation um, folder for this program. We can tell it's installed in program files, regular program files, which tells us it's a 64 bit uh, application. And as opposed to 32 bit, if it was a 32 bit application, it would be installed in program files x86. But we know now that it's a 64 bit, that's therefore it's installed in program files under ImmuNet, right? So, and it's actually within here that it was pointing to. So now we just need to figure out what are these configuration settings that we need to change, right? Chances are if your boss came up, came to you and he said, okay, I need you to configure 1000 computers, he will tell you exactly which values need to be changed and to what, right? But sometimes you just kind of have to figure out yourself. Um, if you're unsure what settings need, what settings need to be configured, you would simply open up the application, go to settings and look for the part of it that will that will point to the value that you need to use for configuration, right? Of course, it's going to be different for every program. So it's not something I can find within here, right? But this is what we need to know. You know, we need to know, you know, what are the values? You know, what are the values? Is it IP address? or something else right depending depending what needs to be done right so we need to know some of these basic things before we proceed to go to registry moving on let's go ahead and open up our registry editor um, this will be um, located in our start menu and then in the search box type in reg edit this is by the way identical in windows 10 so you, you don't have to worry about that windows 7 windows 10 registry editor is virtually identical so now we know that we have a 64-bit application called ImmuNet. Let's go ahead and find it. Let's go ahead and find it. And we need to look for it in our H key local machine registry string. So let's go ahead and expand that. So it's always going to be H key local machine for the program that's installed for everyone to use, right? If it, it's some, there are some occasions where it will be, some programs will be installed for specific users, but that's not the case. It's fairly rare too. Okay, so we need H key local machine, and then we're going to go down to here to software, right? We know it's software, so this is kind of self, uh, self explanatory, which is actually nice because a lot of people are afraid of registry editor. And uh, yes, you can break things, but you can also do a lot of good things. So let's go to software and go ahead and expand this. So now, we are we have we see a bunch of things here and and don't let this scare or anything like that uh, so so not, so since we know that this is 64 bit application we need to actually look for a f uh, registry uh, name that it's called wow 6432 node um, and this is only found within 64 bit operating systems if we go back here we can tell that this is a 64 bit operating system here right 32-bit operating systems will not have this WoW 64, 6432 node. Without going too much into that, let's go ahead and expand this because we know our software will be in here, right? And sure enough, here's our ImmuNet Protect registry settings for, for this application, right? So next thing we need to do is look for a configuration file. And here are, in, in, our, config, in, in our case, it says here it's a configuration file, right? And we can tell um, that there are some um, settings within it that we can adjust, right? So when we look at this, we can see some numbers, right? It says, this is just an example one created by my by yours truly. So if we double click this, we can see that there is a hexadecimal version of it, right? If we actually click on decimal version, you can tell that it's just one, two, three, four, five. So if you have to, for example, just type in 
and you know let, let's say it's a an IP address that you have to type in you would just go back in here and type in your IP address instead of one two three four five for example um, if we change these things see how now the six hexadecimal version of one two three four, okay one two three four five right hexadecimal version of that is three zero three nine which is reflected here right I really want you to see this because sometimes it will not actually be numbers see it's three zero three nine that's the hexadecimal version but it's actually decimal version is one two three four five as you can see here in parentheses right but if we change this let's say for example to one six five five for example and we go here to hexadecimal it's going to be six seven seven but if we just go type in here one six zero it's going to be b1 it's going to be a zero right so sometimes you will see a combination of letters and numbers here as the hexadecimal version of that right so this is the this is just something to keep in mind but generally speaking this is what we need to change right this is what we need to change right okay so now that we know that this is the part of the software that we need to make adjustments on we can figure out how to do this it, it's very simple for each remote thousand computers that we have right let's go ahead and close this okay and now we need to connect to each one of these computers remotely it's very simple now that we know our names our computer names we can just simply go here file connect network registry and let's say type in test dash pc and then we click check names i know it says here enter the object name but it's actually the host names and if we click check names it will actually find it in our work group the name of our pc which is here right we already we already talked about this it's called my computer's name is test pc and sure enough it found it under our work group that this virtual machine is connected to this is uh this computer is actually on in this work group and it's called test pc so if you're in the desktop environment chances are well it will just it'll be slightly different it will just have a domain name before the name of the computer but that's fine same difference and if we click ok here it will actually create another underneath here it will create name it would say test pc it would say test pc here and it would have maybe not all of these registry settings but it will have majority of these settings and hq local machine will be one of them chances are really high so once we click ok it will actually create a sub menu it will just be called test pc it will, it will say test pc here and it would have these settings in here right so it, it's not going to do it now because this is the name of the pc it'll just say you cannot connect to your own computer right but you can get the idea that this computer once we connect to it let's say we did test 2 and i can't do it right now because i actually don't have test 2 computer connected to this network right uh, this is just virtually speaking uh, when we click ok it will pop up with the exact same menu and now that you are connected to this remote computer you can do the same thing we just went through here open up hk local machine go to software expand that go to software expand the software look for a 64-bit version of this software find it and then we have our configuration settings of the remote computer here we can go back here select decimal if we want and change this to 55555 or whatever it is that you need to change it to right and now you can see that it it, it changes in real time and you're done and you're done you close all of this go back here connect network settings go to the next one test test 2 dash pc click ok it will connect to the next one and then you go back here rinse and repeat expand software wow 64 bit i'm um, 64 bit right and then <laughs> select the munet go back here to the next one and, and let's say let's say we changed our, our settings let's go to 666 click ok boom done next and this way you can actually configure a lot more computers at once sure you can create a batch script that will do this for you and that's very very much more advanced this is just a quick way of uh, in my opinion the, the the quickest way of figuring out how to configure all of these computers at once guys i hope this 
video wasn't too complicated and, and that I went slow enough so you guys can understand the point of this and, and, and how you can actually configure a lot of computers at once you know so with let's say thousand computers you can actually do this within I don't know an hour rather than going to thousand computers yourself logging into manually look for the application setting within the application let's say you open it up and you have to where is it is it under settings here where is it where do I need to do this and then you have to you know go in there and you type it in and then you have to close it and then you go back in and you have to log off the computer and then physically move to another next one right instead of spending days maybe even weeks on trying to configure 1000 computers like that with registry settings you can do this within an hour you know within an hour let's say two it's still better than weeks or even a month depending how busy you are it's not like it's not like you have no other things to do right thank you guys so much for watching if you like this share it with friends if you're interested in science and technology news i have a new website it's called cosmicnovo.com do check that out share this with your friends and i hope you guys uh, enjoyed this Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuma, and in today's video I will show you how to create an archive folder within Outlook. As a desktop support personnel or help desk, you will be doing this a lot. You will get troubleshooting tickets that simply ask, can you create an archive for me or can you help me locate an archive file for me? Be sure to stick around because I will show you the difference between a PST and OST file because they're quite different and the reason why you should know this and its location within user's local profile. So let's get to it. There are a couple of different ways to go about creating an archive file. There's a longer way and there's a shorter way. I will first show you the longer way, which is if you look to your left hand side on the upper left corner, there's a, a button called file, which is right up here. It's usually yellow like this. Go ahead and select that. This will basically take you to your account settings. Within here, or when you just need to select account settings and then account settings once more. And here, when we have this pop up, it will be a second tab over here where it says data file. Once we select that here, we can add an archive file. If you want to add an archive file, you would simply select add. And here you will basically choose a location for your Outlook archive file. In our case, this is the default location for, we're just going to leave it at that. So we're just going to rename it to our new archive. So that way we can find it and I can show you exactly where it's at and just go ahead and select OK. Now, if you noticed on our left hand side right here, a new thing has appeared and this is our archive folder. So let's go ahead and close this so we can see what we have here. This is our new archive. And if you expand that there's really nothing there besides delete items folder and search folders file. If you want to recommend the users, you can simply say, if you want to create new folders within, you can simply do so by right clicking it and then create a new folder. They can name it whatever they want. Let's say they can call it inbox, right? They can call it inbox. And now they have an inbox folder. And if they want to drag and drop things from their inbox, right now mine is empty, but if there were emails right here, they would select on their main inbox and they would dra drag and drop their files that they want to store inside of this archive folder. You can also set up a rule that basically moves all of your old emails into this new inbox. And you can set this up based off of how old it is. Let's say if emails are older than you know six months, have them automatically moved to here. And again, you can create new files or I should say new folders. Let's say this is just a, a name, let's say uh, uh, old emails, right? Let's just call it old emails. Now we have a folder called old emails. And if that's what you want to do, that's fine too. But in a nutshell, this is how you do it real quick. Another way to do it is just from within here. And this is a little bit faster. If you select this second icon here where it says new items, if you select that and go all the way down, see where it says more items, let that expand and then move to the right. And you're going to have an option to select Outlook data file. This essentially does the same thing. And this one, we're just going to call it second archive. And a lot of people that need help with this will also have, chances are we'll have multiple archives. And then once we select that, then we're going to have our second archive folder here that we can do the exact same stuff that we did with this previous one, right? 
Now, let me show you the difference between that and an OST file and where these are located. So let's say somebody, you know, contacts you, let's say your help desk or desktop support, and they say, hey, I can't find my archive file. Well, I'll show you the default location where they are located. I'm just going to minimize this real quick, and then we're going to go to our root of C, right? And then we're going to go to user's local profile, and this is located in the root of C. And then we're going to select users. And here, in our case, we're logged in as the administrator. So whatever their login uh, login ID is, that's probably what's going to be the name of their local profile in here. So let's say I logged in with Koboman1. This is where uh, the archives would be that I've just created. However, I'm logged in as administrator, so I'm just going to go inside of that. So just to kind of go back real quick, we are in a root of C, right? Root of C, folder called users. And then we selected the name for the login of this user. In my case, it's the administrator. The Outlook archives are by default located in our Documents folder. So if we double click Documents, we will see our Outlook Files folder. Once we open that, we can see all the archives that we created, right? So let me just go back here again because I really like to show this as slow as possible. So it's root of C, Users, Login ID for the user that's logged in, Documents, and then Outlook files, right? Now, this is not to be confused. Uh, okay, let me show you real quick here what the file extension of this is. You can see that it's a .pst. This is why it's called a .pst. This is why it's also called a .pst, I should say. So Outlook data file, also known as .pst. Now, this is different from an OST, which will, which will be located in our app data. So let's go back to our um, local profile. So we're inside of our local profile. Now we need to go inside of an app data folder. In our case, it's by default app data is set to be invisible, but we know it's there. There's a folder within here called app data, right? It's hidden by default. Um, so in order to go to it, we can just simply type in backslash app data, and it's there. Now we're inside of our app data. Just to kind of go over it again, root of C, users, name, login name for the person that's logged in. In my case, it's an administrator, and then app data, right? Now we're going to look for our OST file. And the next place, a couple of more folders that we need to navigate, the next one is local, and then Microsoft, right? See? App data, local, Microsoft. And then one more, which is also called Outlook. Now, once we go inside of this, then there won't be a file name in their OST at all because I am not connected to the Exchange server right now. As you can see here, there is no, I'm actually not connected. But once you go in here, there will be a file with similar icons as the, uh, the archive folder, but it will be called OST. The difference between that and the archive file is that the OST is essentially offline version of your inbox. So let's say you connect to the Exchange server, the first time you connect, it's going to start populating this. All of this is going to start to get populated because you'll have emails, this and that. Well, that has to go somewhere, right? Well, it's stored inside of the OST file, which is typically located here, right? I'm just going to create a file here just so it's better, easier to visualize. And we're going to call it, um, you know, offline email, right? Because I really want you guys to understand this. And the extension will be OST, right? It'll be something, the way it's going to look like is actually going to be similar to, uh, basically, a lot of times it's the uh, name of the user. So in our case, it's the administrator. So it'll be their login ID, and then, you know, some, you know, numbers or, or letters, you know, depending how it's set up. But it's going to be offline email for that user, right? So that's how you would basically reset it. So let's say there are any issues with the inbox, their local inbox, not the archive. You would basically go in here, right? And then you would delete their OST file. You delete it. So when the user goes back in here, it's going to be blank. They're, all their stuff will be gone, but it will be, it will repopulate. On, underneath here, you would see that, you know, when it connects to the Exchange server, it's going to say updating the folders, and it's going to eventually update this, all of this. Well, since I already have you guys here, let me show you something real quick, and that is how to reset email. So let's say a person's profile is corrupted, their email is corrupted, and there are issues that, uh, you know, it causes an email. You know, they can't receive, they can't send, this and that. 
one way to reset their email profile is if you go to control panel i'm sure you guys know how to you know go to control panel if you're in windows 10 just type in control panel and if you're in windows uh, 7 or something older you can just go to start and control panel all right once you have control panel open look for an icon called mail this controls basically everything that is about your mail except you don't have Outlook open. If you have Outlook open, you won't be able to make any changes. So make sure that Outlook is closed before you mess with these settings. Go ahead and open up your mail, uh, double click your mail icon. And here you can view your email accounts. So if you select email accounts, let me slow down here, I guys. I don't want to go too fast. So if you select email accounts, you will get this pop up and it looks similar to what we did earlier, right? It's, it's identical. It's essentially the same thing. If you go to data files here, we can see our archive files. Here you can remove them add them this and that and of course if if you want to add somebody's uh, archive folder you can certainly do that let's say it's not added here and it's not visible in their outlook this is how you do it you just click add and then you look for it right you will look for it find it and click ok and then then it's going to appear on their left hand side then that way they can see their outlook um, archive again right here we can delete also delete and remove email accounts if you select new we can connect to the exchange or you know do whatever we want and that's how we would add a new email account uh, this user cannot you know log into it this and that but how do we fully reset it right let's go ahead and close this and the way we to do that is by removing the profile for the user and that would be the third tab down here right if we click on that the second tab here is just same place we were here a minute ago right a second ago i should say for data files right so it's essentially the same thing we can get to from here but anyways what i'm talking about is profile email profile right we can reset this and create a brand new profile that everything is brand new to it i mean there's a way to reset this if you go manually and look for the folders uh, that, that are related to this in app data this and that but this is an easier way for you guys to uh, actually do it and it will just do it for you so if you select show profiles you can see that i have one profile this is mine profile let's say this one is corrupt well we can actually create a new one so if we just click add and we name it new profile right let's call it new profile click ok now we can collect uh, select new profile right we can, you know, once it connects, you put in all the information, it's going to create a new one here, right? So I went ahead and created a new profile, right? Now we have a new profile. So how do we actually use that new profile, right? Well, if we go back in and just click OK, whenever the user launches Outlook again, it's going to go to their old one, right? And why is that? Well, because we haven't selected a new profile. So if we open it back up, go to Show Profiles, we can see that there are two of them, right? But what we need to actually change is always use this profile down here right and then we need to select it and check new profile right and then click apply click ok and now when the user launches outlook again it's going to create a brand new profile it's going to reset everything for them and hopefully resolve all the issues right all right guys thank you so much for watching i try to make this one as as clear to understand as possible just a reminder, I have a Patreon page if you'd like to support me. Uh, there's a link in the description box below. Also, I will be posting this video on Twitch. I'm thinking about actually using uh, using using Twitch for some live sessions, uh, I guess free tech support or whatnot. So if you're interested in that type of stuff, please let me know in below. And then I might set up a, uh, a scheduled type of, I guess, meeting, if we will, where you guys can ask me questions. We can resolve some text tech related or it related desktop support issues together thank you so much for watching guys i appreciate you very much have a good one bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. Today's video I wanted to talk about processes and services found within Windows 10. It will be similar with Windows 7 if you're still working with Windows 7 operating system. But mainly this is for desktop support, for example, you get a trouble ticket. And the issue is kind of unknown, but you know that the user is, you know, reporting issues with performance or there's a certain application that doesn't run properly or refuses to run so one of the things we would have to look at is processes or services you know i mean there are many situations in which this could be useful it just depends on the situation you know on the issue at hand and we just have to spend a little bit more time and trying to figure out what it is that might be causing an issue right so obviously the first we uh, the best way to get to the processes and services is through our task manager, right? So I have it open here, but obviously, you guys, I'm sure you know this already. If you right-click on your taskbar, you can just select 
uh, task manager also if you do control alt delete um, you will get to a window where you can simply start the task manager so let's start from the top and here you can see right off the bat that there are some programs that are taking up a lot of CPU power right if yours is not sorted like this you can simply select this column so click on it and it will sort it out whether you want it to display the highest used first or last by the way if you recently or never opened up a task manager on your computer it will look just like this it will not have any details it will just have the last application that you have open running like so you know in order to bring it back to what used to be default in windows 7 you would simply select more details here and it would expand it expand it back to what i consider as normal okay so here we are again and now we know that there are a couple of applications now using up most of our cpu so let's say your trouble ticket says my computer is running slow you know and then you can look at this here and you can see that in my case obs 64 is taking up most processing power so what is this obs 64 see this is the next thing we need to figure out if we are suspecting that this is the software causing the issue for the user we have to kind of figure out what it is it, it, unless you're familiar with this you it could be anything it's you just know that it's taking up a lot of processing power and quite a bit of ram right so if i right click on it right first of all i did went ahead and expanded it right there's a little arrow here if you click on it you will expand it and you can see other sub sub services or sub processes that are running underneath it right this is one thing that windows 10 is doing it's kind of grouping the same uh, processor or the processes for the same application within um, under under the same tab if you will so now that expanded we can see individual things that are running so what is this why what is this it's causing issue you know i could just right click it you know and and task and that would kill it however it would also there's a chance that it also might come back if it's a part of part of the processes that belong to a certain program that the user is using we don't know that yet so we have to figure out what it is right the first thing we have to look at is what is this process where is it coming from why is it you know taking up so much power uh, so much cpu power on this computer well we can find that out right so what we got to do is right click on the actual process and it's not this top part of it right this is just a tab this all tells us is there are three different instances of, of processes related to the same application the actual process for this application that's taken up this much power is this one right it's obs 64 the actual process right so if we right click it and select properties we can see some details about it right we can see that uh, you know its location what kind of uh, executable is we can tell that it's installed in c program files x86 and we can tell it's obs studio so right there it kind of you know tells us well what is this studio when, when you think about studio you can think a couple of different things right off the bat video recording audio recording something like that right so that's a hint right there and we can tell that it's located within bin folder and it's also uh, under 64 bit folder right so this is a typical normal application uh, format for the folders that you would see in, in within root of c right so if we click on details here we can see a little bit more information about it we can see the last date it was modified which was in march 1st 11:04 a.m so we know this uh, application executed last time there right at that time i should say so that's all great right this looks okay we don't see anything you know super super sketchy right however we can also find out more right if we right click again on our process and go to open a file location it will open up that folder location that we looked at within the properties of that process and here we are program files x86 obs studio bin 64 bit and now here's our process it automatically highlight, highlights it for us right which is actually really cool right we know that this is the process that it's running in the background and it's causing um you know it's, it's using up a lot of cpu 
So now we know that it's there. And, you know, by looking at different things here, we can also kind of uh, get a hint that this will deals with AV, which is audio video. And we, we, can tell, we can tell it says it's Kodak. And then there is an AV filter. And then there's AV format. So what does that tell us? Just by looking at those hints, we can probably assume that this is audio or video software, right? As if, as, as just like we hinted earlier, right? And the reason I'm explaining it to you in such a way so that you guys can think uh, for yourself whenever you're troubleshooting these type of issues so you can figure out, is this application okay or not, right? But in fact, if I were to, you know, um, you know, uh, Google OBS 64, it would tell me that OBS is simply screen recording software, which indeed is running for us right here, right? So that's how you can find out what type of process is causing the slowdown for the user's computer, right? And you can also at the same time figure out, you know, what kind of software it is. Be even before you go to Google and search what it is, right? Of course, if you worked for the company for a while, you'll you'll probably have a good idea of what kind of software should be running in the background, and something like this wouldn't necessarily be there, right? We certainly wouldn't want to have a recording. Well, you know, we know that users are recorded, in, you know, within businesses, but this type of software wouldn't be recording it, right? So this is certainly a no-no. So let's look at a couple other things that that are present here, right? So let's let's look at uh, I'm just I'm just gonna pick a random because they keep fluctuating right here, but I'm gonna pick a random one that just comes up. So here we go. Uh, okay, client server runtime process. Let's look at that one, right? I'm gonna see what that is. We know that it's a Windows process right off the bat because it's located within the C Windows system 32 right this is where most of our you know dll's are located anything that uh, would be registered uh, through registry right this is just a regular process that runs in the background um, th hence it's located within c windows system 32 client server runtime process um, in our case again we can go to our let's see if i can catch it real quick there it is I think I caught it. No, system runtime, <laughs> client server runtime process. There we go. I'm going to open file location, and here is our C Windows, um, C colon Windows system 32 folder. This is our systems folder, and sure enough, it's right here. And it, again, it's highlighted, and we can say, and we can see that it's been installed, um, and you know modified, I should say, um, 9/29/2017. So it's been on this computer for a while which is actually a really good indicator um, unless, you know, unless, you know, it would be, it would be kind of crazy to have a virus installed for this long on, on the computer and nobody notice, you know what I mean? So most of the time um, having something this old running in the background as part of Windows, um, you know, processes in the background, it's perfectly fine. Again, if you're unsure what this is and, you know, let's go ahead and do this, right? Client server runtime process. Let's go ahead and look that up in Google, right? And it'll give us a little bit more detail of what it is. Client server runtime process, right? You Google it and it's uh, it tells you right there what it is. It's a client subsystem, is a component of Windows NT family of operating system that provides the user mode side of Windows 32 subsystem and is included within those. So this process uh, this application has been around since Windows 3, Windows NT 3.1. Perfectly safe. So now you guys have a really good idea on how to troubleshoot these weird uh, processes that might be running in the background. Now, as I promised, we're going to look at the services, right? Let's go ahead and look at the services. Now, services are important in a way where you have to kind of consider um, what it is that my computer needs when it comes to operating smoothly? And what I mean by that is that certain components of Windows um, or a Windows operating system and certain applications requires 
these services uh, require certain services to work um, at certain times. Some applications require them to run at the boot up, at the boot up of the computer, at the login of the user, and such and such. Otherwise, the application wouldn't work. One example for that is printing, right? If you don't have a printing service enabled after you reboot the computer, the printer service starts and that allows you to print, right? As simple as that. And that particular one should be here somewhere. There it is. Print, it's called print spooler, right? This is the service that runs in the background that allows you to print. As simple as that. And of course, you can get to the services if you just go in here and just type in services, right? It gives you, it gets you to the same thing, all right? You can find print services, right? Here we go. Print spooler here. And we can tell also that it's running and it's automatic. So how do we know it actually starts automatically. Well, if we if we have it here, if we just double click it, we can tell that it's automatic and it happens as soon as your computer restarts, right? And of course, if you stop it, if I click stop here, now I can't print anything. At the same time, some businesses, in order to save paper, you know, environmentally friendly or save ink or whatever the reason may be, you can actually disable this. So if I disable and click apply, now nobody can print on this computer ever afterwards unless you have administrator privileges to change this back right so i'm just going to change it back to automatic which means that it will start up whenever it's needed and on the reboot right it's going to restart itself so right but you know after you enable it you have to obviously click start again to um to get it going again so that's the point of services. Some applications require services to run in the background in order for them to function properly. And some of them are simply part of Windows operating system. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I hope you like this video. If you have any more questions, please leave them below. I also have a forum website at koboman.com if you'd like to check that out. Don't forget to like and subscribe, share with your friends. Thank you so much. Again, have a good day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kubum. In today's video, I'm going to show you how to restore users' favorites. This happens a lot with desktop support or help desk. You get a troubleshooting ticket. The user says, my favorites are gone, this and that. Well, there are a couple of reasons why that could happen. You either uh, reset users' Internet Explorer and they reset some of the settings so they can't find their favorites, or a lot of times user just deletes them or simply forgets that they moved their favorites, right? So let's have a look why would this happen. So let's say there is an issue with the user's website and you just want to reset their Internet Explorer. You do a full reset. Now let me show you how this is done you go to the internet options and if you've done this before you know exactly what i'm talking about so if you go to internet options and you do a full reset if you do reset advanced settings and then do a full reset and then you delete their personal settings this and that you will remove all of their basically settings for ie so they're going to assume that their favorites are gone however what this happens is especially if the user has you know, uh, favorites bar with a bunch of favorites, their favorites bar is simply removed. So how do we do this in IE? And I will show you this, how to do this in Chrome, just in case uh, your business uses Chrome for some reason. And it's very similar. And uh, when it comes to Firefox, it's very similar to IE. So I'm going to omit that for now. So if you want to bring back uh, somebody's, uh, you know, a bookmark toolbar, you would simply right click in an empty place right here and then select favorites bar. And now their uh, favorites are back, right? So we're done with that one. Now we know if that's the issue usually, this is usually what happens basically there they would say oh they're missing you know this and that but they're actually not they're just their favorites bar is missing now let's do this in chrome real quick um so in chrome it's a little bit different you, you know you can't really get to that part if you right click up here so it's a little bit different but however there are these three dots here like a sort of like a vertical dots if you just go ahead and click them some people call this uh I've, I've heard people call this many different things but i call them three dots so let's go ahead and click these three dots and then simply go down to bookmarks and then show bookmark toolbar right so there we have it now their toolbar is you know their bookmark toolbar is restored now they have their favorites back so they should be happy now let's say they're actually missing 
the favorites. I'm gonna show you real quick. And this kind of ties in with my previous two videos that have talked about um, users' profiles. And their location of their favorites is always going to be under um, root of C, users folder, and then users login name. So whatever they use to log in into their computer, it's gonna be under, the, there's going to be a folder named this, and then their favorites. So let's have a look for mine. I'm just gonna go real quick here. You know what, let's just do it like this. And then uh, root of C, right? Users, and there, that's my login name, B-U-C-O, right there. So if I double click on that, there's going to be my favorites folder. If I double click on that, you can see that my favorites are here. So this is going to be my regular favorites here. Favorites bar is going to have a separate folder, which is that, right? So if we compare here, you can see that MSN and Google are in my favorites bar, which is right there. So if we go back once to just regular favorites, there's only Bing as in uh, bookmark. And if we look at our bookmarks, if we click on this little star here, we can see that it's only Bing here. So that's how we find out whether where their favorites are. And if they misplace them, if you simply find them, you just go in here and copy paste, right? They'll be just links. Basically, that's what they are. Favorites are just links with icons. So if you go and find the backup of their favorites somewhere else, you would simply just copy paste them in, whether you want them in the favorites bar or simply in their regular favorites. Now, while you have, while I have you guys here, let's do something real quick. Um, if you use Google, uh, by default, you don't see a home button. A lot of people miss this. So this is a really quick tip for you guys. In order to get to that, in order to restore the home button, that's usually either on the right-hand side or left-hand side, depends what you're used to, whether you're using Firefox or Internet Explorer. One way to restore them in Google Chrome, which is missing by default, if you click the three dots again, and if you go to settings, and what I, you know, I usually don't, uh, um, you know, uh, I, I like just like in Windows 10, you can do a search and just to kind of help you find certain things. But in this case, we don't have to do a search. Like for example, I would type in like home button here, you know, just type in home and it would kind of get me to there. But basically we're looking for this setting that says show home button. Now let me move back here so it shows default. It's actually, uh, let's see here, a second thing after appearance. So second thing down, it says show home button and it's disabled. If you just click on that little button there, it's going to show it, right? And then you can basically set whether you want it to be a you know certain thing, let's say Google, google.com. Sorry, I was typing with my hand and actually holding my microphone in, in the other. So that they'll basically set their homepage to that, right? So now they have their home button. It's right back here. So when we click on that, it's going to go to google.com. All right, guys, this was another desktop support quickie. I hope you really like this one. Um, I just want to mention this real again. I have a Patreon page if you'd like to support me. Link in the description box below. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, like, comment, share with friends. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Bye-bye. So let's get to it. This is from a question number seven. One day you come into work and you find the major systems are down. However, you also see the ticketing system has 50 or more unassigned tickets. What would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with this problem? So here's the thing. If you're being interviewed and somebody asks you this, they want to know what you find as a biggest priority and what you should do when it comes to production impact. So this is incredibly important. The way I would explain this would be in four different steps. Be first, second, third, last. So that's how I would explain it. The reason for that is so that the potential employer can realize that I, you know, that I know what I'm talking about, that I have the basic knowledge, not to sound egotistic or anything, it's just that I have basic and even general knowledge on how to deal with a situation where you have to prioritize your work. So first, I would ask which systems are down and how many users are impacted. This will determine which issue is to be worked first. Tickets would be the last priority. So here's the thing. If a large number of users is impacted by a system that is down, then that's definitely something you would prioritize. So think about it. Let's say there's a company with thousand people and system major system is down. That means we have thousand people that need to be, uh, you know, they need to go back to work basically as soon as possible.
So this is why we need to prioritize this. This is some of one of those common sense type of things. But yet, you know, a potential employer wants to know this. And this is also good to know if you already are working help desk or some kind of desktop or tech support, right? It's definitely more people than 50, right? And then, then after you're done with that, tickets would be the last priority. Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own if possible, depending on what the issue is. If issues are not related, and in this case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assign individually if manager is not present. So this is incredibly important. If users report that multiple systems are down, which is directly related to the question, then there is a correlation there. Chances are that all of these systems, if they went down at the same time, chances are that they are somehow related to either servers, or databases, or whatever it is that they all are, they, they all have relation to. So chances are you might want to handle this issue on your own to make it a more proactive uh, situation handling because it's all related to one thing. So basically what would happen is you see that multiple systems are down, right? And then you realize, you know, especially if you have the experience working for the company, chances are you will know right away, okay, yes. Um, okay, wh what's wrong here? This website is down. Uh, this application is down. And this other thing is down. Are they any way related? Then you, if you, if the, you know, if the answer is yes, then you can say that okay, just let me know which ones, how many people are affected, how many users are affected, I should say, and then I will report this issue to the people that have access to these systems. Meaning, let's say database is down. Chances are you doing tech support at the location or help desk that you won't have access to the to this database for a specific system. I mean, there could be hundreds of systems that are used by a company, you know what I mean? So you might as well handle all of this or chances are you'll have a crisis bridge or, well, this is what we call it at my company, but there is a bridge or a conference line that you would call and the uh, person on the other line would basically be the mediator and they would handle, um, you know, the, the kind of logistics part of it as in, you know, they would ask you, well, how many systems are affected? Which ones? And then you'd give them all this information, how many people, this and that. And then they would say, okay, all right, I'm going to start the bridge and I'm going to start paging people, meaning that he's going to reach out to proper people that you may not know who they are. If issues are not related, in that case, I would recruit help from coworkers. Means that if it's not related, you cannot handle multiple issues especially if it's a big issue, you know? So you ask your coworker, hey, can you help me out with this? And chances are they will, because you know, hopefully you work in a, in a, at a cool place like I do. <laughs> uh, anyways, and possibly assign individually if manager is not present. So, you know, chances are a manager would handle um, assigning off uh, this different uh, situational issues to other coworkers, but if they aren't there, it, if, if, if it's a legit place, and I, I mean, I shouldn't say like that, if it's a cool place to work at, and then everybody is on equal terms, equal expertise and this and that, chances are they will help you and you can just ask them, you know, can you help me with this? So it wouldn't necessarily be assigning individually because manager is not present, but you would basically recruit them to help you out, recruit their help to help you out deal with other issues because you can't possibly handle uh, multiple issues that are not related, right? I mean, it's, it's that, that's what I would suggest, especially if, if it's a huge issue. Because think about it. Think about it this way. If multiple systems are down and they're not related, how can you possibly acquire information that these uh, application owners or sys uh, database owners or s server owners, how can you possibly give them the information um, to that? For example, let's say, Okay, how many people are affected? And you say, um, I don't know, a, a thousand. Okay, give me some examples. So you have to handle this. You have to go to the users and then you would have to ask them, okay, uh, can you give me this information? Basically, you have to get a lot of information 
for a certain system in order to troubleshoot this properly. If they are not related, you can't possibly work with two, two different teams on two different issues efficiently. Third, I would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manages specific aspects of systems affected. So that kind of ties into what I was saying earlier. You want to have all the information ready because they will ask you, okay, how many people, which systems, can you give me an example of IP addresses, which link they're using, if it's a website, well, which application are you using, which uh, version of the application are they using. All of this information you have to have ready if you want it to go smoothly. You know, yes, you can, you, you can forget something. You can forget to, you know, get which version of the system it's being used or, you know, whatever else. That's okay. As long as you have the majority of things ready, that way it will mitigate the uh, production impact. In this case, support team, uh, su in this case, support teamwork is essential to resolve major system issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. So yeah, everything, everything that I'm talking about here ties in to everything that I said previously. Support team is essential to resolve major system issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. You know, after you reach out to all these people that support these different applications, you have to have a good teamwork with them in order to resolve this properly. Lastly, once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work, then I would concentrate on resolving tickets on a side. So yeah, I mean, of course, it goes without saying that during crisis issues, all the management would be notified of progress, solution, and root cause. So this is, you know, very important. Once you come across an issue, you would want to report the statuses or give the status updates to all the management, um, including your own manager, but the management of the people that users report to, because they would want to know why do we have thousand people not working? So you want to send them updates periodically. Usually, this is usually done with just you know email. You send a group email to all the management of the departments that are affected, and maybe some of the users, and um, that way everybody knows on which page you're at or which page you're on, I should say. So that way they know that you're working on it, and usually every half hour you can send. You know, this is this going to depend on, on the place you work at and what your management, what your manager requires. But usually what I do is every half hour I send status updates. That seems like a, a, a good time frame to do so. So that way they know what's going on. And then once it's all resolved, um, you would provide a root cause to the management. Not necessarily the management of the users, but to your boss. And so that way your boss can follow up with these application owners and uh, work on you know making sure that this doesn't happen again and then we can concentrate on resolving tickets that are unassigned of course you know you, you just go back to work <laughs> and work these 50 plus tickets that's a lot of tickets if it's like just you to do good luck doing it all in one day but hey it's possible i don't know there might be some simple ones so let's go ahead and look at question number two that is within this article and um, the question is, a user has transferred to another department within the company and their local profile is missing many files and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? So let's go to look at the first. I would ask the user if they moved to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine, right? So if somebody literally switches computers, of course, that new computer is not going to have those files that are stored at, at the other machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. So if the new computer does not have the same program, of course, it's not going to have those icons. So let's have a look at an example of how that looks like. Here is a brand new login or brand new local profile created for this computer and if I go inside my downloads for example it will be empty because it's a new computer if I go inside of documents 
it's going to be empty because I moved to a new computer. If I go to desktop, it's going to be empty because I moved to another computer. And this is just a shortcut to Microsoft Edge. And what I'm talking about, missing files. So it's going to miss all those files that you created on the desktop. So let's say, let me, let me show you here what I mean. So if I go here and create a, you know, just a new file, it's going to show up under desktop. So that's considered, a, you know, new file. This here is just a shortcut to the file. So, of course, you move to another computer. You haven't transferred any of your files. You haven't, you know, moved them to another computer. Of course, it's going to be empty. So that's why I explained it in such a way. Second thing is, let's say you missing icons for the computer. Of course, you're just going to have whatever's installed on this computer. This computer just happens to have Audacity, Google Chrome, OBS Studio, Open Office, you know, and etc. But if you happen to have, you know, Microsoft Office and you had a shortcut to Outlook, to Excel, to anything else on your desktop, of course, it's not going to be there because this computer doesn't have that installed. Okay, now let's go to the second uh, part of that answer. Okay, and second here it says, if user has not moved to another machine, I would check the Active Directory um, if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for users' new department are affecting the ability to create, view, or edit files. So let's have a look what I mean. If someone has been moved within Active Directory or their domain, chances are that their permissions to view, edit, or modify files have been changed, which could reflect on the way things look like on their computer. So if somebody moved to another department and that department has new restrictions in place where it doesn't allow them to view a lot of things which can be modified, for example, you would go in here and look at this PC or previously known as my computer in Windows 7, chances are they may not even be able to see this. They may not even be able to see local C, let alone any files that are within the hard drive, right? Because changes on the domain level or within Active Directory have suddenly, you know, are suddenly preventing you or the new user to access, view, or edit any of these files. This sometimes happens. Some departments have more restrictions on their users or on their associates. They don't want them to do certain things. They don't want them to view certain things. So suddenly they got migrated to the new new uh, part of the Active Directory where they have more restrictions. This has replicated and chances are whenever they go in here, they won't be able to see any of this. So. Uh, by the way, one way, if, if you're missing, if you can't see local C drives or any of these drives listed here, you can just simply type in C. A lot of times that's actually open like that. So let's go ahead and have a look at our third part of this answer. User may have received a new domain login, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. So if somebody, you know, moves to a new department and they decide to tell them, okay, now you're going to use this login. You know, when they log in, it would be just like this. You know, they log in and it would be just like this. Their new profile. This is their new profile that they got. Their, their new login is their new profile, right? And it would be empty. It would be empty just like this. So what is the reason for that? It's because their old profile has all the stuff. So let's look at root of C again and our users folder. Once we go inside of here, let's say, and, and this is the fact now, I am using this one, right? YT login. That's my login ID right now. If I previously used this one, everything that's inside of that, it's going to stay inside of that. So now I'm suddenly using this one, of course it's going to be empty. So in order to restore that, obviously you will go back inside of this, go into the, you know, if you have the permissions, obviously, um, go inside and, you know, copy paste all the data that's within their documents and everything else, 
on their desktop and just restore it back here, you know, into their new login. And that's the reason for that. Any time you change login ID, it's going to, you know, create everything brand new and you know all the old stuff is going to be located on the old profile which you can transfer back okay now let's have a look at uh, my last last thing that I would say within in the as a as an answer to this question uh, with you know during an interview lastly if any of the situations described apply I would act accordingly to resolve the issue if user files are located somewhere else and if permitted by the company policy, very important, I would transfer them back to the user. Same goes for any missing software. So what I'm saying here is that if, if it's a common practice for their company to create backups, I would restore all of their, uh, all of their documents to them. And I would also transfer all the software that they used to have to the new computer if they happen to move to a new computer. Of course, this is all, you know, depending on the company's policy, their manager at the new department may say, nope, they don't need this. So of course you would double check that to make sure that that is allowed as well. So this is very fun thing to think about because this happens a lot in desktop support where you know, suddenly all, everything's missing and they don't know what happened because users don't know. And, you know, sometimes they'll panic and they would go and they're like, oh, I'm missing everything. Everything's missing. And you sure enough, you go in, desktop is pretty much empty. Documents are empty. Everything's empty, but they don't know what happened. So hopefully you help them or you been notified ahead of time. So if you're a local desktop support, uh, hopefully you've been notified ahead of time that this person is moving to another department and then you can help them, you know, by creating, you know, you know, a backup of that, of their local profile or simply moving it from one computer to another, which you can simply do over the network. You know, you can just simply go through the back door and just type in backslash backslash two backslashes name of the computer, you know, name of the computer where they used to sit and just type in C and dollar sign. This should be able to access their old computer. And once you do that, basically it will just, you know, it will basically get you into the root of C like this. It would just say the name of the computer there rather than just C. And then it would say name of the computer would C, you know, backslash C. And then you, in here you can just go, you know, what is that? What is their old profile? And then you find it. And then, you know, usually what I do is, you know, I go like this, desktop, documents, I would highlight all of this, usually their favorites. Then I would copy and then access her or his or her computer remotely that they're using currently, you know, go back here, find their new profile, whatever that may be at the, the other computer, and then just paste it, you know. Um, usually it, it didn't, it didn't like that because I did it on the same login. But if I go into and find another login, it would simply just update the profile or the folders that are there. It's not going to create duplicates. Then that only did that because I did it on the same local profile. All right. So let's get to it. The question is your office received a new printer and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. So keep that in mind, it's for a specific department only. How would you go about installing this printer in a direct IP printing setup? The direct IP printing setup also being something to remember. And the way I would start to explain this, I would say first, I would unpack the printer to make sure all parts and cables are there. Uh, then I would connect and plug in the printer into the power and network port available at designated location. Also designated location here is very important to keep in mind. So obviously um, for when it comes to this, you know, you get that giant box and you know, these are large printers for businesses. You know, you unpack it 
and then you make sure everything's there, right? You make sure it has all parts and cables, and then you put it together, plug it in, and you know, plug it into printer into power network port at the designated location. Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it. And that kind of goes back to our designated location. For this designated location where we have placed our new printer, we have to kind of take note of the port that is there for the network uh, cable that is connected to, right? We, we, we would know, okay, well, this is the port number for this, you know, for this location. And then we would talk to our network guy or we would do it ourselves and make sure that we have a static IP address available and assigned to it. So let me show you what I mean. If you go to your network adapter properties and look at the those those settings there, you go to properties, right? And you would make sure that you have a static IP address available to you. So if you have a static IP address that you want to use for that port, uh, this can be assigned um, through the switch itself and that port would simply just use that and it would never change. And that's the whole point. It's static. We don't want it to change because we want users to connect to it every time. So when you go here into the, the Ethernet adapter properties and select Internet Protocol version 4. If your company is using uh, IP version 4, you will go in here and if you have to, you would specify the static IP address. So I'm just kind of showing it to you on the computer itself, but this is what you would do inside the printer. You would say use this you know, IP address if this is something you have to do. This is just me explaining to you what a static IP address is and why you would need it for a printer so that users can always connect to it and know where it's at. So that way they can install it on their computer afterwards. And I'll show you that as well. And also I would acquire driver pa package for the specific model printer, unless the printer is set up to push the drivers automatically upon a request. So if printer for some reason doesn't come with driver package or software. Obviously you would go to the manufacturer website, download all the drivers that you need. So let's say it's an HP computer, it's a HP printer. You would go to HP and specify model, get this information. And then the reason for that is if needed, we would um, basically go to Active Directory and tell Active Directory to push this driver, but just kind of hold on to that thought uh, because most new printers automatically push the drivers. So if it's a brand new computer, a brand new uh, printer, it would automatically push the driver to the user that is trying to install it. And I will go back to the Active Directory part that I've uh, that I've uh, that I spoke about. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added. So this is where that comes in. It needs to. Be, it, it would know. It needs to know that it's added and it added to the domain itself, right? Active Directory, you know, domain. So what happens is you would take a host name, you would create a host name for this printer. You would assign a host name and then you would add it to the Active Directory. So that Active Directory knows that there is a printer connected to this domain. So that way it can control who can use this printer through GPO or a group policy. And what this does is it only allows certain users of that department to use the printer. So basically, once you have a group of people, group of users for a specific department, you can literally just add all of those people into the permissions to use that printer that's been added to Active Directory. So Active Directory is a simple, simple way to control who can who can use the printer and who cannot. And that kind of goes back to our part uh, where it's kind of related to the driver package. If you have to specifically get the driver package, you can set up Active Directory to push the driver as somebody tries to install it. So, uh, but again, new printers will just do this automatically on their own whenever somebody tries to add it. 
and that is done by the uh, static IP address or the host name. And this is why I talked about it here. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well and in Active Directory. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. So of course, you would have to help them because that's your job. Remember how we talked about a static IP address here? Well, your printer with the static IP address that you assigned it to would be used by users or you would do it for them. Let me just pull up my printers menu and here we would add our printer. So the way we, we would do it, we you know with printers um, menu, we would simply just select add printer. So now it's searching for the printers, but usually you saw how that little that popped up this link. It usually doesn't find it right away. So you have to specifically tell it. So with the users, when it comes to users, you would simply give them the IP address and say, hey, this is the IP address for this printer. Just add it in there and it's going to automatically install it for you. But a lot of times you would do it for them. So you just click this printer that I want isn't listed because it's not going to find it most of the time. And that's okay. And now we have this menu that you may be familiar with. Uh, and remember how we talked about that IP address? Well, here it is. We can add the printer using TCP IP address or host name. So we can either use the IP address or the host name. Usually what I do, I just, you know, go by the IP address because uh, it's, I don't know, it's just the way I prefer it, but it really doesn't matter. So you have select that and then we would select next and it brings us to this menu. Here we would, for example, just type in the, you know, IP address that we've assigned it and we would, in my case, I'm just going to, you know, come up with an IP address. Let's say it's 192.168.100.1. So let's just assume that that's where our printer is located and that's its IP address. And something to keep in mind when it comes to installing the drivers, if it's a newer printer, you'll be able to simply select the check mark here if not selected. By default, it is, I believe. And what that does is queries the printer. It pings the printer and says, hey, do you have a driver? And the printer says, yes, I do. And it then automatically installs it on your computer. So that's pretty awesome. Um, if you don't, you can later on specify the driver that you want to use. But this should be set up so it automatically does it. And then simply you will select next. And it's going to look for it. And then it's going to install it. Of course, I, I forget to mention the printer may have a port assigned to it as well. And uh, you would simply type that in after the IP address that I showed you. Okay, let's see. Uh, lastly, I would notify the users, the new printers, and the IP address. I said that already. And that was the last part of this. If you have any questions in regards to this, I know this is a little bit complicated. And that's the whole point. The title of this article is Top 10 Hard Desktop Support Interview Questions and Answers. Because, you know, you have to explain your steps on how to do this and I wanted to make these type of videos so you guys can kind of learn from this and to at least make it as easy to understand as possible. All right, so let's get to it. Number four, what is the best way to install operating system on 100 computers manually? Meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any automated system available. So typically in a large business, everything's automated. If you were to receive 100 computers, you can just connect them to the network. You would get host names for them and you would assign them, you know, which operating system to install, which programs need to be installed as well. And everything would just be done automatically. You just kind of sit back and relax and everything's done. This is why this is a hit difficult question. And this is how I would go about it. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. And that will tie in a little bit later here. I'll explain that. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. So since I don't have an option of automation, I would make sure that these computers are kind of gathered together in, in uh, preferably in, in the same room. I would connect them together, power them on and everything like that. So that way they are uh, there for easy access for me to, you know, schedule a lot or, or 
start to reimage process on a lot of them. That's the point of that. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to the domain. This is why I was saying, first, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on so that afterwards, I would acquire host names for each machine so they could be added to the domain. And for this to happen properly, all the computers need to be connected to the network and turned on. So this can be assigned through Active Directory, also known as the main controller. So you would go inside of the Active Directory and you would create 100 computer names, also known as the host names, and then you would assign them accordingly to all of these computers that are being re-imaged and uh, with, it, with them being connected to the network makes it an easy process. Okay, third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS installed medias to use, CD or USB. So this kind of goes back to my trying to keep them in the same area for easy access. And that's exactly why. So that I can use install media on them. Um, afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. You see how everything kind of ties, ties in. The way I would do things, it's kind of systematical and everything kind of goes back to itself. This is a great way to tell your potential employer that you have a really good way of thinking on how to resolve these big issues because, you know, trying to install operating system on 100 computers and doing it in a an acceptable time frame, you got to know what you're doing and have a good plan. You know what I mean? So lastly, upon image, and image completion, I would ensure that each computer has host names attached and is added to the domain or a work group. Work group um, usually is used, you know, in a small type of business. So I wouldn't necessarily worry about that if you're interviewing at a big company. But, you know, you got to make sure that is added to the domain and host name attached, meaning that associated with each computer. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. And that kind of goes back to the part of automation that I mentioned earlier that normally happens is you select the type of software that you need and it would install it automatically. In this case, you would have to do it manually, install any software required per department templates or requests. So if somebody needs Microsoft Office professionally installed, this is what we would have to do manually for each computer. And, um, you know, you would have to kind of get that information to make sure you don't spend too much time installing stuff um, on, that's unnecessary stuff. You know what I mean? Because you don't necessarily have to install the same program on all of these computers. Because who knows? doesn't mean that all these computers are going to the same department. So they may have different templates that you would use and go buy. Anyway, let's get to it, guys. So this is question number five. From a desktop support point of view and not Active Directory, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? And how would you deal with users affected by this change? So it's a two-part question. And uh, the starting of it says, from a desktop support point of view, meaning you're just a guy that works tech support, right? So this is not for somebody who is interviewing for network administration. Because when I say here, not Active Directory, that would mean somebody who is a network admin, that's the part that they would deal with and not necessarily somebody who does desktop support or tech support, if you will, right? And um, how would you deal with the users affected by this change? Incredibly important. The way I explain all of my uh, answers um, is in four part format where I go from first, second, third and a last point or explanation that I give to the potential employer that might be asking me this type of question. The reason for that is so that they know that I know what I'm talking about or that you know what you're talking about as well. So that's a good way to basically present your knowledge to them so they can see, oh yeah, this guy knows what he's talking about. Simple as that. All right, let's get to it. So first part of my answer would be, I would make sure that users and management is aware that the change is coming and how it 
will affect them. So I would let them know, I would go to the users and you know their management and uh, let them know that this change is coming and I would tell them how it will affect them. So the way I would do this is, you know, there are a couple of ways you can do this. You can go to them directly and, you know, go to the management first and tell them, hey, we're going, we're going to do this. There's a big project coming. Uh, we are switching all the users. We're switching everybody to a new domain. You don't have to be too technical about it. You just kind of have to get them a gist of it because they don't, they won't necessarily know the technical parts of, of any of this. Or you can just send an email um, to everybody that is being affected. Uh, but a lot of times management will say, okay, we will handle uh, the part of letting the users know. So this is just something you would have to figure out. But the reason for that is when you switch to a new domain, uh, there are a couple of changes that could happen. Uh, users could get new local profiles. And let me show you what, what I mean here. Depending how it's set up, depending how things are set up, I'm, I'm going to wake up my here uh, my uh, remote computer is asleep. Uh, in case you didn't know this, this actually pings the computer to uh, it will wake up um, as soon as you do it a couple of times. It takes like three seconds, four seconds, and then eventually it gets you to it. OK, so let me show you what I mean. When it comes to switching to a new domain, if you look at somebody's local profile, in this case, I'm using YT login, as you probably caught that uh, earlier. And um, chances are pretty high that if I get switched over to a new domain, the that I may get a new login, or it would be the same login, but it would be a different domain. So ch chances are what I'm trying to say is that a new profile might end up being created next time they log in because they switched over to the new domain. So it might look something like this. So instead of just being called YT login, in my case, it could be called, and let me just create a new folder here just to show you, a, um, a kind of fake profile just to show you what might happen next time you log in. So it might say ye, YT, <laughs> I said ye, YT login, and then it might be just something like this, dot new domain or something like that. And it would specify that, you know, you have now everything that's in this one, original one is there, but this one is empty. You get it? So that's what might happen. However, in a, you know, uh, perfect world, I wanna say, I have everything set up so that I have to provide admin privileges to make any changes. So in a perfect setup, this would just basically move all the files um, to the new login or to the new profile that I just showed you. So all the files that they had in documents, favorites, all their stuff would be moved over or they would have a different way of just making sure that everything is migrated properly. But you do have to let people know in case things go bad. They would, you know, they would log in next day and they would, wow, wh wh where's my stuff? You know what I mean? That, and that's, that's what might happen. So you just got to let them know to be ready for that. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This is, you know, obviously, guys, very, very important. Every time you work on a project, you want to make sure that you have some testing done. And uh, the way you do this, pick a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. Now, in this case, we are also assuming that computers themselves are also going to the new domain right that would perfectly make sense since users are going to the new domain of course all the computers will be going to a new domain as well so this is something that has to be tested and the way you would do that you would just choose a few machines and then you would communicate this with the network team this is why i kind of uh, said from a desktop support point of view and not Active Directory because chances are you would be working with the network team with the network team on this and they would deal with the Active Directory part of it. So you just tell them, okay, I have, I don't know, let's say five machines, convert them to the new domain and then you can log in and test it. Third, I would reach out to the department managers to coordinate the switch 
so that the production impact is minimized. This is kind of self-explanatory. Um, you would basically just talk to the department managers and the, or managers in general to kind of uh, pick a good time to do this. So you don't want to do it during business hours or anything like that because that would be a production impact. You know, what if it doesn't work? Then you got a lot of people, potentially a thousand people. Let's say you have a thousand people at your location that you support. Then everybody might be down. But this is a huge, huge deal. So, you know, we got to make sure we do that. And of course, with those five or few machines that you picked, you can have actual users, people to use them and test them. You don't, you know, you can do testing yourself, but the best way to do it, in my opinion, is to have actual users dedicated uh, that they can test this for you. And you can talk to the managers and say, hey, I need five people to test this. And then you would test this over time. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. And the reason you would, you know, involve testing of applications and website access is because the firewall settings. If the new domain already has exclusions um, for the firewall, um, then that's fine. But if it doesn't have the same exclusions as the old domain, then chances are some of these websites and applications may not work because the firewall would be an issue. So just kind of keep that in mind. These are things you have to test before you proceed with converting everybody. You know what I mean? So um, the last thing we want to do is once all the testing on a new domain is successful, a green light would be given to convert all other machines to the new domain as well as the users. So, you know, once everything's working fine, no, there are no problems with the testing, you can, you know, you, if, if you feel comfortable with it, you can convert everybody at once or you can just, you know, do, I don't know, 50 at a time or something like that. You know, this is something, you know, you would uh, kind of decide for yourself and depending on, you know, it's very situational. You know, all the businesses are different. Some businesses may not be affected that much by it. It all, there are so many factors, guys, that you would really have to kind of kind of decide on your own as you're doing the testing. And this would come just from being familiar with the place you work at, you know? Let's look at this first question that uh, we are going to uh, talk about today. And uh, it's related to when using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not, not reachable by using a host name. So let's see what happens when you normally try to connect to a remote desktop. I'm going to open up a remote desktop here and I'm going to connect to my computer that's called Tech Support. This is a host name for this computer. Now, not to be confused with the IP address. You can also connect using an IP address to a remote computer. So instead of just typing in tech support, which you would normally do when it comes to a business environment, you can also type in, and let's see, ping tech support. You can also use its IP address. And in our case, this is a version six IP address, which we would use to connect to it at computer. So in a type of, uh, in a business type of environment, chances are you would see a normal, you know, standard type of IP address that's just, you know, regular version four. And, uh, and that's perfectly fine. So instead of using the host name, you would type in that IP address in here and it would connect the same way. But normally all you would do is just type in the host name, uh, click connect, and then you can type in your login ID, which I already have. It's called YT login. And then you would, type in your password and it would connect just like this. Just a moment, let me switch my picture here real quick. There it is, okay. I almost needed to troubleshoot that first. So this is what happens when you connect to a remote computer. Now, you know, you can pretty much do everything that you would normally do and that's the whole point of remote desktop. So this is normal. But let's see what happens when I know that a computer is turned on and we try to connect to it. 
So my other computer is just called Kobuman. And on it, I have um, it, the remote desktop is disabled. So when I try to connect to it now from this computer, it's going to fail. And uh, we'll see what the errors are. You see, it says remote desktop can't connect to the remote computer for one of the reasons. Remote access to the server is not enabled. So what is that? What is that? Well, let's have a look. If I go to properties of this computer, so you go to properties of this computer, we can see, okay, I just want to make sure I have this. Okay, there it is. It says remote access to the server uh, to the server is not enabled. That means that when we go to advanced system settings here, okay, and it's asking me for admin privileges so I can access this. If you go to the advanced system properties and go to the far uh, right tab, which is called remote, this may be disabled like so, right? That might be the cause, and that's what that is talking about. I don't know if you saw that. It actually flashed it for a second. I thought it was going to disconnect it, although I didn't click apply or okay or anything like that. So, um, and the next thing that it says here, uh, the remote computer is not, is the remote computer is turned off, which is not, or a third, the remote computer is not available on the network. Right. So those are the key factors for a successful remote desktop session. However, if we go back to our question, it says here, keep, keep in mind the remote computer is turned on and it's awake and it's on the same network. You see, it says keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on, awake and on the same physical network. So that's not the problem. So what, I would, what would I do? What would I do? The way I would answer this question or troubleshoot this is um, well first of all if this is an interview type of situation I would you know present them you know few ways of going about it and what it may be this is just to give the potential employer or a future employer um, an idea of how I troubleshoot things and also that I am indeed knowledgeable and know what I'm talking about so I would have first second third and last example of what it could be right so my first idea would be, well, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. And uh, the way you could check that is by going to the Active Directory. You see, you, you, you just see if the, you know, if that host name is there. For example, we used here, you know, Kobuman as the name of the host. So I would go inside of Active Directory and say, hey, is Kobuman, as in the name of the computer host name, is it in there? or not and then go from there and then also I would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the domain even if it has been added so of course it could be part of the main but it could also be disabled so once once it's part of a domain or active directory if you will you can have a host name in there but if it's disabled then it's not usable right so second second thing I would try to ping the computer by using the host name if an error comes up uh, if, if an error comes up, it would determine my next step. So we did a ping here for the tech support. And uh, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the other one since we started doing that one. Let's ping Kobuman here. CMD ping Kobuman. See, there's another proof here that the computer is turned on. We just can't reach it. And... Uh, the, it, this is a normal ping. It's a zero loss. Zero loss. That means the computer is turned on and everything's fine. There's a perfect, there's connection there. We just cannot connect to it as we've demonstrated earlier. So what could be the problem? Let's go back to our answer for the second. For example, if the message is, it says cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. So that kind of goes back to me connecting to a computer just by using an IP address. So, and that, my third part of that actually ties into that on what the reason for that is. If there is an issue with DNS, 
meaning that uh, the main name service, the main name service, I think I got there, DNS, the main name service, the main name system. I think that's what it actually stands for. Uh, basically, what that does is resolves, um, it basically takes the host name, in our case, Koboman, and tells uh, the, the server or other computers on the network what the IP address for that is. So Koboman, as the name of the computer, is basically just uh, an alias, right? And the DNS basically takes that and it translates it and it forwards it to the correct IP address automatically. So if I can't connect to the Koboman by using a host name, but I can connect using the IP address like this, like this, if I can, <laughs> if I can highlight it. All right, control C. If I can connect to it just like that, without any problems using the IP address, that means that there is an issue with the DNS. That means the DNS is not doing its job. It's not taking Koboman and translating it into the IP address, which it should be, right? So if that works, you know, by using an IP address, then, you know, that's fine for now, but there is an issue. Um, third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable via IP address. And that's exactly what that what I talked about previously. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it would indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. So, right. So, you know, another reason is, you know, if the computer has, you know, if there is an issue with the DNS, chances are it didn't replicate. So, you know, maybe the computer just got added on there and or it got moved or something like that. And the DNS server could not catch up with the change. It doesn't realize that it moved to another IP address. That could also be an issue. But generally speaking, if it ca if you cannot connect uh, to the remote computer using just a host name, then uh, but you can with an IP address that indicates just a DNS issue. And lastly, if physical access, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look, or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So basically, if I go to the computer physically, if I have physical access to it, you know, um, if I am at the location there working for some kind of tech tech support there, um, I would go to the computer, log into it, and look at the D DHCP settings. So what is that? dynamic host configuration protocol settings that are on your adapter. So I'm going to look up my adapter here and look at the HCP settings. I'm going to go in here, change adapter settings. Here is my local Ethernet too. I'm going to look at the properties. And gonna look at the pro properties and then I'm gonna let's see where is it internet protocol version 6 so we know we were using internet protocol version 6 so we're going to double check that and then we're going to check at this if this needs to be configured manually we would have to do so otherwise this should be just set to automatic and this is usually what you would see in this type of DHCP setting now, not to be confused with DHCP server itself, that's different. That's your actual like switch on the network. Or for example, your home router is a DHCP server, dynamic host configuration protocol. So I would make sure that looks good and also look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. So chances are maybe there's a bad cable or, you know, because if it's on the network and it's physically connected, then chances are this is not the issue, you know. However, it's unlikely um, if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for some time. So the worst case scenario here being a DNS issue if you can't reach it with the host name only. And that's exactly what the question was about. So the point of this video is to kind of get you thinking of on how host names work in relation to the DNS and how this issue may come up whenever you use remote 
desktop sessions. All right, let's get to it. The entire building is switching over to Gigabit Network and you are to assist with the process. How would you handle this project? So you can see that this question is specifically tailored for somebody who does text desktop support at the site. So meaning you're physically there and then you are to assist with switching over to the Gigabit Network. The reason you are to assist with the process is because you're not going to do the networking part of it, meaning that you won't be you know, assigning IP addresses or anything like that. That's done by the network team. You are the desktop support guy or tech support guy, if you will, that will basically run the cables and do everything else, which I will talk about here shortly. First, I would work with the network team to decide of the new IP network ranges. This is incredibly important. If your company has firewall settings or a firewall configuration that is specific to certain applications, certain websites, then you would need to know what the new new IP network ranges are. This is something that you need to have anyways, but the main reason is to make sure that all of these applications that are used by people can also go through the firewall. So the old IP range um, had firewall settings set up for the, new, for the old one. Now you need the new IP network ranges to inform the firewall team to make these changes so that applications and the websites and anything that's external will work properly. Also, sometimes you have to notify the external third parties that allow inbound connections from certain IP ranges. You need to let them know as well. And to make sure that certain machines receive static IP addresses. Now, I kind of touched on this uh, on my previous video, which was related to setting up a printer on a network, which requires a static IP address, but that's not the main reason. I mean, that's one of the reasons, but the main reason being is uh, servers. All the servers that you have here, your location, they all need IP addresses and they need to be configured with the new IP addresses, including printers. Second, if any network cables need to be upgraded, it will be coordinated with members of desktop support and network team. For example, CAT5E is a minimal cable rating for gigabit speeds. So the way you would uh, do this is that, you know, you would may have to make sure that it's at least CAT5E, which I believe is 1000 megabits per second connection speed, which is uh, basically entry level gigabit network speed. Otherwise you would want to use CAT6. And you would coordinate this with the members of desktop support, meaning hopefully there's somebody else there to, that works with you. I mean, it may not be, you know, if it's a smaller company, but if it's a larger company, there's probably other members there that you may need assistance with, especially if you need to run the new cables through the building, which is a lot, a lot of work. And of course you wouldn't coordinate this with the network team. Basically you just let them know, okay, I've connected all of this, try these ports or something like that. And let's test it out, you know, type of thing. Third, if any changes affects the printers and other static devices, such as servers, this has to be communicated to the users and make appropriate changes to each machine. So this touches on exactly what I talked about earlier related to the, st the static IP addresses. If any changes affect the printers, of course, you have to let the users know. You have to communicate this to the users or make the changes yourself and tell them, okay, this, this printer that's here is no longer using this IP address. So you have to go to their computer or tell them to do it and say, okay, you have to add the printer in there again because it's not going to work. It's just going to stop working because the address has changed. And of course, make appropriate changes to each machine. Um, I, I was referring this to the users, but also this needs to be applied to the servers themselves as well or any storage that needs to be you know, static. Lastly, the most important thing would be the testing part before deployment because there's a chance that certain applicants require firewall exceptions for their IP or a range of IP addresses. And this also refers back to the IP ranges that all the applications um, you know, need to have a firewall exclusions, exceptions, or whatever you want to call it. We want to make sure that the new IP range and the IP addresses can go through the firewall. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Share it with your buddies. I'd really appreciate it. I'd made 
five more videos of this and there will be more but uh thank you so much for watching if you want to check those out again there will be here as i speak and i wish you good luck best of luck enjoy your day bye bye hello my friends my name is Irvin, also known as kobo man today's video i will show you how to properly reset chrome if you are someone like me who works in pc support desktop support help desk or anything similar of that nature you may be realizing that your business or the company that you work for is slowly moving over to google chrome and uh, this is something that uh, we are not used to dealing with because in the past, Internet Explorer was the main browser for all businesses. Of course, if you're watching this as someone who needs to know how to fix Chrome for your personal computer, this might help you as well. So make sure you stick around as I will show you how to properly reset Google Chrome, which could resolve all your issues. But before I do that, I just want to quickly talk about how Google Chrome functions and when it comes to user experience and what are some things to keep in mind and why things work and some why some things don't work as opposed to in comparison to internet explorer right main thing to compare or to kind of realize and uh, that you know google chrome has an ability to share its data across multiple computers so what that means is that if you look on the right hand side here and you see the little you know little person icon there that means you can log in to chrome with your google login account and what happens is if you use that same login at another computer it will transfer all of your data it includes the catch data your all of your bookmarks all your favorites if you will and everything else even up to your history your search history so that's good if you don't mind google you know having you know access to your personal data i personally do not do that uh, but uh, it's up to you some businesses use their own version of google services that also does this uh, when it comes to mail service so some businesses are switching over to gmail for their email service so this is what happens except they are running on a separate server network that just maintains that type of login and access for that business only anyways that's just a quick intro to google chrome but when it comes to just regular users that's what it does for you if you sign into chrome and not just here where i'm at right now let me go back real quick if you go to google.com and click gmail this will let you you know log in to your gmail account through the browser this does not sign you into chrome if you want to log into chrome you have to go over here and then sign into chrome if you don't see a login button here you can click manage people and then add a person or you can just double click and make changes here and this will let you log into google chrome browser so as you've noticed google chrome is kind of turning more into an operating system hence we have some laptops that are also known as chromebooks i hope that makes sense so far so let's see we are switching over from internet explorer to google chrome support because our business is suddenly using google chrome probably because it's more affordable and google offers a lot of different products including google docs as you can see google drive all kinds of different things that are very useful for businesses and it probably is a lot cheaper rather than running their own email exchange server as promised, let's say you are experiencing some issues. Let's say you go to google.com or some other website and some things don't work. And then you realize that the best thing to do right now uh, to hopefully resolve the issue that you're having, that you're helping, uh, that you're having personally, or you are helping a user at your work. You know, you're trying to help them uh, resolve their issue. So the best thing to do is a typical thing that you do is, and that would be, is to reset the browser itself meaning the clear cookies clearing their history you know this and that so how do you do that in chrome we know that in ie you can simply just go in and just find your internet options right internet options you go to internet options 
And if you want to clear cookies, you can certainly do that here, right here, browsing history, and that might have solved some issues. Or you can go over here and do a full restore of the advanced scenario and do a full reset. You just select that and it just does everything for you. And that's that. That's how you do it with IE. And then you're done, right? Unless you have to go back in and change the proxy settings. But that's different. You know, you will know this according to your business environment. In Google Chrome, you have to you have an option to reset it, but that actually doesn't do a full reset. This is why I was saying if you're interested in fully resetting Google Chrome, you might want to stick around fully um, for this entire video in order for for you to understand what I'm talking about. So let's see if we go to here, if we go to little three dots here next to our little icon here, if we select that so we can open up this little menu right here, we just have to go down here to settings, right? We're going to open up settings and in here, there's definitely a way to reset Chrome per se, right? In, in quotation mark, uh, but and, and you know, you can scroll down and look for it through the menus, blah, 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 or you can just simply type in reset. So this is a great thing about Google Chrome. It lets you search for everything that you need to, for everything that you need to access, you just, as long as you know what you're looking for. So here's the thing, uh, here, here's what you see. You get a couple different options. You get restore settings, and then you click on restore settings to their original defaults, and you do that. And what's it, what it says here, this will restart startup page, new tab page, search engine, pin tabs, and would also disable all extension clear temporary data like cookies. Your bookmarks, um, you know, history and save passwords will not be cleared. So it does all that, except it doesn't remove your bookmarks and history and save passwords will not be cleared. So here's where uh, it defers uh, compared to Internet Explorer. Internet Explorer will do all of this here, except it will, sa it will save your bookmarks in Internet Explorer, but you know that's, that's about the only thing that's similar here. So if you want to do that, you can certainly click Reset, and it will do all that stuff. Of course, it's still, uh, it still retains all the configuration data that's you know, embedded within Google Chrome, and it's also embedded within your profile your profile remember that profile i talked to you about that you log in here and then it lets you you know sync all your data with multiple computers that is still there that is still not you know removed so what else do we have this other thing that says clean up your computer um, is not related to this at all so i have no idea why it came up whatsoever so the only option we have here is to do this and that actually does not resolve the issue. As I said, it still retains all the data that's specifically related to your profile for the Google Chrome login that's shared with multiple computers. And I apologize for repeating myself and kind of going around about the way um, to explain is just the way I teach. Um, it, this is my style of teaching. So uh, I hope you understand that. So I will show you how to fully uh, do it. You can go in and it gives you an option to change to a different person. So if you go to here, manage. So if you click on the little guy and then click manage people, you can create another person and that will, you know, reset it. However, you'll still have the other data conflicting. You can, you know, select your icons or whatever. That's unrelated. But that's not what we want because only one person is using this computer. We really want a full, clean you know, reset of Google Chrome. So in order for this to happen, and you can do this remotely while you're working with somebody, let's say you're, you know, you're a help desk guy or you're a tech support guy of some kind and you're doing some kind of remote or you have an option to do a remote support, um, you know, you can just tell them or whether you're talking to them on the phone or you're talking to them over some kind of a chat system, you can just tell them, okay, go ahead and close your Chrome. Make sure the Chrome is closed. And they will do that and you will know whether they actually did it even you don't even have to watch their screen at all uh, but if you do have access to their screen even better of course if you do have a remote connection to their computer just make sure that the chrome is not running in the background as so in the processes ie tends to do that i've seen that quite a few times where it likes to hide in the background so now that we know chrome is closed we're going to fully reset it and the reason i had you reset is because the way we're going to do it 
is by simply removing all the data that is associated with that current user profile for Chrome specifically. That thing that I said where it shares data across multiple computers. So the way to do that is go to the root of C, go to local profiles for the users, which will be located under C, users, and then we're going to look at the current person's login, um, or we're going to basically look at their login uh, local profile that is associated with their login to the PC. So in this case, we're using Kobuman test account. So basically, this is what I used to log into this computer. I typed in Kobuman test account and then my password. So this is what you need to figure out. Uh, and you'll be able to know um, who is using that computer at the time. Um, basically, if you look at the dates here, the most recent person that is logged that has logged into that is the current user. So here we can see that this was the last person that made changes to the account, which is that. So we know this is the user. We go in here and then once we go inside of their local profile, we need to look for their app data folder. So here it's hidden by default and we're just going to type in app data. And um, if you are obviously, if you are not able to see this immediately, you can just go to view and click enable hidden items and then it will show. So if I go back here, you can see that app data is there. So we go back there and then we're going to go to local. So because we're looking for locally stored data. And then, of course, we're going to look at Google, right? This is the company that makes Chrome. We go to Google folder and uh, we're going to find our Chrome folder. So this is exactly what I was talking about. These are all the settings that are in, inside of the Chrome folder. Now, let's go see what's inside of it before we actually reset it. We have inside of we have user data. Once we go inside of this, we have a bunch of different folders. But the main one that we actually have to worry about right now is default. So if we go to default, this is the current settings for the user that is using this Google Chrome. These are the current settings. So the reason I went to the default folder is because inside of this, we will find our bookmarks. Because once we get rid of this folder, which you should not never delete, you should just rename it. And that specifically talking about is the Chrome folder. Let's go ahead and do that right now. Um, actually, you know what? Let me just go back here to give you a really good example of what I mean. Let me go back here and I'm going to create a bookmark real quick. Okay. And I'm just going to click done. The reason I did that is because I wanted to create a bookmarks file, which is going to be inside of Chrome, user data, default. Now, if you go back, you will see, if you scroll back in the, vid in the video that you're watching right now, you can see that this wasn't there. This file wasn't there because we just literally just created it. You can see it says 1.10 p.m. And if you look right on the right hand side here, it says 1.10 p.m. So we literally just created this bookmark. So the reason I wanted you to know that there is a default folder here is because I don't want you to remove their bookmarks. I don't want you to delete them. This is why when we go inside a Google folder, all we want to do is just rename this to what I usually do is name it old, right? And if it's if the Chrome is open, it will not let you rename this whatsoever. It, you, it will not let you rename it. So that's how you will know whether the user still has Chrome open. Of course, you can do this over the network too. Let's say, um, let's say you're doing this. Um, okay, let me go ahead and close this real quick. Open the the uh, Windows Explorer again, and then if you're going to do this over the network, all you need to know is the PC name for the user that's on the same network. So you just type in backslash backslash, and then in my case, the name of this computer that I'm using right now is called Tech Support backslash c dollar sign for shared and as long as this is enabled on your on your uh, business network you should be able to basically backdoor and to the user's computer so for you just need the name for the user's computer that way you can backdoor into it and do this remotely without even watching their screen and if you go in you can see that we are at the same place 
This is how you do it through the back door and you can do it real quickly. And here it is, we go inside app data, local and Google and we can see that we've renamed our folder. So what happens is when user reopens Google, it's going to create a new folder. You can create a new folder called Chrome and now we can see that it's fully reset and as usual you will get this typical welcome to Chrome screen and then we're just going to click continue and then here you can log back in or whatever it is that you need to do sign into Chrome and then your Google's your Google Chrome is now fully reset which should resolve any issues however we're missing that bookmark right so how do we bring it back well let's go to Chrome old go back to Chrome old right user data default Where's our, we scroll down a little bit here. Here's our bookmark. And then we're gonna copy pasta this. Go back, Chrome, this is the new one. Go back to user data, default, control V, paste it in there. Now when we go back into our Chrome, we can see that our bookmark is indeed inside of it. There it is. Google new a tab and then if we go to bookmark manager we can also see that our new tab is also here this is what we called it right we just create save the new tab and create a bookmark of it all right guys I hope this helps you help you with you know if you have any Google Chrome issues at home this is how you would reset it and if you are someone who works for a company that's switching over to Google 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 Chrome and Google products, which is totally understandable. If you have any questions, please ask them. This is what I'm here for. And just throwing this out there, I do have some merchandise available below the video description. Thank you so much. I wish you best of luck. And I hope you learned something from me today. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Irvin, also known as Couple Men. Welcome to another help desk tutorial. So my videos are good for help desk tier one, tier two, and tier three, and also desktop support and of course system administration. This is another video of the same series. But before we do this, I want to shout out to James Oringi. Thank you so much for becoming the very first member of my channel. So what I did last month, sometime last month, I realized that I had the ability to activate memberships on my channel. So I went ahead and did that. And Mr. James here has uh, signed up, has, he's the first one to sign up. So thank you so much, James. I really appreciate it. That will go towards my coffee fund. Thank you so much, man. I appreciate it. All right, moving on. So in this video we have a couple of different issues the first one is rdp sound issue and then we have another ticket for a local admin account that is not working by the way if you have one second please click the like button that also makes a big difference for my videos and also helps other people see this video because they can see that there is an interaction on the video itself thank you so much okay all right, so let's look at the first ticket we have here, and that's RDP sound issues. It says here, hi, I use remote desktop to access my second PC, but audio coming from that computer is not working. So there are a couple of reasons why somebody would want to have a second PC and use a remote desktop. And the first one is, they literally have a second PC which has specific software, specific documents, specific files, this and that, and they have a second PC that they want to access. And the only way for them to do it, especially in a business type of environment, is using regular Microsoft built-in remote desktop. The other reason is that somebody literally has a second computer as part of their job to process um, certain files, maybe databases, or do certain processes that require extra CPU power, you know, this and that. You know, maybe there are other reasons as well, but those are just a couple of examples of somebody using a second PC and using it via remote desktop. So he's using remote desktop to access this second PC. 
but he can't hear any audio coming from that. So it's kind of like this. You see in this computer here where I'm basically recording this, you can see that the name of my computer here is Tech Support. This Tech Support computer is a remote desktop session. So if I play any audio on here, for example, I go to YouTube and I play a video, um, I'm not able to hear any audio. And that's his problem here. So we can fix that. So first thing we have to do is open up remote desktop session on user's computer, on his computers, on Mike's computer. We open up a remote desktop session and then we click here, show options. We're going to expand options and uh, we're going to go to the third tab where it says here local resources. And the first thing that comes up is remote audio. So we're going to click on settings where it says here configure remote audio settings. So this is exactly where we need to go. So we're going to click on settings. So this computer here is, uh, well, this remote desktop session is set up to play audio on this computer. So by default, it's set like this. If I was to use a remote desktop session on this computer to connect to a second computer over there, um, it will play audio from that computer on my computer. Okay. I don't want this to sound too confusing, but let me just show you. So if I go to youtube.com forward slash Kobo man. It's going to, okay. My first time going to my own channel on this computer. Anyways, any audio that you see here right now is actually being played on the remote computer itself. That's exactly what his problem is. So in order to fix that, we have to make sure that its settings are set to this play on this computer. Otherwise we can't hear this voice at all as you can. So right now on my computer, which is here where it says tech support, I'm using remote desktop right now. It's set to play audio on the other computer, which is this setting. So on the second PC, wherever it may be, this is what it's set like right now on my computer that I'm using right now. It's playing on remote computer right now. So to fix this, we have to make sure that it's set to play on this computer, which should be set by default. And, uh, and, and that's fine. This is how we would fix that. But I also want to show you something else. So let me complete that ticket and we're going to come back to this because I really want to, to talk about something here that's going to be also related to troubleshooting. Very important. And let's wrap this up. So we're just going to add internal note and say change remote desktop settings to play audio audio on a local computer. Okay. And then we're going to, of course, have him test it, you know, this and that. That's fine. This should be easy ticket. And then we're going to close it. Of course, of course, don't forget to assign ticket to yourself as well. Very important. So you can get credit before you close it. And since we know Mike, Mike Moser, we've worked with him many, many times. Uh, we're going to just close it. We're going to let him know, Hey, should be fine now. So we're done with Mike, but I do want to go back to that remote desktop connection to show you something very, very important. So let me explain what I mean. If you get a ticket that a user cannot use their local headset, for example, they have a headset somewhere, their user is somewhere else and you need to troubleshoot their headset sound issues. And you can't because if you use remote desktop session, let's say you're limited to only using remote desktop session, it's going to look just like this. You remote into their computer, just like I am connected to this tech support computer right now. And it's going to look like this. It's just going to say remote audio. There is no headset to select. There is no audio to troubleshoot here. Let me show you. If I go to sound settings here, it just says remote audio. There is nothing else. There is no headset to select. So you would assume that something is wrong, right? Well, that's, that's not right. The, the problem is, is actually this. You have to go to local resources before you connect to that computer. You have to go to local resource on your remote desktop session, click settings and select play on remote computer, just like we had it previously.
and then you go in and then you type in user's computer name you click connect and then and then we can make changes to the local see now it's looking looking like it's different uh it made <laughs> It made different settings here. You see, now we can select speakers that are Realtek, which is the typical. Uh, you see how I got confused because I made the change right away. It took a little bit to configure. But yeah, now we can actually see that there is Realtek uh, definition audio. Same thing. If I go over there and plug in a headset, you will see it come up as well. All right. So you probably saw, you probably saw that I plugged it in. Now we can troubleshoot that headset on that remote computer so you would just say to the user or ask them to plug in their headset if it's not showing up like that and then you'll be able to do it otherwise if you don't change it to play on the local computer like i showed you you won't be able to troubleshoot it and you will just assume that there is something wrong with the audio you know you have to make sure that it's set play on remote computer you know, otherwise it's, you won't be able to troubleshoot it. So that's something to keep in mind if you only have remote desktop connection as the available resource of taking control of somebody's computer and troubleshooting these type of issues. All right. I hope that comes off as something that you can easily follow because it is kind of confusing, and but it is what it is. This is how you have to kind of go about it and to, to troubleshoot some of these weird issues that might come up. Okay, dokey. All right, so let's look at this other ticket. It says, my local admin account is not working. And it specifically says here, hello, I have a local admin account to make changes on my PC, but it's not working. Thanks, Larry. So this guy was given specific local admin account to use for some reason. And of course, uh, don't ever, if you, have, if you have the ability, don't ever give somebody a local admin account password. Uh, because of the security reasons you we have to you know double and triple check to make sure that this person is actually allowed so we're going to go with that assumption all right let's assign the ticket to ourselves we're going to work that we're going to contact him and ask him hey what is the name of the local admin account that you're trying to use so and then he tells you what the name is and then we're going to search for it in on our computer now this is not to be confused with the main admin accounts those are different they will not be listed under local admin users so we're going to just type in users here to get to the point where we can add or edit and see which users or which accounts are available there to begin with this is just one way of looking at this this shows you some administrator accounts and the other way is if you go to the system settings or system properties and then we look at advanced system settings and then we click on user profiles we're going to see all the accounts that are listed here. However, there is a big difference here, what we're looking at. We're looking at two very different things. And I want to kind of emphasize this. This is why I created this uh, fictitious ticket, is that what we're looking at here is local accounts that are on the computer. When it comes to this window here, this is where you would add them. These are all the actual account login information that's available on this computer now what we are looking at here is actually user profiles that are stored so this is location or this is how much space is taken up by creating a local profile on the c drive this is not a this is not information for this person's for any of these accounts this is just what's stored locally and the thing is though although that describes this if you were to click and delete this profile it would delete it everything that's in stored on this computer meaning all of these things are located on the c drive so if you go to local users on the c drive so c users you can see that they are here here is the buco which is the first one here's the cobleman test account which is this one and here's the yt login is this one so if i click delete on any of these which i can't delete this one this one never shows up uh if you're using it uh, it's kind of bizarre but this one is actually on here as well it's not showing up i don't know if that's some kind of a feature of windows but this 
yt login actually does exist on this computer as well because i'm using it right now but yet it's not listed and i know it's an admin account it doesn't matter getting back to the point of what i'm talking about here if i select for example this one buco and then i select delete it will delete everything that's inside of this folder so anything that's inside of here desktop documents everything everything will be deleted okay now that we understand what that is we're going to cancel out of this i'm going to leave this window open here because we're going to get back to it what we're going to do what i actually wanted you to learn from this fictional ticket um, is what happens when you can create when you create a local admin account or try to use another account on a computer um, to troubleshoot issues for example let's say you need to use an admin account to fix something or to run specific application this is what happens when you do that so what we're going to do here we're going to create a local uh, microsoft account and we're going to name it local admin not a very secure name but it doesn't matter because you know this is just for practice and it's forcing me to do all this stuff now okay so now we have another local admin we're going to change type to administrator so this is just the standard user we're going to change it to administrator now we have a local uh, local account that's administrator account however if you go to the settings here in user profile you can see that it's not there there's nothing there and then if we go to the root of c again we know we have the local profile we go to root of c we go to users it's not there well why is that because i want you to know that this completely separates this account from the stored data on the computer in the sense that there is no local profile created only a local admin account so it's only local admin account until you log in to this computer for the first time or or if you use for example your own local admin account whether it's domain or local it doesn't matter let's say you're troubleshooting something let's say you're troubleshooting something and you want to run for example this google chrome as administrator in order to troubleshoot some things you can literally right click this icon and click run as administrator and on a business restricted computer um, you will get a pop-up to log in to use your local credentials but since i'm already logged in as admin on their another account it's not going to give me that so what i'm going to do is hold shift right click this google chrome icon so i'm holding shift key on the keyboard and now we have an option to run it as different user otherwise it doesn't show up run as different user doesn't show up here let me show you right click it's just run as administrator but if i shift right click run as different user so that's what we're going to select i apologize this is this is just a glitch here run as different user this is just a scaling issue with my uh with my monitor but it's basically asking me here to put in my login credentials so we're going to do we're going to use this local admin so it's same thing if you have a domain admin you would type in the same login id so we're gonna your your own local id or your your domain admin id i'm sorry so but in this case we're going to use this one so we're going to type in local admin so if I tab over, it's actually in the password space. I'm sorry, you can't see it. It's because of the scaling on this 4K monitor and using remote desktop session specifically. So if I click OK, I've typed in local admin and the password below. You just can't see it. And I'm just going to click OK. And now it's going to run Chrome under that specific account, under that specific local administrator account. So this is useful if you're trying to update the computer and you need to use your own administrator login. So right now, this specific window and only this window is running under that local admin and separately from this other ticket window. It's run separately. To prove it to you, we're going to go back to our folder 
and we can see now that there is a local admin <clears throat> profile created because we use that local admin to run as as admin on this computer so it actually actually had to create settings folder inside of that you can see that you see so this is how these things work and let me show you this here we, got, we don't need this here anymore but i want to go back to here user profiles now when we click on user profiles we can see that local admin show up and it's right there and you can see it's only 78 megabytes that's very very tiny and usually when a user logs in for the first time into computer it's going to create a much larger local profile but the reason this one here is only 78 megabytes is because it only created a basic sort of like a template information for this local admin profile on this computer just so we can run and store settings for chrome okay and then we're going to let me see if i can open it here and we're going to and here it is you can see that there's some basic documents here and then there's app data and then if we go to for example local google chrome folder is there al along with microsoft it's just the basic microsoft stuff that comes with default um, default settings for the microsoft operating system but it has that google chrome that we just opened you see that and it says 98 megabytes but that's because you know it by the time we opened it up google chrome itself it actually you know stored some data on its own this and that and uh, <laughs> so that's how that works but the great thing about this if you have somebody a remote user who's never logged in to a computer before let's say somebody takes their computer home and they can't log into it for some reason but you have a remote desktop access to it uh, you can uh, basically do the same thing to get it going so uh, it, it's kind of a workaround but uh, it and it's kind of confusing I know but as long as you can get this local at local profile uh, created and get it going that way when somebody locks their computer they can literally type in the same thing and just get access to this without having to be connected to the network in order to log into this computer for the first time okay that was quite a bit and i hope this wasn't too confusing hopefully it gives you an idea of what's going on with these profiles and again whether it's a local profile or domain profile it's going to act the same way if you run it as admin or run as different user but this is what happens in the background while you're doing all of this stuff okay so i'm just going to reply to customer and say hello larry i've created a local admin profile named local admin and the password is you know xxxxx whatever this is not necessarily what you want to do because then everybody will see it matter of fact i would just tell them what it is but we're i'm just going to pretend like we're doing this which you shouldn't necessarily do at all because you know whoever looks at your ticket and god knows how many people they'll know what the local admin uh, login id is and password so you might want to just you know tell him or i don't know whatever the, the 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 settings are or whatever the setup or requirements are for the company uh, when it comes to dealing with you know giving out passwords like this and login ids as well all right guys i hope you like this video please take a moment to like share and leave a comment let me know if you have any ideas for future videos and i'll see you next time bye bye Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuma, and in this video I will teach you how to handle help desk calls. It's going to be very simple to follow. I have broken this down into five simple steps for you to learn. Number one is readiness. Number two is customer service. Number three is knowledge. Number four is efficiency. And number five is closing. All of these steps are incredibly important and are crucial to know in order to be best at help desk. 
Friends, if you have a second to click that like button, I really appreciate it. That way I don't have to bug you with any ads at this point. It really makes a huge difference for my channel. Thank you so much and let's get into it. As a quick summary, what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you and go through all of these steps with you, explain to you what I mean with each one of those steps, and then I'm going to show you an example phone call that I will make that is going to give in a really good example on how you should be handling calls. And although requirements for the company you work for may be slightly different or have specific requirements, you can certainly take that and adjust this format to that. This way you have a base to work with and you have experience on knowing how to do the call. All you got to do is just make simple adjustments according to what the company or your employer wants. Number one, readiness. This simply means that you should be ready to take the call at any moment. The best way to go about this is to pull up all the systems that you are going to use throughout the day. For example, let's say you are doing a help desk and the majority of the day is people calling in to reset the passwords. Well, you should have that system up and logged into at any time, whether it's Active Directory or some kind of proprietary system that the business you work for gives you access to. So you should have that ready. Got to be ready to take the call at any time. Pull up the systems, be ready to take that call. This will make it a lot easier for you to do your job. And number two, we have customer service. Customer service is incredibly important. You got to be ready to show some kind of professionalism when answering calls. It's not as simple as saying hello and then the other person on the other line has to guess whether they got the right number or not. You got to be ready with good to customer service by introducing yourself, making sure that you're polite. You don't have to be overly polite. It is just basic customer service. This is not a sales line or anything like that. You just have to have basic customer service to show that you're a professional and that you are friendly and polite. This is incredibly important, especially if you're working as a contractor for somebody and the client wants that type of service. Trust me, they're going to review your calls and if you don't have good customer service, you're going to be in trouble. But don't worry, I will show you a really good example on how to do this. And number three, we have knowledge. Once you have good knowledge, it's going to be a lot easier to handle any call that comes through. This way, you don't have to struggle into trying to figure out what the problem is. It's one thing to reset passwords because it's simple type and click. While, on the other hand, if you don't know how to resolve computer issues, you may have a hard time in handling any calls, let alone health desk calls. So it's incredibly important to educate yourself as much as you can with any resources that you have. One example of the resources is my channel. I have a list of help desk guides that you can check out. There's a link in the description. I will also try to put a link that pops up there if you want to check that out. But either way, learn as much as you can about technology so that way you can resolve issues in an efficient manner, which leads me to number four, which is efficiency. Efficiency ties in with everything that I've talked about so far readiness, customer service, and knowledge. Once you have all three of those things down, you should have the efficiency down easily. So the main thing in this course is to learn the first three things of this, and then the efficiency just comes by itself. All right, now let's talk about this last part, and that is closing. At number five, we have closing, and for the right reason. Once you resolve issues, you want to have a really nice closing and that is reflected in the way you greet the customer at the end. You want to make sure that the customer or user has a good experience when it comes to calling help desk. You want to make sure that they're comfortable calling the help desk and that of course is part of the customer service, but the customer service is not there just throughout the call, but at the end of the call as well. And now it's time for our mock-up call. What I'm going to show you is an example on how to handle a help desk call in a professional manner. Make sure you watch the whole thing. And if you like it, please share it with friends and ask them what they think. All right, let's do it. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. Uh, what can I assist you with today? Hi, I, uh, I, I, for some reason I can't log in to Outlook. Outlook keeps asking me for a password. I don't know why. I, uh, I'm i not sure what's going on here. Sure. Does it um, does it uh, give you an issue whenever you try to log in anything else or is this just this specific system? Uh, let me let me try. I, I think it's just Outlook, but 
I'm not sure. I don't even know why Outlook keeps asking me for the password, but I think it's just Outlook. Let me try something else. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this... Um, Oh, yeah, this other system is also giving me problems. It keeps asking for the password. I don't know why. I did have a little trouble. Uh, like, I may have, like, mistyped the password this morning. Okay, well, no problem. Let me, uh, let me look up your account. Uh, what is your login ID for this? My login ID is Irvin underscore uh, C-A-N. Okay. All right, I got it pulled up here. Okay, yeah, it does show, it does show you're locked out. Uh, and I do show that it happened around 10 a.m. this morning. Oh, oh yeah. So, I, oh man. Okay. Yeah, I, I think. Yeah, that that time I tried to log in a few times into the computer, but it it wouldn't take my password. I, I I recently changed it. I think I changed it like a couple of days ago. So I may have mistyped it a couple of times. Is that why? Oh yeah, that makes sense. So happening? Uh, if, if you mistype password once, you don't want to keep trying it. Usually it locks out after you try more than three times. Uh, but it's not a problem. I can unlock you. Uh, would you like me to reset the password as well, or do you just uh, want to give it a shot without me resetting? If you it? can, uh, if you can unlock me, that would be great. I'd like to see if I can, because uh, I don't feel like changing the password again. You know how it is. It's like you you try to like come up with a new password and then it it's like you're just sitting there trying to figure out well which one do i want to use this time like you know so uh, yeah if you can just unlock me that would be great okay no problem i uh i have it unlocked right now i want to want to give it a shot and see if it works all right hold on let me uh let me try this here okay I I think I'm good now. Outlook came up now, and it's uh, okay. It looks yeah, okay. My new <laughs> emails are coming through. So, okay, great. Uh, that's good. I I thank you so much. I appreciate. That. All right, no problem, no problem. I'm I'm glad to help. I'm glad that worked out for you. Uh, is there anything else I can help you with today? No, that is all. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a wonderful day. You too. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you find it educational and useful. I hope it helps you get a job. That's kind of important as well. If you have a moment, please share this video with your friends. Leave a like or ask me any questions that you have in the comments below. And as always, for more help desk stuff, check out my channel. And in the description is a link to all the help desk guides that I have. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate you, and you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kuboman. Today, we have a combination of videos, so that way you don't have to go through and look for these topics. This way, you can just sit down and watch the whole thing at once, because it's very useful, especially for help desk. The first part of the video is about practical help desk troubleshooting. Uh, it's a very good one uh, because in this example you're not allowed to use RDP whatsoever. The second part it talks about Windows updates and how they are important to understand if you're in help desk or even desktop support. And the last part of it if you're new to help desk or want to get into IT, this last video shows you how to create a resume. This resume is based off my own resume and based off its own success. So I hope you enjoyed this video. Please take a moment to like. I'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much and uh, let's get into it. All right, here we go, guys. I've created a couple of tickets that we can work on. And the first one right here, it says, my program is not working. Now, keep in mind, again, we don't have access to remote desktop. We don't have any tools like Dameware or VNC or anything remote that we can use or any third-party remote software that we can use in order to help this user with their issue. So their issue is here, my program is not working. And uh, in the description it says here, every time I click on a program icon, nothing help, nothing happens. Please help me. Thanks, Larry B. So here's the thing. Uh, first thing we got to do is actually ask Larry what his PC name is. Once he comes back with that information, we can start to work with that. So you may have to call him, you know, talk to him and say, hey, Larry, uh, what is your PC name so that way we can try to help you out but of course be more professional like you would call him and say hey this is for example for example this is Irvin 
I'm with end user support and I have your ticket about my program is not working. I can help you, but uh, can you please tell me what your PC name is? So we're, we're, we're what we are going to do with that PC name is try to remotely access it. However, first thing first thing first, we got to assign this ticket to ourselves. So I'm going to assign it to myself. <laughs> I, although this is not a ticketing video, I want to make sure that that's happening. So I'm going to actually reply here and also tell him, hello, this is Irvin with EUS end user support. Can you please tell me what your PC name is? So, of course, I wanted to give you as detailed as possible how you'd work this. So this is why I kind of put this note in, which in reality, it should send them a, an email or a notification of some sort so he can respond to you with that information. Or again, you can just talk to him, call him, you know, get in contact with him to get this information. So that way you can take a look and see what's going on. Again, we don't have RDP, so there is no GUI that we can look at here. Uh, and uh, we're just going to use uh, PC name as that. So let's go to the PC, the, the user's PC, so we can find that out real quick. So here we are. This is the user's computer. So while they're on it, you can just instruct them how to get their PC name if they don't know how to. So we can say, Larry, can you please go to your search bar? And the reason I'm going about it in this way is because users are very familiar with the search bar because they always look at it. And you can just tell them, click inside the search bar and just type in system or PC or, or whatever you feel comfortable with because there are multiple locations where you can find the PC name. So here's just the system that comes up and then you can tell them, hey, where does it say system name? And here it is. It says Cobbleman1. So once he gives you that information, we're going to go back to our computer. So now we know that the PC name is, I'm adding an internal note, PC name is couple man one now we're going to try to access it now of course while we talk to Larry here we want to make sure that we know what which which uh, program is not working so we're going to access that um, access his computer uh, using just over that network using using a file explorer over the network the way you do that is open a file explorer and just type in backspace a uh, backslash backslash type in couple man one and then another backslash, and then we're going to access his C share drive, which is should be enabled by default for your business. It may not be, but it really should be in, in a, a business type of environment. It should let you in. You may get a pop-up asking you to log in, and that's fine too. Just use your credentials, and if you have access, that's great. So once we're inside of C, right now we're connected to his PC over there. We can see that it's on the network connection right here. And then the name of his computer is Cobbleman1. And we're inside of his C drive. We're looking at his C drive um, just using a file explorer. So he's using a program, right? He's using a program and we know it's not working. And then we're going to ask him which program is it, right? And then, of course, since we don't have remote desktop, we can't initiate the repair. Normally, you can just repair the program, and a lot of times that would fix it. You know, uninstall it, reinstall it, and whatnot. But if you don't have that option, or user doesn't, you know, have the admin privileges to do it either, and again, you don't have remote desktop of any type of software, we're going to try to fix that by going to his local profile. Because in this case, if we go back here, it says nothing happens when he runs the program. So what do you suspect? Suspect? I suspect some kind of configuration issue or just corrupted data or a cache uh, inside of his local profile where the configuration resides. So we're going to go inside of users folder and we're going to look for his local profile. We're going to ask him, what is your local profile name? And then he's going to tell you what his local profile name, which is going to be the same thing as his login. So we're going to pretend that his login is B-U-C-O. We're going to go inside of that. And typically, typically configuration data for any type of program that's run, there on, that's run under your local profile is going to be in app data folder. So we're going to click on app data. And then a lot of times it's either going to be in local 
or roaming. So let's have let's go into local folder and see what happens. So let's say he has problems with Adobe. We can simply uh, just to kind of clear the catch, we can simply rename this folder into Adobe old, for example. And as long as his program is not open, it's going to let us rename it like that. And this is okay and because once he launches Adobe, it's going to create a new version of the same folder. And just to kind of show you what's inside, we're going to go inside of this and you can see that if you kind of browse through, you can see that it's either empty and a lot of times, uh, you know, I, I pick this randomly, but there will be some configuration data like config files and this and that. But since it's at the local profile level, it's not necessarily something that's part of the program uh, as, as in program that it needs to function. It's something that's created for the local profile as the part of the configuration for that profile. And the same thing happens with anything else. For example, there's Google here. You know, if you go inside a Google here folder, uh, and if you go, you can see that it's a Chrome. And if you go inside of that, you can see there's user data. Again, this is what I talked about. And if you, for example, go to default, you can see that there is a cache data inside of it. And of course, you can find things like, uh, I don't know, their uh, favorites and stuff like that, which is, by the way, missing on this one, uh, but that's okay. So let's stay on track here. Since we messed with Adobe, I'm going to tell them, go ahead and Adobe, uh, try to open Adobe again. So let's go back to the user's computer. All right, so we're back at the user's computer. We don't need this window anymore. Actually, I'm just going to, yeah, let's close it. We're going to close it. And then we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm, so in this at this point, I'm telling them, okay, go ahead and open Adobe. So he's going to type in Adobe. And then we're going to click Adobe Reader. We can see that Adobe Reader works fine. And let's kind of go back to our computer so we can see again what's going on from our point of view. We are now back at, you know, our point of view as a technician. And we can see that the new folder was created for Adobe, like I stated. So that created new. And you can see that here that the date is 6-10-2020 at 1 p.m. And if you look at the time here, it's 1.01 p.m. So that means it created just like I said it would. And what that does, it basically resets that program. And a lot of times it actually resolves the issue. All right. Now, just in case you actually had to go in and change registry settings, that's, a, that's something you can also do without having to have a remote desktop, as long as you have the proper credentials to do so. So on your computer, on your own computer that you're using, your work computer, you're going to open up a registry editor and you have to run it as administrator. So remember how computer name for this gentleman was Kobelman1 here. And let's pretend that we have to go into registry and add some kind of a function, some kind of key to make it work. We can do that remotely as well. So we're going to take Kobelman1, which is the name of his computer, and we're going to connect to it over the network registry. So we're going to connect to his registry on his computer over the network. We're going to click network. We're going to put in Kobelman1. We're going to check name to see if we can actually find it on the network. And it usually takes a little bit, it depends, you know, on, on the setup. But you can see that it found it and it's located on this work group. But a lot of times it would just be a domain name which says new server zero. That's actually the name of my work group for my local computers at home. But it will be kind of the same deal when it comes to domain. It will be the main name first, followed by the computer name. So that means it found it. When it's underlined like that, it means it found it. We can click OK. And we are now directly connected into his registry. So let's go ahead and kind of navigate, see if we can find that Adobe. We're going to expand H key local machine. You know, it's a local machine on his computer. We, we are now connected to it. And we're going to expand H key local machine. And guess the next thing we're going to do. We're going to use some logic here, guys, and we're going to just go to software. We're going to expand software because we know Adobe is software. Now, there are a couple of different places that it might be, depending on whether it's 32-bit or 64-bit software. But you can see right away that Adobe shows up here. So if you expand that, you can see that this is actually for Premiere Pro and After Effects. So that's not what we're actually worked on. We actually worked on Adobe uh, DC or Adobe Reader DC. So if we scroll down and expand wow 
64.32 node, which indicates that it's a 32-bit software. Uh, we can now look for Adobe here and expand that, and we can now see that there is Adobe Reader there, right there. And then if we expand that, there's DC, and inside of that we can, you know, whatever we need to make changes to, we can now go inside of its uh, remote registry settings and make any changes this, that we want. Once we make these changes, we can immediately ask them to try, ask the user to try to see if the issue was resolved. Okay, now let's look at another example here and another example of a ticket. Of course, finish up noting your ticket. I'm going to add internal note here first. I'm going to say issue resolved by configuration. And then depending on the environment that you work in, you may have to specify what you exactly did, in which case we did, uh, um, I don't know, reset config folder data. We're going to save it, and then we're going to mark it resolved, completed, and that's that. That ticket, whoops. That ticket should be now gone out of our system. And we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket. All right, let's click on this ticket. This ticket is called, I am missing internet shortcuts folder. And then if you look in the descriptions, we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know, it was with deleted or it's just simply gone. Who knows? Maybe it was moved somewhere. That happens sometimes too. User would just accidentally, you know, for example, they would like, if you look at over here, they would drag it somewhere and it would go God knows where, you know. So typically you would say, hey, can you check your recycle bin? Go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there, you know, this and that. And yeah, definitely do all of that stuff. But if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it, and then, but you can find a copy of. You can ask them, "Hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over." Because it's just internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play, and then first thing, of course, we're going to do assign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves, and then we're going to reply to customer. Hello, this is Irvin with. US or you can say tech support doesn't matter you know let's, let's do tech support with tech support or you know you can say help desk you know whatever your situation might be can you please provide your PC name so that I can restore your folder thank you Thanks you. <laughs> Thanks, Erwin. Okay. So now user has been asked, or you can call them, you can talk to them. Again, we're going to go back to the user. And, you know, we're going to get that PC name. And in this case, we're going to pretend that the same PC name is Kobuman. So we're going to keep doing that. The PC, let's do this, users. PC name is Kobolman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that, uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called inter net shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is but what if for some reason just using a pc name doesn't work some, there might be an issue with dns so just type in in kobolman1 and you know going inside of that you know shared drive or shared network connection i should say what if that doesn't work then we're going to have to get an ip address and see how that goes so you can ask them too hey what is your ip address 
and if they're like uh, I don't know uh, you can just ask them okay well can you go command line this and that but that's too complicated so let's go back <laughs> and ask them to give us the IP address without any confusion but but let's see what else we can do you know before we do that let's let's see what else we can do without actually confusing things and confusing the user because we don't we don't want to do that we just want to find that out on our own all right let's go back to our own computer all right so let's say this this wasn't successful and this didn't work and for some reason we can't access it using you know Koboman one like so let's say that doesn't work let's say we're not able we get an error or just doesn't you know it just says not found then we're going to find the, in, uh, their IP address and see if that works so of course the first thing we can do is open our command line and do a quick ping we're going to do a quick pingage you're going to type in ping kobuman one and here's our result and guess what it is it's an IP version 6 <laughs> it's an IP version 6 I uh, if we do this it's not gonna work nothing's gonna happen because this uh, systems are not set up to you know what I call backdooring into a computer some people may disagree but this is what I call backdoor into a computer you can just type in and usually instead of just a you know PC name you just type in the IP address and same deal let's see if we can get that C share yeah it's not going to work so now we need to actually find what the IP version or translated or I guess translated in, in a way but what we're actually looking for is an equivalent IP version 4 of this IP version 6 uh, IP address so this is IP version 6 that we're looking at here but we want to know what the standard is what the standard IP version 4 is so let's go back to the user's computer you can say hello sir can you please tell me what your IP address is and you can just tell them uh, can you please go to the search bar and then type in I don't know there are a couple of ways of getting to it I'm just gonna tell them to type in network and then first thing that comes up is network status and I'm just gonna tell them uh, why don't you go ahead and click on change connection properties and then if we scroll down it gives you a bunch of different information now, here's our IP version 6 remember this is our IP version 6 that we tried earlier and it didn't work but luckily we do have equivalent IP version 4 which is right here and that is 192.168.1.102 all right let's go back to our computer all right now let's try that so we're going to backslash backslash 192 and you can see that I accessed it before so 192.168.1.102 and then C dollar sign enter and there it is same thing uh, that we can do with uh, what you might call it same thing we can do with the registry we can connect to using the IP address but let's go ahead and take care of this user real quick we're going to go and copy the internet shortcuts folder back into their desktop and now that we are back at users computer now we can see that internet shortcut has appeared now let's go ahead and do the registry edit thing reg edit and then we're going to use that connect network registry let me just minimize this stuff real quick here with this so it's out of the way 192.168.1.102 okay and again it takes just a little bit to kind of figure out what's going on and now it's actually asking me for login ID so I'm going to use typically you can use your domain login but since I'm not on a domain I'm just going to use a local admin uh, a local admin ID and password and there it is we're back at the same thing except now we're accessing it using an IP address so there you have it guys there are many many different ways to deal with this I uh, these are just the typical ones that I go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever I'm working tickets whenever you know I work as a business system analyst but I do work on tickets especially nowadays now that we're working from home 
so they need more assistance so this is what i do mostly nowadays uh, simply because different times you know different times guys so now i'm just gonna finish our my ticket here you know made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete all right guys if you get one second please click the like button it really means a lot to me that way i know you guys like my stuff and i'll keep making more videos because of that thank you so much and let's get into it all right guys let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video windows updates what do we need to know about windows updates let's have a look on windows updates how they look like on your computer i'm sure you already know this but this is how you get to them if you click on the start button and then click settings and then if you click update and security and that's just one way of getting to windows updates so this is what you see nowadays this is, has changed a lot from windows 7 and it kind of looks like this now where it gives you a little bit more options right now i have paused windows updates and for the right reasons because i wanted to show you uh, how it looks like when it starts updating in case you're not aware most of you i'm sure have seen this happen on your computer but a lot of times it just happens in the background and it just kind of does its thing so here's an example of security intelligence update here for microsoft defender antivirus so what that was actually was an update for your built-in windows antivirus software and we could we saw the what they called a kb which is a knowledge base article about that Here's another one here, and this one is a update for Windows 10 version 19.09 for X64 based system. And here's the KB number for it. So, so KB, we're going to copy this KB, the whole thing. So it's KB4497165. And then we're going to look it up on the internet to see exactly what this is. But we can tell kind of here what it might be kind of in just general so it's kind of vague right now all it tells us it's update from windows 10 version 1909 and down here you can see that it's a fairly large uh, or an important update that it requires a restart so there's a pop-up here that says restart and of course we have a you know big old restart button here so let's kind of dig into this version 1909 why does it say version 1909 well let's see what our windows version is so if you go to search button and just type in w i n v r v e r i'm sorry so if you hit enter it gives you the windows version so here it is it's our version 1909 microsoft version 1909 and again it's pretty vague and it just tells us that it is update for that specific os build so it's uh, windows uh, version 1909 all right so if you do me a favor and pause the video here and kind of check which version you have on your computer and i'm really curious to which version you guys are using you'd be surprised i bet some of you have a version like 1809 or even something else let me know in the comments i'm really curious about that all right so we have copied our kb now we're going to open up let me see here you know what let's just open edge see if it works i've actually seen edge work sometimes and sometimes it doesn't sometimes it just crashes out of the blue but that's okay we're going to just open it up and we're going to go to googleage and search for our knowledge article is what i call them um don't know exactly what they would call it hey there is no connectivity which is really really surprising because i know i do have connectivity huh cannot connect securely to this page oh there it is that was really bizarre guys i'm not sure it could be my internet that is causing this issue although i did get a new modem just literally last week maybe it's my router maybe i need to change some uh, router setting so here here's our uh KB here and it's 4497165 let's see if it refers to that 4497165 we have double checked that and here is a knowledge article from Microsoft here it is 
It's an Intel microcode update. And now we can kind of dig into this and kind of see what this is about. Again, this is good to know for somebody who is working desktop support before you push these type of updates to all the computers in the environment or a business environment. So let's look at what kind of it's in what this is about from top to bottom so you can see that it's an article and that there is the title of it and it says here applies to Windows Server applies to Windows Server version 1903 all editions Windows 10 uh, version 1903 all editions Windows Server and Windows version 1909 and then all editions and then there is more so basically it's an update for all versions of Windows that are 1903 through 1909. Okay, and in the summary it says, it, you know, basically it's a description of it, and it's upgrade. It's an update to Intel Microcode for the following products of, of CPUs. Basically, is what they're talking about. So here are different types of CPUs. These are all different types of Intel. CPUs and that's what the updates is for. So it's we got Demerton, Sandy Bridge, Sandy Bridge E, Valley View, Whiskey Lake U, and then there's these other ones. We got Haswell's, Haswell desktops, a lot of server type of stuff. So in the nutshell, this article tells us a lot more information than what we see here in just a basic kind of title of Windows updates. And as desktop support, you want to look and read this whole thing, the whole thing before you actually decide to push this update. And of course, you want to test it in a business type of in, in environment. And basically, you want to test it on a computer that you have like in a lab that you're testing before you, you know, push these. It's probably okay. You know, these are all just you know, just a microcode update for, you know, CPUs. And they've obviously they've been tested by Microsoft before they decided to update. But this is the same type of thing you have to do as somebody who does desktop support as well. So that's a, a one important thing. This example just happened to be this microcode update. And it's a good example because you don't want to like, you know, you don't want to break all your system by installing a new microcode on your computer. But let's kind of look at an update history so we can look at another example of a Windows update. All right, so I'm going to close this. We're going to restart a little bit later, but I first want to show you this other. Hey guys, I'm sorry to interrupt the video here, but I just want to pause it real quick and just kind of clarify that where I'm going right now is a place where Windows updates can be removed. The reason I'm going to this tab or this area is because it's easier to kind of talk about installed updates that are already on there. However, if you want to see the full history of updates on this computer, you can just kind of pay attention to this arrow that is pointing to that. So we wouldn't necessarily go anywhere else from this tab if you just want to see the updates that are on there. You know, some updates are not removable, but the page I'm going to are the ones that you can remove them. Uh, type of Windows update. So to see those, we actually have to go to apps and features. So I'm going to right click our little start button here. We're going to click apps and features. And it's not going to be here. We're going to have to go to our other old school type of uh, add remove software or program that you have probably are familiar from Windows 7 and older operating system. So right here, we're going to actually click on programs and features. This is going to take us to a place that gives us a lot more details of what it's installed. And I personally like it better because it's kind of a smaller font. It's more compact and you can see a lot more. So this is a typical place where you would see all the things that are installed on your computer, whether it's just some programs, some distributable packages, you know, everything that you've pretty much installed manually and things that have installed automatically. But that's not exactly what we are looking for here. We are looking for actual updates. And that is actually located right here, right above turn on Windows features on and off. There's a button called View Installed Updates. So we're going to select that and check it out. Now I'm going to kind of move this around a little bit here so I can show you something very interesting. I'm going to squeeze this here. Oh, okay, that's good enough. So I wanted to show you, remember the uh, KB that we looked at first? It was KB4497165. 
Well, here it is. It's actually here on the bottom and on the right side here, if you notice, there is no installed on date. So there is the installed on column and there's no install on date because we still haven't rebooted here. We're still waiting for it to actually fully install. And once that's done, we're going to have an actual installed on date here. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this is what this is the uh, order uh, that it's um, sorted out by default. So once you open this, the bottom one is always going to be the most current, most current uh, Windows update. So we're going to start looking from the top, and that's the first thing that in, was installed. And it was uh, on June 18, 2018, and the first thing that got installed was KB2565063, which is just basically a Microsoft Visual C++ 2010 redistributable. So what that is, it's just a package that you that is required to run a certain program. Some programs require this, and this is what that is. It's kind of self-explanatory. We can look it up just to confirm. So it's 2565063. Let's go back to our Google. I'm going to type in 2565063. Is that what it was? That's right. 256 five zero six three two five six five zero six three and here it is the first update for microsoft windows and it's very vague we don't know what this is so this is our good opportunity to figure out what that is so it's kb four five five six seven nine nine all right let's see four five five see my short term memory it's really early in the morning so i can't <laughs> exactly sometimes six seven nine nine six seven nine nine <laughs> i had my coffee but my short memory is not that great so let's see here again uh, march march 12th that's when it was created and if it's four five five six seven nine nine we're going to click on that i'm going to move it up here and see what that is all right, so here's a, here it is. It's kind of the same thing. We can see here what it applies to again, and uh, you can certainly read that as well, and you can see the actual release date on it. My computer got it, let's see here, eight days later. Did I say March? I'm sorry. It was actually May that it installed on. <laughs> um, now, this one is actually also vague, which is kind of very disappointing. I wish we could get more information on this. But if we scroll down and we can see that there are highlights for this knowledge base article and all it is, it, it just tells us that it's updates to improve security when using Internet Explorer and Microsoft Edge, updates to improve security when using input devices and updates to verify user password. So these are just regular updates to the basically kind of security settings that are kind of used in Windows operating system. And you can see how it goes on, improve security when using Microsoft Xbox, Windows, uh, improve security and Windows perform basic operations. So these are just regular things that they keep updating to kind of make sure that everything stays secure on your computer. And that's what this update is about. It's very vague. It's not a like critical update or anything like that it's just something that they keep doing and doing to kind of improve things on the operating system so here's a security update that i wanted to show you and it's kb4552152152 uh, let me see if i can remember that 21552 nope i need more coffee guys 45521 2152. Okay, there it is. All right, so we're going to click on this one. There it is, 4552152. And again, we can go through this and verify what it is. And this update makes a call the impermanence to service stack, which is the components that installs Windows updates. So this is an update to Windows update. <laughs> okay, all right, sure. And it's labeled a security update. All right. I mean, I'm not sure about these labelings that they're using at this point. But the point is of this whole video is that you want to look up as much information and find out as much information about any Windows updates before you push them to mass computers and definitely want to test them out. 
<laughs> there's not much we can do when it comes to kind of digging really deep into this and looking at the code and this and that. And when it comes down to it, it's up to it's up to uh, Microsoft to share this information. And it again, this is kind of disappointing, but it is very very vague, very vague. Um, when you do desktop support, you will have control of which updates are installed at which times, and you know this and that, which is a great thing. Otherwise, I'm not sure how how else you could deal with this. Now, when it comes to these type of updates, Microsoft is 100% in control, and and when it comes to what they are actually working on and what they're fixing, and you as somebody who does desktop support would just have to make sure that they are safe. And you would have to do some testing before you actually deploy them. And that can take sometimes up to a month or even more, depending what the update is. But you definitely want to figure out as much as possible what it's about and do extensive testing when it comes to some of this stuff. And yes, I know most of these things you can just literally, you know, just install and test it. If it's a minor update or it's just update, you know, this and that, you still don't want to like install it and say, hey, it works fine on this computer. No, you want to kind of hang in there for at least a week, I want to say, with some computers being used, actively used to see if everything is okay, just to make sure that that is cool. All right, guys, so here's our resume template. There will be a link in the description for this if you're interested. This is based off a resume that I've used before and got jobs. So this is something from 2013. Since I've had good luck with it, I'm going to use this as a template and kind of modify it. I have removed a bunch of stuff, a bunch of uh, personal information that I didn't want to share, obviously, but the gist of it is here. It was a one page, and the one pager, in my opinion, is the best because, you know, employer doesn't necessarily want to read through all of that stuff. So we're going to modify it from top down. I'm going to read the things that are in the boxes here and for each uh, category here that I have and then we're going to delete it and kind of provide or insert your own. I'm going to teach you how to do it and we're going to use the template that is that is available to us right now. So the first thing you want to see and you want to type is your name. So I'm just going to type in Irvin D. You want to spell out your whole name there. I'm just putting D because, you know, I want to stay private as much as I can. And then you can change the font. You can see that the font here is actually 22. You can play around with this a little bit. I wouldn't go less than 18 or uh, what is it that I changed it to? 18. And because you want the employer to kind of see your resume right away. All right. The next thing it says here, it's address. I actually typed in address there, just the word address, but you want to type in your own address. So if you're following along with this template, just type in your address. I'm just going to pretend like this is my address, Lakeview Drive, which is not my address, by the way. And I'm just going to type in St. Louis, Missouri, 63, I don't know, 555, whatever. So type in your address. And then here it says cell phone. Most people have cell phones. Or if you have a home phone, you can replace this with home. But otherwise, you just type in your phone number. So I'm just going to type in my cell phone number and you do the same thing and then here for the email address whatever that is you just type it in as well very simple the reason you want this is let's say you go for an interview and then a week or two passes by which is normal because the employer goes through so many applicants but then they go they know once they're done interviewing all the people they may say hey i kind of like that irving guy so they go through and they go through all of these resumes and you want them to see your name first that you want them to find them as quickly as possible you want them to be you want this to be your the first thing they see and of course your cell phone and your email address okay that's the whole point of having it like this admittedly this style of resume is a little bit old as you can see it's from 2013 but i'm using this because this is what i used to get this job uh, back in the day i don't see why you would want to change the style anyway uh, from this, but the reason, and another reason for me to actually use this is because the way the information is laid out on a single page and it works. You want it to be, you know, something that potential employer can just read and get right away and get hooked into it because you really want to hook them into that. Okay, so I'm going to read what's in my profile summary as an example 
Again, make sure you don't necessarily use everything that I have on here. Please do not just use this as your own experience, please. Just modify your own and because uh, you want to be honest on a resume. Okay, so that being out of the way, let's go ahead and read what I had in here back in 2013. So it says here, in search of challenging career in IT field, I will further expand my professional experience. So that's kind of an intro there for that. And then I proceed to say, professional experience that I have acquired as a business system analyst, system administrator, desktop support, and working telecom field monitoring activity for eight years. You see what I kind of did there? I tell them, this is my professional experience. You know, I'm telling them right away, I work as a business system analyst, system administrator, desktop support, and working in telecom field monitoring activity for eight years. Now, the reason this is kind of word wordy here is because what this is is actually me working as a fraud analyst, and that entailed me monitoring network traffic over the phone lines and trunk lines uh, for the uh, for the for the company that I worked for. So I had to word it in a such way where it's relevant to the job that I'm applying for. So keep in mind, every time you make a resume, you want to tailor it specifically to that job. So you want to mention things here that are related to that. So that way you can sell yourself to the to the employer. You want to tell them, hey, I have specific experience in that. And we'll get to that as well here in a moment. Moving on, it says here, my dedication to employers shown by my ability to quickly adapt and execute tasks at hand. So that's fine. You're basically telling them, I am really good at adapting. I can learn new things and then I can execute those things really good, you know, or really fast. And then you can change that to your liking as well. So here, so if you want, you know, once you're you know, playing around with my template, you're going to have this in here. So just, if you want to just change it to something that, to, to, so it sounds different. It can be the same thing, but just word it differently. Make sure it's not word for word because, you know, it's plagiarism, but <laughs> I'm not going to hold you on, on to that, though. I don't, you know, just make sure it's not the same thing. Just You can word it in your own way. This is why I'm leaving it like this. And the next thing it says, I have gone through numerous and challenging tasks that required fast learning creativity as part of frequent transitioning testing of new equipment, software, and network systems. So you further are talking about yourself and trying to tell them, hey, I am really good at doing all of these things, you know. Of course, you can go through here and change it to whatever you actually did and, you know, that because, you know, you can't just reword it like this one here. You have to literally this one, tailor this one to your actual experience. So don't reword this one and just put your own experience there. And we can modify that there. And the last thing you want, and which is kind of what I, it's like an open end here. And it says, I have a specific and then what you actually want to do here is say, I have specific experience working on this system or working this job. And then you specify, then you specify something super related and exactly related to this job. Basically, you're telling them, hey, I'm the guy for this job. You know, I'm the guy for this job. All right. Now, that kind of covers that. You guys can fill in your own thing there, modify it, whatever your experience may be. However, I do want to touch on this far, first part of it here where it says, in search of a challenging career in IT field, I will further expand my professional experience. It kind of sounds fake, to be honest. So I'm going to delete that. And then what I'm going to do actually here is move this part of it to the front. I'm going to cut this. And I'm going to move this part of it because I feel like times have changed. And, you know, depending on time of the year when you're looking for a job, if there are more applicants, then you, competition is going to be more fierce. So if you if the first thing is that you put on your resume, I have specific experience working this job or this system or whatever you want. That's the first thing, in my opinion, that you should have on there because that's the first thing they read. OK, so. And then. We can you can modify again this here which says professional experience that I have acquired. You can word this any way you want. Just make sure you provide what is it that you worked for. So let's go ahead and delete this part of this and I just say I don't know help desk. Uh, did you work desktop support? I don't know call center rep. 
you know, because you could be applying for help desk. You can put down, I worked as a call center rep. That's relevant. You know, it's not necessarily IT, but it's definitely relevant. You're really good at customer service. As a matter of fact, you can just put down customer service rep or whatever is it that you, you know, work. And then if you are somebody who's coming out of, uh, if you're somebody who's coming out of school, you can say, um, instead of, uh, let me just kind of backtrack here a little bit. If you have, if you're just coming out of school, you can say, I have specific, let's see here, working experience for this job acquired from school training. You know, you can specify that. So if you're coming out of school, you want to specify something like this. So to tell them, hey, yes, I'm just out of school. I literally just got my degree. I got my certificate. But you can word it in a sense where it just says, I, I know how to do this stuff. So that's what you want to tell them there. Okay. Now, let's see, where did we get to? Okay, we were filling out this customer service rep. So yeah, again, fill this up with any additional uh, per, uh, any additional experience that you may have. And then we have this, my dedication to employers shown by mobility quickly adapt to execute tasks at hand. Again, reward this. Feel free to just reword this to your own liking. I have gone through numerous challenges that requires fast learning and creativity as part of frequent transitioning quest, you know, transitioning testing of new equipment software and network systems. So this is specific to me, but you can modify this to uh, this, for example, that required, let's do this, fast deployment of new OS builds. So I do, I'm just throwing examples in here. Uh, I have I have gone through numerous challenges that require a fast deployment of OS builds. And this could be true in school too. You know, maybe you, you go through this type of training in school as well. Or you can put down, I have gone through numerous challenges that are required fast thinking, fast thinking and problem solving, you know. So, Again, you, you can modify to your own. I'm just kind of throwing you ideas out there and feel free to, you know, just edit this template to your own liking. All right, let's move on to technical skills. All right, so technical skills. What you want to put down is simply technical skills, basically things that you worked on that you can think of. There are so many things and you can go about it different ways. But what I like to do here, and I think this is still pretty good, you can list operating systems. And I kind of filled it in a little bit here to save time in the video, but what I added after I modified my uh, resume, I added Windows 10, Windows 8, Windows 7, and you can go as far back as, as you want. And that kind of kind of lists the things that uh, you're, you've touched on at least at some point, you know? And then you can just basically list all the operating systems that you're familiar with. This is kind of self explanatory planetary but be honest you can see here that i put down windows server 2018 uh, 2003 2008 and 2012 as working knowledge so back in the day i you know and 2013 literally here i didn't really have that much experience with windows server or i wasn't that knowledgeable which has changed over time then of course you can modify this you know like so so 2016 2019 I think that's the current one and then I'm going to delete this working knowledge because I'm actually pretty uh, per, you know proficient proficient um, in these uh, servers now so Linux web server configuration so I'm just going to Linux you know what I'm just going to type in lamp server configuration that's basically for you know web server installation linux based and yeah again just modify make sure you're honest about this because they will ask you about it and if you don't know how to answer any of these things that you're listing then you're basically screwed uh, excuse my uh 
a lack of better words. Uh, if once they figure out that you're basically BSing here, then then you know you wasted everybody's time, and you're not gonna get that job. And then I, next thing I have is software, and then you can list all kinds of different softwares that you've worked on, everything that you can think of. Just list it in there. Don't get into detail. Literally, just list the names like I did here. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. There are so many, so many different things. If I were to actually start adding this, there would be quite a bit more. So I'm, I just kind of left it at that of the things that I could remember. But uh, yeah, I mean, if, <laughs> if you look at some of my videos, you can see that I've worked on many different things. Oh, yeah, I forgot to put AWS and Google. See, now I'm just showing off. I'm sorry, guys. Google Cloud. Oh, what's the Azure? Anyways, you guys get the idea uh, and just kind of fill it out to the best of your knowledge. Make sure if, if it's very little, just make sure that that you probably forgot some things. You know, you'd be surprised. But keep thinking of things that are relevant to that job. Do you think at that job people are working on, you know, are they like what kind of environment? Is it, is it office environment? Then you might want to, you know, list office. So this is outdated, office 2000. <laughs> Anyways, make sure that's updated. This is really outdated. Uh, anyways, I'm not going to start listing different offices because you know that uh, you just got to make sure you update all of that. And then I've got some networking here. If it's related to, um, uh, see, I would actually name the, rename this probably here or maybe just leave it there. I'm, I'm trying to think why I named it just networking because there are some of these things that are very specific here. Anyways. If you want to leave it as networking here, I believe that's completely fine. Uh, the first part of this resume is, is something that's going to hook them up. Once they start reading all your experience here, they're just going to be like, oh, yeah, he knows a bunch of stuff. You know what I mean? So list all the things that are related to that. And you can change this to something else. If the job is, I don't know, let's change this to help desk because I know a lot of people that watch my video are help desk guys. You can start list listening all the things that you used listing things that you've used uh, when working on help desk and you can start listing like ticketing systems and different tools that you've used in here and this and that so let's for example type in just like Jira ticketing system right or um, I already have actor directory user accounts GPO remote desktop uh, you know, all kinds of stuff. See, the, if you're, let's see here, I'm just going to, let's do this here. This is kind of what a help desk might look like. You want to have actor, director, user accounts on there as a first thing because you do that a lot on desktop support or desktop, desktop support, but um, more and more so a help desk type of thing. And then list all the things that you would kind of do as a help desk guy, you know. So start listing all those things and that should be enough. So the next thing we have here is a professional experience. So simply put, this is your experience as the experience that you have, whatever that might be. In my example, you can see here that I have from January 2030 to, third to, to current is what I have filled out here. And it says on-site end user support, troubleshooting, uh, general and proprietary applications. And I've modified this so that way it's related to literally like a desktop support or a help desk type of a a job, but more so towards a desktop support. And then I have 24 seven on call support for major system outages. This is what my kind of my current job is at the moment. Uh, but, and then PC image encryption software, Active Directory, VoIP system troubleshooting, project manager, product impact analysis. But in reality, right now I'm kind of mostly just doing help desk type of stuff because we're working from home and we're no longer on site. So you would basically modify this to whatever your current experience is. And then, of course, you'd want to put your title in there. And I'm going to type in business systems analyst. And I'm going to tab this over so it looks neater. 
going to remove this part of it. And you can you can make slight changes here and there to look so it looks a little bit neater. And then of course, if possible, uh, you can list second job. So let's kind of pretend that I'm that I have help desk, which I do. I don't know why I said pretend. <laughs> help desk experience. Matter of fact, you know what? Let's let's do this. Because I think some of you, I think, and I forgive me if I am jumping to conclusion, but I think some of you may have call center experience. So let's pretend that it's that. And then you describe what you did in your call center job. So, you know, take, I'm going to change that. Take inbound calls from customers. Enter resolve customer issues related to, and then you specify that, and then basically describe everything that you've done. You know, so I'm just using this as an example, and um, if you are kind of like, if you kind of want to put in things that. If you, like, let's say you don't have enough stuff to put in here, you can literally list down things that you've got like a, an award for. You know, you can say uh, call center rep of the month award. You know, stuff like that. If you need things to fill in, just think of all the things that may have happened, some good things that have happened during that job. Anything to just kind of make yourself look good and that describes the job you have done. And I'm not too stressed out about this previous job here because the most recent job might be the most relevant job. This is kind of the main thing that they would read. This is just kind of a secondary type of thing. If this is your, uh, if the, if this is your main thing, if this is your, uh, the only job that you have, then you might want to spend more time on it and describe what it is it that you've done in there make sure that comes across really well because and and if you have to make it so that it's relevant to the job that you're applying for again i can't stress this enough don't lie on any of this stuff please don't lie okay moving on and it's simple very simple the last part of it is just education just kind of list down here oh i need to change this here real quick Down here, list real quick what kind of education you have. Let's say you have A plus certification. Let's see. I don't know. Did I spell certification right now? I didn't. You can say associate degree in, I don't know. Let's say... in business or you can say I mean it doesn't matter that you've got a degree in business you can still get these type of jobs if you want to switch over to doing help desk and work on computers whatever degree that you have make sure you list it but you can you know say whatever that is associate degree and let's say I don't know networking or whatever that might be and then you have to provide location so let's say St. Louis, Missouri, and the name of the college, for example, uh, I don't know, MSU, or whatever the name of the college is, institution, or whatever it is, just list it there. This is very simple, last type of thing. So guys, this is the template I've used to get many interviews, and my current job as well, as business system analyst. So I hope this helps you. I know it's really hard to create a in a, in a, a resume, but as long as you tailor it to the job that you're applying for, and I don't mean again, don't lie, but make sure you sh you tell them that you have that specific experience. So once you go go through and look for jobs, look for the ones that you can do. Don't apply for jobs that you can't do. That's just not 
it's not gonna work and it's not right either it's not it's not honest so yeah feel free to take all of this stuff reword things that that are going to help you that are going to help you and and in in some ways but please don't like for example use the exact same things that I've typed in here so just make sure you use your own this is why I'm not gonna leave it as just a you know empty template with you know things that says operating system and then there's nothing in here I'm gonna leave it as it is so that guys so that way you guys can change it to your own way alright again please use your own stuff on here and I wish you best of luck guys make sure you do a lot of research before you apply for any of the jobs if you need interview training God knows I have videos on that. I have top 20 desktop support interview questions and answers. I have top help desk interview questions and answers. I have top system administrator interview questions and answers. Top network administrator interview questions and answers. I have all of this stuff on my channel. So if you want, if you want to go to my channel, youtube.com forward slash Kobuman, and click on the search box. It's kind of underneath the the uh, the image there like the front image the and with a logo and stuff like there's a search box in there and just type in desktop support matter of fact if you go to youtube.com and just type in desktop support interview questions and answers my video is going to show up or help desk interview questions and answers my videos are going to show up just look just click on the video that says kobo man all right guys thank you so much for watching i wish you best of luck and take care Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman, and today's video is about a ticket that came through our system, and it's going to be about email. Email is very important, and yes, a lot of businesses use Microsoft products for email, but a lot of businesses are actually switching over to web-based services like Gmail, which is pretty normal, and the issue I'm going to talk about is something that comes up a lot for me. I've seen it a lot of times, and this is something you're going to see a lot in Help Desk with any company that has switched over to using Gmail for an example. But then again, if they're switched over to using some other web-based system, chances are that the issue could be resolved the same way as I'm going to show you in this video. Guys, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. It really helps push the video forward. And just so you know, if you subscribe, Pretty soon I will have a crash course about tickets. So this crash course is going to be a lot of examples with tickets and we're going to I'm going to show you how to work those tickets and it's going to be a really good video for you to watch. All right, let's get into this one. So here we are in our ticketing system. If you're not familiar on how to use ticketing systems or just want to know how ticketing systems work, I have a specific video on that. I'll try to remember to put, put a, a pop-up up here so you can check it out and at the end of the video as well. But in this case, we're using a Jira service desk ticketing system as an example. Keep in mind, every company is going to have a very similar system in, in when, which they use in order to track tickets and work tickets. So here's our first ticket that we're seeing here. We're going to click on it. It's going to be related to exactly what I mentioned earlier. We can see it's from Mike Moser. And Mike said, my Gmail is not working. I can see my old emails, but no emails come through, nor can I send emails to people. Uh, we're going to definitely check, take a look at that, but first thing we got to do is assign the ticket to ourselves. So if we come over here, assign it to ourselves. That way we want to make sure we are actually spend time on it and, um, not, and, and work it while we have it assigned to ourselves. We don't want to work a ticket that somebody else picks up. So that's very important. It says, my Gmail is not working. I can see, I can see my old emails, but no emails come through, nor can I send emails to people. And there is a screenshot. We're going to click on the screenshot. And our screenshot literally says not connected, connecting in one second. Or we can click try now. So the error is not connecting. And uh, it's going to retry automatically. I've seen this quite a lot. So this is something you can definitely going to see a lot in a, in a business type of environment that uses Gmail. And it says here, message could not be sent. Check your network and try again. Again, I want to kind of uh, stress this real quick is that a lot of businesses will be using a web-based email system nowadays. Yes, you can, uh, a lot of businesses are going to be using Office product like Outlook and I have videos on that as well. 
but a lot of businesses are switching over to using web-based system and in this case it's Gmail. It's perfectly normal for a large company to be using Gmail nowadays. So this is something you will expect. Now back to our screenshot that we hear that we see here. It says not connected, connecting in one second. So logically thinking it's a connection issue, right? Because literally it says connected. This is a something that as as somebody who does uh, PC troubleshooting, computer troubleshooting, you look at the error specifically and then you are kind of deducting from that what to what might be the issue and it says here message could not be sent remember he said message could not be sent check your network and try again logically speaking again connection issue network so the first thing you would say to him or ask the customer hey do you have network connection do you have internet connection if they're working from home do you have network connection and that's logical way of going about this however I specifically know that this issue is not necessarily re related to their local network connection. It's a connection issue related to connecting to Gmail server or the email server in this case. So this is something that's resolved quite differently and if you ask the user or if you log into their computer or let's say you remote desktop into their computer and you check their network settings and everything looks fine, then you're going to be confused. But I specifically know how to fix this one. So there are a couple of ways of going about this. If you're remoted in or if you're if you're using a remote desktop and you're inside of their computer, you can simply go to Google and go to Gmail and then Gmail is going to load up and sure enough when it, it doesn't usually happen that error usually doesn't pop up or like around here right away but it does pop up whenever they try to send something so everything is going to look fine they're going to see their old emails in here and then they, they can browse everything they can click on something and you know that's all great and fine but they still get that error so there are a couple of ways of doing this there is a temporary solution and the temporary solution to this error is actually to do this. If you go back or reload the page, so if I go to back to if I go to Google.com, which I am already there, but I'm just gonna do it again, Google.com, and you can tell them click on Gmail, and then see on the bottom here it says load basic HTML, click on that. See, I missed it because I wasn't quick enough. So let me go back here. Real quick, I'm going to click Gmail. And then I'm going to have to catch it. Load basic HTML. See, I missed it because it loads so fast. Chances are in the business environment, it's not going to load that fast. Let me see if I can catch it this time. Come on. Load basic. G there it is. So once you load a basic HTML without all this fancy GUI action that you're seeing, uh, it's going to work fine. And But the user is going to be like, well, what's going on? It looks totally different. And then you can simply click switch to standard view. It's going to go back to the old one. And it's actually going to start working fine. But it's a temporary solution because the issue, this issue specifically is related to some kind of a catch data action that's going on in the background. So it's not, if we go back to here and look at this screenshot, it's not connecting and it says check your network and it keeps retrying and retrying especially whenever he tries to send something it's a configuration issue related to being able to connect to gmail server however that configuration resides on our local computer so what happens is when we clicked on load basic html earlier it flushed that and it switched over to the different server that handles basic HTML version of it. So it temporarily fixes it like that when you switch back to normal one, but it's going to revert to using that old configuration information. So there are a couple of ways doing about it. If you have a single sign-on type of a setup in a business environment, which means that users use their domain login typically for every system that they log in, you can simply reset that or you can reset their um, or you can reset their uh, Google or Chrome if they're using Chrome you can reset their Chrome profile so if you see it here if you right click on the little icon here and then it's, you can see that there is a Google profile right there and you can turn on sync this and that but if you click on sign out and create a new one basically refresh it 
this would also resolve the issue. I don't like to do it like that because I like to kind of get into it, uh, like kind of like get my feet in there and exactly to exactly where this actual profile is. So this is what I'm going to show you now. If you open up your file explorer, I'm going to minimize this here, and if you go to the root of C, and you go to the user's profile, user's folder, and you ask them, well, what is your login ID for your domain? And they tell you, my login ID is this and that. And then that, that will tell you what their local login ID profile name is. So let's say their login account is B-U-C-O. He says, my login ID is B-U-C-O. This is where we're going to concentrate on if you're, for example, accessing this over the network or if you're on their PC, literally looking at their local profile. But you could do this over the network. Um, I've shown this in my previous video if you want to check it out on how to do this without RDP at all. And then we're going to go into app data. If, if app data is not showing, you see how it kind of looks like uh, as if it was a cut? Like if you right click and you cut the folder, that's how it looks like. It kind of looks faded folder. That's because it's usually a hidden folder. If you don't see it, uh, you have to just select on show hidden folders. And then you can do that if you click on view or click hidden items right here. So if I do that, it goes away. And if I do that, it comes back. So if you can't see it, it's definitely there. Or you can simply just type it in, app data which is where we're going to. It's the same thing as if I was to click on it. So, again, we're looking at this time, at this point, we're looking for configuration data for that Google Chrome email that we're working with here. So we're going to look to see where this email data and configuration data is located at specifically for Chrome. That's going to be in local. So if you click on the local profile and then look for Google, and it's going to be right there. It says Google. We're going to click on that. And sure enough, here is our Chrome folder. We can click on our Chrome folder, and then it says user data. You see where I'm getting that? If we click on this, it's going to definitely have all the user data, all the catch, and all this other stuff that is related to everything that's going on with Chrome. All right, so for this to work, you're going to have to ask the user to close Chrome entirely. So I would have to close this window, and what, what, what I would normally do is I would click here, and then I would make it, I would rename it, and I would just type it in and call it old. <clears throat> so keep in mind, whenever they open up again, it's going to create a new folder called Chrome as well. It's going to create a new one once you open up Chrome again. So, th and this is how it's going to be. I'm going to right click Chrome and I'm going to run it as a different user. So I'm going to type in B-U-C-O. Let's see, I can't see both. And This is supposed to be a, a login and password ID. It's not showing up properly. There's some kind of weird corruption, but what I'm typing in is actually a login ID and a password, but you can't see it because there's some weird glitch there. And I'm going to click OK, B-U-C-O, and there it is. Now you can see it. Let me see if I can remember the password for that. There it is. So now I've opened up browser, Chrome browser, as the user, and you can see that automatically created a new folder called Chrome. Okay. One thing to keep in mind when you're doing this is that you can see that once you log in, the user, this is exactly what they're going to see, as if they opened up Chrome for the first time. So they're going to have to log in to Chrome again using their single sign-on login. So if you can click here and you can click, you know, sign in, that's fine. But what I usually do, I have them go to google.com, and then I tell them to click on Gmail. And th what this does usually is triggers the sign in for the single sign on system. So you can tell them, you can click or tell them, click a sign on, and then here you just type in your email address, and then from there it's just going to work. Okay, now they're going to be back into their email, and they're going to, and then notice that if they had any bookmarks here, they're not, you know, 
they're not there. So keep in mind, you may have to do this as well before you let them go. So the way you would restore bookmarks, if they have any, if you go back to the Chrome old folder, user data, default, and it's going to be called bookmarks. So this is a backup of it, but here's the bookmarks. So you would take that, copy, go back to Google folder, go back to new Chrome folder, user data, default, and paste it in there. Now their bookmarks or cookie or bookmarks or favorites are back in. Okay, and that would fix this issue that is present to us here. That's how you resolve this specific issue. It's a weird one because it's misleading, but that's how you fix it. And chances are that's how you fix any other web-based email issues. And then, of course, uh, we're going to add internal note. Now, this is all assuming that we are talking to the customer on, on the phone or, or in some other way, like over instant messenger or something like that. So... Uh, there is no reply to customer here because we're already talking to them um, in this uh, role-playing scenario. But since we've resolved the issue, I'm just going to type in resolve issue by Chrome reset. I'm going to save it. And then I'm going to close the ticket. I'm going to mark it as complete. All right, guys, I hope you like this video. Uh, if you have any questions, please let me know in the comments below. Again, I have quite a few more of these ticketing system videos. And very soon, I'm going to combine all of them into one, a really long one that you can sit through and, and just kind of follow along or just you know watch and, and learn from my actual work experience. All right, guys. Thank you so much again and take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Bubble Man. Thank you so much for joining me today. Here's another example of help desk uh, ticket and a phone call that we're going to go through. And if you like these type of videos, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it. We're going to have another role playing session and it's going to be very educational. Again, thank you so much for supporting me by clicking the like button. Much obliged. All right, guys. So here's our ticketing system. If you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems, I certainly have them. Check out my help desk playlist. So in this case, uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here. And we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves. And I'm going to click over here real quick and I'm going to assign it to myself. So what do we have here? This ticket is about my monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me. And this guy's name is Mike Moser. So in this case, this customer really wants us to call them. So in this case, we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that. This guy wants to be called. So we're going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor. Now, I know that a lot of uh, uh, people are working from home nowadays. So in this case, we're going to role, role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home. So that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation. But then again, of course, when you do help desk, you will help people that are working from home as well. So let's give him a call and see how that goes. Hey, this is Mike. Hello, sir. This is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about monitor not working. Now, just to make sure, is this Mike Moser? Yeah, this is Mike Moser. All right, sir. I just wanted to see uh, what I can do to help you with this. Um, so your monitor is not working. Yeah, that's right. My monitor is not working. I don't know what's going on this morning. I uh, logged in and I couldn't, I don't know. It's just, it's just a blank screen. It's just black. It like, kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not sure what I can do here. Sir, um, do you, um, when was the, no, just to make sure. Is your monitor turned on? Like, is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on? 
Yeah, it does It does look like it's there or not, but I don't know what's going on. All right, no problem, sir. Now, does your... Uh, now, just, I just want to make sure, is your computer turned on? Do you see any, like, indication on the computer itself that there's, like, a blinking lights, or is there any activity on it? Yeah, 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 I know. It's uh, it, it's working. I uh, pressed the on button, and uh, it, it's it turned on. Everything seems to be working. It's just the monitors. I, I can tell. I can tell that the... I can hear the noise. Whenever I turned on the, the, the computer, I heard the noise. You know, that, that, that noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, that that's pretty good. Uh, that's a that's um that's a good thing actually. It's better than, you know, better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah. So, um, do you by chance have two monitors? Yeah, I I actually do. Yeah. That's great, sir. So if you can, um, can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working? Yeah, I can try that. Hold on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So what's going on? Chances are that only one of the monitors is broken and not both of them. So if you unplug the one that's not working, the other one should come up with a picture. Uh, all right. All right. I'm, I'm going to try here. Hold on. All right. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see. I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So uh, thankfully, it's just one monitor that's broken. Um, in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is. It wasn't working; it was just kind of dead. And I know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that. No, 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 I didn't touch anything. It's just you know, that's I, I just I, this morning is just stopped working. All right. So the reason I say it's good is because this way you can at least work with my, one monitor for for now. But um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one. So, I mean, there are a couple of ways of going about it. You can order a new one through the, the system that you have in place, maybe through the through the company's website or something. I think there's an ordering website. Or if by chance you go to your local um, office uh, where they have the you know IT guys locally, maybe they can give you a new one or something like that. Because I know you work from home. So, um, all right, all right. Well, I'm glad I got one working Uh all right, I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with, with the one for time being. Uh, all right, uh, well, thanks for your help. Yeah, no problem, sir. If there is anything else that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken. And, ch you know, chances are that if it's an older one, that just happens all the time. Um, all right, um, anything else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for your help. All right, sure. No problem. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you, you too. Bye-bye. All right, so now that we have finished talking to the customer, the next thing we have to do is uh, leave a uh, note or and even close the ticket in this case. So this is a good situation in which we can uh, do so. Uh, chances are, I mean, depending on the setup in your business environment that you may want to route this ticket to their to his local support, it depends on whether he's going to actually go physically to the office where he works and get a monitor from there, you know, but we haven't, since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure, he can deal with that on his end. But of course, we're going to add a eternal note that simply says customers main monitor is not working um let's see here what what else can we say can we provide more detail or or uh, about what we did or are we just going to say that we resolved it by unplugging it well it's up to you I and mean, this is about a style of you how you work so but i like to provide details so what i'm going to do is type in instructed mic to un plug the first slash broken monitor after doing so it appears that the monitor is indeed broken and then we're going to type in workaround down here and again this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in but you want to put down what you did and how you resolved it that's for sure 
your how you do it it's up to you this is what i'm going to do work around he will use his second monitor for time being later he will acquire a new monitor and that's pretty much what I'm going to leave here because what I did here is you know stated that indeed his monitor main monitor is not working asked him to basically test it because uh, that's about the only thing you can do when you're not physically there asked him to unplug the first broken monitor a lot of times you would just check the cables, see if everything is plugged in. But I kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked him to unplug the first broken monitor. Because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken, but it's actually not. What's going on is that their main monitor goes out, but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just it's just black, right? So there's nothing going on. They assume their computer is broken. In this case, he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was right. It's, it's the main monitor that's broken, and I instructed him to unplug the first broken one, and after that, it appears that the monitor is broken indeed. However, he has a workaround, which is his second monitor for time being. So we're going to save that, and uh, we're going to change the status to complete, and... Uh, I think that saved it. I always forget where there's actually a save button because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system and there's actual save button that I have to click after I completed. Well, there you guys, there you have it, guys. Uh, this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket, but it's a good kind of um, shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense. And I hope you like my role playing. Obviously, you can tell that it was me doing the voice. I... Uh, I, I kind of went with um, Dr. Fauci's raspy voice. If you recognize that uh, or if you see that in that, <laughs> let me know. But that's kind of what I went with. It was, uh, uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. But yeah, uh, I, I, that's, that's what I try to go for, for his voice. Anyways, if you have a second, please leave a like. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments. I will uh, I will definitely answer them for you. And uh, yeah, I hope you have a pleasant day. I hope you have a nice, pleasant Thursday. Was it Thursday? Yes, today is a Thursday. All right, take care. Bye-bye. Welcome, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. We have another video on a help desk example phone call in which we fix a WebEx sound issue. This is going to be an exciting one. It's going to be very educational, and it's a real-world example of something you would get as a phone call when you do help desk tier one. All right, guys, let's get into it. But first, real quick, please take one second to click that like button. This way, I'm not going to play any ads at this point. This makes a huge difference for me. I really appreciate your help on this. Thank you so much. And now let's listen to the call. And then after that, during the call, we're going to pause in the middle of it and I'll show you how to fix this WebEx issue. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hey, this is Bob. I, uh, I have, I'm having trouble with my um, uh, WebEx meeting. The audio doesn't work. I'm trying to use my headset, but I, I don't know what's going on. It's just that I've been told that... Uh, they can hear me but i can't hear them or something's going on with with my headset I'm, I'm trying to use it for this webex either like it doesn't matter if i create a meeting or join a meeting there's always the same issue with the headset i can't and it's a new headset i just got from my boss I'm trying to use it here and uh, it's just it's just giving me trouble is this something you can help me out with i sure can uh let me uh let me uh get your uh, pc name real quick there should be a, a pc information uh on your computer for that it's it's a, it could be a computer name or a workstation name there might be even a sticker on your computer can you please give me that sure uh, here it is it's a 35c3to578 thank you very much for that do you mind if i take control of your computer just for a moment i want to have a look and see what's going on sure thing go ahead no problem now just real quick i want to make sure the type of headset that you have, is it a USB one or is it the one that has two prongs or uh, two connectors, if you will? So it's usually it's uh, 
um, if it's just a standard one, it's going to have one that's red and the other one is black and you plug it in usually in the front of the PC or it's just a USB one. I have one of those that's just a USB one. All right, no problem. I'm, I'm taking a look right now. All right, let's pause the phone call here for a moment so we can troubleshoot, so I can show you how I would troubleshoot this. He mentions uh, audio issues. So every time somebody mentions audio issues, I would definitely look at the audio settings inside the computer. And noticed I specifically asked him if he has a USB type of uh, headset or if it's just one of those standard ones with two plugs. And uh, he said he has a USB one, so we're just gonna use that knowledge as our starting point. All right, let's look at the system settings. We're going to right click on our speaker icon here. I'm going to select open sound settings. These are Windows 10 sound settings. I'm not a big fan of this. It is pretty simple. And yes, you can do several troubleshooting in here, but I prefer to click on the sound control panel here, which is the old school way of pulling up and troubleshooting system sound settings for Windows operating systems. So I'm gonna minimize this WebEx here just so I can get that out of the way and not distract you with it. So as in, uh, the first thing we see here is that we have Realtek high definition audio. This is one of those audio systems that will be on pretty much every computer that has Windows operating system. I guarantee you that if you open up sound settings on your computer right now, you will have a Realtek high definition audio. And we know that this is default sound for that PC, meaning that everything that's built into the computer is going to use this and everything that is plugged into it as in specifically microphone or a headset through the regular 3.5 millimeter connector it's going to use Realtek so we can ignore that part of it right now because we're not going to use it we have to concentrate on a USB headset and he specifically you said the USB the only other thing that shows up here is this Plantronics C610 which is a USB headset and you can see there's a little you know there's a green check mark here that means that right now that Realtek is set as default I'm going to go ahead and change this Plantronics to default I'm going to select it I'm going to click set as default now I know for sure that everything on the system is going to use this playback audio as in speaker as default so we changed our speakers to Plantronics C610 which is the headset itself there is nothing else there so we know for sure that that is the headset that he is using now let's go ahead and click on recording here this is going to be set up for our microphone and here we go again we can see that he has a microphone either built in or plugged in somehow but you know if it's a laptop chances are that it's just a built-in microphone and it's again set to Realtek we don't want that we want to set it to our Plantronics and we're going to set it as default now you don't necessarily want to do this as set it set things up as a default depending on preference of the customer but a lot of times to make sure that the issue doesn't uh, repeat itself this is what I like to do is set their main audio to default, whatever that might be. And I will, of course, double check that with the customer as well. So now I know that my microphone is set to the Plantronics, which is the headset. And also our speaker is set to Plantronics, which is the headset. I'm going to click OK. So now everything else that comes up should be using that as default. Now let's look at the WebEx. Now, keep in mind, WebEx is kind of tricky when it comes to setting up audio. If I click on the little cog here and I click, you know, just to click on it to see what are the settings. Where are the settings here for the WebEx? And of course, you can see this, that there is a preference. And once you open it up, you assume that the audio settings would be here, but they're not, unfortunately. You can see that there is account, my personal room, meeting, join, phone numbers, calendars, notifications, video system, but nothing talks about the audio. The audio is actually um, set up when you start a meeting or join a meeting. So let's go ahead and click start a meeting and this is going to launch our little start a meeting pop-up. So with the start meeting enabled here, I know our pop-up comes up. We can see there are some things here that are flipping through and we can see that the, this is the audio setting right here. We're gonna look at that here in a moment, but let's look at this real quick. You see how it says here, use computer for audio. A lot of times if you have a desk phone, like one of those physical desk phones that are just sitting on your desk, there chances are there might be some kind of integration there and that uh, you want to make sure that it's not 
detect it because you can use a desk phone for uh, WebEx meetings and, and whatnot, especially if it's a Cisco phone, uh, usually IP, uh, over IP phone, which all the new phones are. But in our case, we want to make sure that use computer for audio is selected. And uh, let's go ahead and select on our settings here that are kind of flipping through. We're going to click on that and see what we have. And here we have to make a minor change and change the uh, microphone here to make sure that it reflects our Plantronics headset. So we're going to select Plantronics headset or you can click use system settings. I prefer just to click it uh, microphone uh, Plantronics. So if you're going to set up WebEx only and only WebEx to use this headset, you would make sure that it's selected to the microphone and not use system settings. So in case you want to use system settings defaults for something else, um, basically what I'm saying is you can configure WebEx only to use the headset as well. Again, I'm going to double check this with the customer to see what his preferences are. All right, let's get back to the phone call. All right, sir, so it, it looks like there's uh, just a configuration issue with the audio. The headset is probably working just fine. I went ahead and made the changes in the system and the WebEx make sure that this is all set to use the headset most of the time. Now just keep in mind if you're going to use your PC speakers or if you have speakers connected to it, these, these settings may have to be changed back. But right now I set your headset to default so that way it's always going to use that for the time being. Um, if you'd like I can change it, I can only change, I can just change WebEx to use it and nothing else? No, no, that's fine. I don't use the speakers at all. I headset is fine. I don't want people to hear me talking anyways or hear hear what other people are saying on the meeting anyways. All right, no problem. I'll go ahead and leave it like that so it's all set to default now and it should work. Do you want to give it a shot and test it out? Sure. Let me uh let me get my coworker over here. I'm going to start a meeting real quick and test it uh, with her. Hey Susan. You mind testing this with me? All right. Thank you. Go ahead and join. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I can hear you fine too. Awesome. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you for testing this with me. Hello? Yeah, um it's working. It's working fine now. So, uh th thanks for fixing that for me. It was it was so annoying every time I joined the meeting. It just didn't work. No problem. I'm glad to help. Um is there anything else I can assist you with today? No, that's it. Uh, you've been great help. Thank you so much. You bet. You have a good day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. And there you have it, guys. Another successful help desk tier one phone call handled like an IT professional. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Check out my channel. I have a lot more of this type of stuff. i am already made a uh, few of videos that are in this format. So if you if you want to check them out, I, I forget exactly what they were. I think one of them was on resetting passwords. The other one was on some other stuff. Anyways, I have so much I can't remember. But anyways, I try to make these videos at least once a week. Typically, they come out on Saturdays or Sundays when I have free time, uh, you know, from my job and whatnot. But uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Please share it with friends. Let me know what you think. If you just want to say hi, I you know I like I like those comments as well. Anyways, thank you so much for watching. You have a wonderful day. <clears throat> bye bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobo Man. In today's video, we have another crash course of what I typically do every couple months, and that is combine some of my most recent videos into one. So it's a single place to start watching everything that I made because I feel like it's important and maybe it's easier to find for people watching. So here we are. We have starting off a couple of videos on VPN. First VPN video talks about troubleshooting VPN. Some of the most common things to kind of look for and kind of explain to you what VPN is for those people who are new to IT. Video explains things to think about when it comes to working on VPN and especially when a user asks for a password reset. Following on that, we have Zoom troubleshooting setup and audio issues that you may come across when it comes to Zoom. Following that is a video on how to deal with a broken monitor. And then after that, we have a video on 
broken links, website links, and the last video is basically about installing Windows 10. I hope you like it. Please take a moment to like this video and share it with your friends. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them as usual. All right, let's get into it. As somebody who might be working help desk or just tech support for a company, you'll have people who work remotely. And nowadays we have a lot of people working from home. So in order for them to actually be able to work, now they have to connect to the company's network. But now they can't work because they're not on the company's network. They're not physically there at the office. So they have to use VPN software to connect directly and attach themselves to the network of the company. This is why they use VPN software to do so. Now, what I have up right now is just a home user VPN that anybody can use. Not to be confused with a business VPN. This is the reason I have it up. This is going to be totally different. This home one that you can go to google.com and download free VPN, all it does is just hide your location so that way it looks like you're connected to the internet from some other country. That's all it does. It's completely different from business VPN in the sense of access to, to the resources that you need to work as somebody who works for a company. All right, so this is a sample of regular free VPN that regular people use, not workers. So let me show you. Here's the list of servers that they pick. So if they, for example, run this and they, for example, click Brazil, suddenly now they're gonna look like they're connected to the internet from Brazil. So they're basically trying to hide their location. This is not the same thing as a business VPN. All right, that being said, let's look at a business VPN, how it kind of looks like. When it comes to business VPN, you typically get something similar to this. You launch the application and you get a similar pop-up to this. And it asks you for your username, your password, and a second password. So what is this second password? We know this is pretty straightforward. The username is probably going to be your network login or your domain login ID. It's going to be the same thing as what they use when they're at the office. So it's going to be the exact same thing most of the time. It's going to be the exact same thing as what they use at the office. Their username is going to be exact same thing. I'm sorry for repeating that. I just want to make sure that you know this. And the password is going to be the same thing as they use for the office when they log into their computer. Second password, however, is different. This is usually an RSA token. So what is RSA token? RSA token is a one-time password that is always randomized. I think it usually lasts 60 seconds once you get that one-time password, and then it allows you to log in. You may have seen this with some websites. Some websites use one-time passwords to access your different types of accounts. It's very similar to that. So let's concentrate on this second password part of it first. This is kind of what it looks like. This is an old school way of getting that, that one-time password. It's a uh, token that is gen randomly generated. So basically what happens is you press a button, for example, like here or there, and it generates a random number that you use as the second password. A lot of times these are either hardware tokens. This is what they are. These are hardware tokens, but there are also software tokens. Let me just kind of scroll down to show you that. You can get a software token that kind of looks like this. Here it is, this one here where it says VPN token. This is something that's installed on their computer as well. So they'll have an icon on their computer with the VPN software. So the VPN software is going to be separate, and now, but they have to launch this VPN token to get this random code to use as part of their login, login as the second password. It might be the way they put in the password, the second password for the VPN token might be slightly different, varying from VPN software to another, but in the nutshell, they're going to need that VPN token or RSA token, if you will, in order to get that second password so they can log in and access the VPN or the network that they're trying to connect to. You can also have a mobile version of that. So you can have a mobile phone. I don't know if I have an example of that here, but you can 
install an app on your some companies have an option of installing app on your phone that generates this random token so that's the first thing to be concerned about when it comes to connecting through VPN when it comes to customer connecting to the VP so this is the main thing that you see when it comes to VPN uh, with help desk when people call in or contact the help desk there most of the time they're gonna say I can't connect to the VPN the main thing to learn when you work for some company is to learn how they are connecting that's the main thing now let's move on to other things let's look at a VPN servers and how they are different from uh, how they are different from let me see here from regular VPNs this is kind of what it's going to look like for somebody for example working in the United States when they will launch their VPN software they may get a list of servers that kind of look like this and they're all going to be in US and all of these are most likely the servers for the exact same company so this is all the same network they're all on the same network they're just different location this is very normal when they launch their VPN software they will see a bunch of different servers and they may choose to select one of these the reason it, you want to know about this is because sometimes some of these servers will be down it happens sometimes there will be way too many people trying to connect for example to the same one let's look at the let's look at the capacities here for example you can see that the Los Angeles one is the very first one so people automatically they tend to click on the very first server available and you can see that in this example there's 13 percent capacity already meaning that it has the most well this one has a lot too 15 percent but people a lot of times tend to pick the very first uh, VPN server for their company either way if they're having trouble suddenly connecting to for example Los Angeles here just ask them to connect to Miami New York San Jose or Seattle so that's one other thing to kind of keep in mind when it comes to connection issues now the other thing uh, that is very common when it comes to VPN connection is that software is simply not there so you have to have a, a way to uh, reinstall software to reinstall VPN software for the user and a lot of times what happens is a company will set up a website that user can log into before they are connected to VPN so for example what happens is they would get a link they would type in that link whatever that may be get my VPN software dot com for example this is not I don't even know if this is a real website or not but this is kind of what would happen they would get a link and keep in mind they're they're still there at this time they're not connected their problem is they cannot connect to VPN and they don't have software either so they, what happens usually is they will have a link that they go to and once they go to that link they can download the software and install it so you may have to help them install that software as well if they need admin privileges this and that that's just a basic troubleshooting when it comes to installing software but keep that in mind if they don't have it there has to be a way to get that VPN software installed onto their computer before they're connected to the VPN you, you see what I'm saying there has to be an external access or a way to initiate the VPN software installation so that way they can afterwards connect to the VPN and have all the resources available to them afterwards um, so they can just get back to work and start working all right guys I believe this covers the VPN uh, troubleshooting when it comes to help desk or general tech support let me know if you've encountered anything else that might be related to VPN I think I covered kind of the most common issues when it comes to VPN let me know in the comments if there is anything that I've missed I'd be interesting to hear different scenarios different options but keep in mind there are many many different ways of initiating VPN companies a lot of times have their own proprietary software you know different prerequisites meaning they may have a different uh, security so some companies as far as I know may not even require a second password or RSA token which is kind of silly but you do see that with 
smaller companies uh, that may necessarily have the manpower to set all this up and you know make, do the maintenance on it and keep up with all of that stuff. So it's going to be it's going to vary a little bit, but in general, what I've explained to you is exactly the main things. There, there are exactly the, the main things to be concerned about and to learn when it comes to troubleshooting VPN connections. So with this knowledge, you can literally go, for example, to an interview for help desk. And when they ask you about the VPN, you can explain to them how VPN works in this type of sense. Again, it's totally different from VPN that you download from the internet to hide your location. It's completely different. It, it works the same way when it comes to connections, but it's not the same function because here you are just hiding your identity from the rest of the internet, while VPN for a business allows you connect, allows you to connect to the company's network. So that way you have access to all of those resources. So that way you can work, so you can get back to work. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires. Their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer, but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do, as they typically do, is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we got to make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call. And I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. No, oh, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. 
Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just kind of kind of uh, overview of what we gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C A N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account, select apply or OK, and this will unlock the user's account. Now we can get back to them and let them know to try again. Well, there you go, my friends. This is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts. Of course, there are other things you can look at. If you go to the account, you can make some changes to it when it related to password. If you want to change their password, you can change it here. If you select user must change password at the next logon, is something what I would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment. So this is a part of security. You want the user to have their own password. So I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here. Since we found it already, we're going to have to dig through the actor directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password is that now since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user. You can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. 
and now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. But before we do that, please take one second to click the like button. And as always, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. I will answer them. All right, guys, thank you so much. I appreciate that. So here's what Zoom looks like when you install it. This is the Zoom application installed on your computer. When somebody gives you just a link and you've never used Zoom before, and chances are if they just sent you a link, you will simply click on the link and the link will say, hey, do you want to install Zoom? And then you click open Zoom or install Zoom and it's going to install it. And then what you get and what you actually see is this window. This is the window that you would typically see first time you use Zoom. And then you realize maybe my audio is not working. People can't hear me or people can't see me. We're going to definitely talk about that. But the, also a first pop-up that might, you might see is it's going to ask you whether you want to use your computer uh, as audio. So you have to make sure that you click use my computer as audio. So that's going to pop up and you just click on that. And that's very simple. But then even then, if you don't have your audio set up correctly, it may not work. Let's look at the microphone uh, icon here. You can see there's activity there. That means it's detecting that there is a microphone. It's picking up all those sounds from the microphones coming through. That's good. However, we may have multiple microphones. How do we know which one is being used correctly or if any? So what if that's not happening? That means we need to tell it which microphone needs to be used. So if we click on this little arrow here, we're going to see a lot of stuff and you can see I have a lot of stuff. The reason I do is because, you know, I'm a YouTuber. I have a lots of equipment. So there's going to be a lot of stuff that shows up. If you simply have a headset, if you simply have a headset, all you got to do is find out what is the name of it. In my case, I have a headset and it's called Plantronics C610. So I'm going to make sure I select that as the speaker because otherwise I won't be able to hear people. So now my Plantronics C6, C610 is selected. So that's my speaker. That's what I'm going to hear inside of my Plantronics headset that I'm going to put on my head. And then same thing for microphone. I'm going to make sure that this microphone is selected. And notice it's still working. The reason it's working is because it's selected as same as system and I have multiple ones. So it's probably picking up my microphone that I'm speaking to right now, which is not my headset. But for Zoom meeting, I want to use my headset. So I'm going to select it. And then I'm going to double check here, make sure it's selected. And you can tell that it's selected by simple, you know, check mark that you have here. And that's one way to make sure that you're using a separate like if you have multiple things like me this way you can keep track and make sure that you know if you want to use it separate from other equipment you just have to make sure that it knows what you want to use and now my audio is set this is if you're using a headset if you're using like a laptop if you have a laptop you have to make sure that the microphones laptop and speakers are selected so if you're not using a website and just your built-in laptop camera and the microphone, make sure that Realtek is selected for the speakers like this, speakers and the camera. Since I'm not using a laptop, all you see is speakers and no, cam no microphone here. But if I was to, for example, switch to my a, uh, webcam and like, for example, I have a uh, microphone on a webcam that is called HD Pro Webcam. And I'm going to select that if you want, if I want to use that camera. Now, this webcam doesn't have speakers, so I'm going to make sure that Realtek is just enabled, which is my PC speakers, right? So, again, don't pay attention to this last part too much unless you have these specific things. But if you're using a headset, make sure you select the correct headset in both of the, these menus. That way, it makes it simple for you. But if you have a laptop, just a laptop, you won't have this many things in here so just make sure that the real tech is selected but if you have a webcam make sure that the webcam is selected and uh, the pc's speakers so now you can see how i've selected the microphone for the plantronics and it's actually picking up a little bit less of it because it's kind of uh, about a foot or so away from me so it's picking up less of it right now i'm speaking into something else anyways 
that's the audio. Uh, we can certainly test it. You can test it here, test speaker and microphone, and it goes through this setup where it detects the levels of it. And then it tells you, do you hear the ringtone? And it's a really good way to actually make sure that your headset or your audio is working. So I highly suggest you use that for testing. And then you can also have, if you have a phone embedded, that's another thing. Uh, but you know, this is uh, this is video specifically for somebody who chances are just installed a Zoom for the first time, and this phone integration is something else. So I don't necessarily want to talk about this because it'll be way too much and way too confusing. Um, and then uh, you can, if you click Leave Computer Audio, uh, that means you can just like call into the meeting and use your like phone, like your cell phone, you know or your, your home phone if you have them. And then if you want to really look at the audio settings, you can click on the audio settings here, and then you can see again what is selected in just a different separate menu. But it's the same thing we did earlier, except that you can adjust the output levels and this and that, you know? And then there are other things you can do, like use separate audio device to play a ringtone simultaneously. For example, if you have a headset, but you want your ringtone to come through the computer speakers, make sure that this is checked like that, and then select speakers, real tech. So now this time it, the ringtone is going to come through the PC speakers. There are a lot of issues, uh, a lot of issues, a lot of things you can do here. And then, you know, just play with them and make sure, you know, kind of find out what your preferences are. And then, you know, like, for example, you can automatically mute your microphone when you join a meeting. These are all personal preferences. You can go to advanced and deal in and, you know, adjust the background noise. But this is fine as it is. I wouldn't worry about it. Just kind of leave it at that. Otherwise, you can just cause issues, more issues with the audio. And if it works, you know, don't try to fix what's not broken type of thing, you know. So just make sure that your proper microphone and speaker are selected. Do a quick test on them and make sure that works. Now let's look at the video. Video, all, right now I just have a picture there and if I click start video, you can see me here talking and this is uh, <laughs> this is my puppet here, I guess, and I just have that for, and you can see me over here in the, in the right hand corner, uh, right there, you can see me uh, just kind of talking and waving. So I'm the puppeteer, if you will. So my video is enabled here, but if I want to stop at any time, I can just click stop. And then if I want to select a different camera, I can certainly do that. And for example, select this HD you know, webcam or whatever your webcam is, it's going to be listed there. Now keep in mind that if you have a camera open in another program, that it may not work at all. Like in this example, if I select my pro webcam here, it's not going to work because I have it open in another program. So if I click start, it just doesn't do anything. It's, it literally says cannot start video, fail to start video camera, please select another video and camera settings. I know you can't see that error pop up because it's on my second screen where my puppet is. And I'm going to actually switch to it. So maybe, maybe hopefully it stays there. Yeah, you can see it right there that there is the error cannot start video because I had um, camera, um, I clicked on a camera that's been used by something else. So make sure that no other program is open and using your camera. That's why you get that error, you know. Otherwise, it's, you know, it's pretty straightforward. You select the camera you want to use and that's that. Now, and then you can look, I mean, let's look at the video settings here, what we have here. And uh, you can set different uh, options. Of course, select the camera you want to use again, but you can also see that you can change the aspect ratios, enable HD, and you can mirror your video. You can touch up your appearance to make yourself look prettier. And, um, you know, different personal preferences that you want to show people about you. Camera is one of those things that is, you know, I don't like using it um, for obvious reasons because I'm ugly, but, you know, you know, some people like it, some people like it. So, and that's fine. Um, I personally don't care for it. Here's a, some kind of fun thing that you can look at and that is virtual uh, backgrounds. So let me see if this works since I have a green screen going on. I wonder if it'll actually detect it decently or do anything with it. I'm going to select that. I have a green screen. Oh, wow. Hey, that's pretty cool actually. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? All right, all right, let me, let me close it here. I'm going to start video. Hey, that's not bad. So if you have a green screen, this works really cool, doesn't it? I like that. 
that's pretty cool. It looks like I'm in space and whatnot. Let's change to something else. Choose a virtual background. Ooh, at the beach. I wish I was at the beach right now. Look at that. Would y'all look at that? That's pretty cool. Oh, look, it's moving. <laughs> That's actually pretty fun. I've seen other people's, um, you get other people using virtual backgrounds, and it kind of looks off because they don't have green screen. But in my case, I have a perfect green screen because it's software. There's no cloth behind me or anything like that. It's just my puppet, and he um, has a perfect green screen because it's hundred percent green ski and let's do one other oh okay well i think this one's the best although it's not moving and then there is none you can see there is my perfect green screen over here you know all right guys i hope you like this video i think it's really fun to actually create this video i uh, uh it's it's cool it's cool like it's not that hard to use but yeah people still have issues and that's understandable it's okay to have these type of issues you know it's okay as long as we know how to fix them, these are normal computer issues that happen all the time. All right, guys. So here's our ticketing system. If you haven't watched my videos on how to use ticketing systems, I certainly have them. Check out my help desk playlist. So in this case, uh, we're going to work on this ticket from uh, this gentleman here. And we're just going to select it because it's not assigned or anything like that. So the first thing we're going to do is assign it to ourselves. And I'm going to click over here real quick and I'm going to assign it to myself. So what do we have here? This ticket is about my monitor is not working and then there is a number and it says call me. And this guy's name is Mike Moser. So in this case, this customer really wants us to call them. So in this case, we're not going to communicate via email or through the system or through an instant messenger or anything like that. This guy wants to be called. So we're going to call him and we're going to try to help him with a broken monitor. Now, I know that a lot of uh, uh, people are working from home nowadays. So in this case, we're going to role, role play um, into assuming that this guy or this customer is actually working from home. So that way we can kind of provide uh, at least current time type of uh, situation. But then again, of course, when you do help desk, you will help people that are working from home as well. So let's give him a call and see how that goes. Hey, this is Mike. Hello, sir. This is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about monitor not working. Now, just to make sure, is this Mike Moser? Yeah, this is Mike Moser. All right, sir. I just wanted to see uh, what I can do to help you with this. Um, so your monitor is not working? Yeah, that's right. My monitor is not working. I don't know what's going on this morning. I uh, logged in and... I couldn't, I don't know, it's just It's just a blank screen. It's just black, it like, kind of looks like it's dead. So I'm not sure what I can do here. Sir, um, do you, um, when was the, no, just to make sure, is your monitor turned on? Like, is there a green light on it or like some kind of indicator that's turned on? Yeah, it does, it does look like it's turned on, but I don't know what's going on. All right, no problem, sir. Now, does your uh, now just I just want to make sure is your computer turned on? Do you see any like indication on the computer itself that there's like a blinking lights or is there any activity on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's uh, it, it's working. I uh, press the on button and uh, it, it's it turned on. Everything seems to be working. It's just the monitors. I I can tell. I can tell that the I can hear the noise whenever I turned on the 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 computer. I heard the noise. You know that 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 noise that comes up every time you turn on a computer. Oh, okay, okay, yeah, that that's pretty good. Uh, that's a that's um that's a good thing actually. It's better than, you know, better for your monitor to be broken rather than the computer itself. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah, so um, do you by chance have two monitors? Yeah, I I actually do. Yeah, that's great, sir. So if you can, um, can you please unplug the one monitor that's not working? Yeah, I can try that. Hold on. Thank you, sir. I appreciate that. So what's going on? Chances are that only one of the monitors is broken and not both of them. So if you unplug the one that's not working, the other one should come up with a picture. Uh, all right. All right. I'm, I'm going to try here. Hold on. 
All right. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It does. The second monitor does work. Yeah, I see. I see the where I can log in and stuff. Well, that's great, sir. So, uh, thankfully, it's just one monitor that's broken. Um, in this case, it, it really does sound like the first one or the one that your main one is. It wasn't working. It's was just kind of dead. And I know you didn't uh, unplug anything before that or anything like that. No, no, no. I didn't touch anything. It's just you know. That's how I just, I this morning is just stopped working. All right. So the reason I say it's good is because this way you can at least work with mo one monitor for, for now, but um, we can certainly replace your uh, broken one. So, I mean, there are a couple of ways of going about it. You can order a new one through the, the system that you have in place, maybe through the, through the company's website or something. I think there's an ordering website, or if by chance you go to your local um, office uh, where they have the uh, you know IT guys locally, maybe they can give you a new one or something like that. Because I know you work from home, so um, all right, all right. Well, I'm glad I got one working. Uh, all right, I guess I'll just deal with this one or just work with with the one for time being. Uh, all right. Uh, well, thanks for your help. Yeah, no problem, sir. If there is anything else that you need help with, please let me know. Uh, but yeah, it does sound like just one of those monitors is, is broken and ch you know, chances are that if it's an older one, that just happens all the time. Um, all right. Um, anything else? No, nah, no, nah, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks for your help. All right. Sure. No problem. You have a wonderful day. All right. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. All right. So now that we have finished talking to the customer, the next thing we have to do is uh, leave a uh, note or, and even close the ticket in this case. So this is a good situation in which we can uh, do so uh, chances are i mean depending on the setup in your business environment that you may want to route this ticket to their to his local support it depends on whether he's going to actually go physically to the office where he works and get a monitor from there you know but we haven't, since we haven't gone through that with him and he doesn't know for sure, he can deal with that on his end. But of course, we're going to add a eternal note that simply says, customer's main monitor is not working. Um, let's see here. What, what else can we say? Can we provide more detail? Or, or uh, about what we did, or are we just going to say that we resolved it by unplugging it? Well, it's up to you. I and mean, this is about a style of you, how you work. So, but I like to provide details. So what I'm going to do is type in instructed Mike to unplug the first slash broken monitor. After doing so, it appears that the monitor is indeed broken. And then we're going to type in a workaround down here. And again, this is your personal preference on how you put these notes in, but you want to put down what you did and how you resolve it. That's for sure. Your, how you do it, it's up to you. This is what I'm going to do, a workaround. He will use his second monitor for time being. Later, he will acquire a new monitor. And that's pretty much what I'm going to leave here. Because what I did here is, you know, stated that indeed his monitor main monitor is not working asked them to basically test it because uh, that's been about the only thing you can do when you're not physically there ask them to unplug the first broken monitor a lot of times you would just check the cables see if everything is plugged in but i kind of went with my guts here and just kind of asked them to unplug the first broken monitor because this situation also happens where people assume that their computer is broken but it's actually not What's going on is that their main monitor goes out, but their second monitor is actually just blank screen or it's just it's just black, right? So there's nothing going on. They assume their computer is broken. In this case, he kind of assumed it was a monitor and he was right. It's, it's the main monitor that's broken. And I instructed him to unplug the first broken one. And after that, it appears that the monitor is broken indeed. 
However, he has a workaround, which is his second monitor for time being. So we're going to save that and uh, we're going to change the status to complete. And I think that saved it. I always forget where there's actually a save button because I use a bunch of different ticketing systems. And definitely at my main job, I use a different ticketing system and there's actual save button that I have to click after I completed. Well, there you guys. There you have it, guys. Uh, this is how you resolve this simple monitor ticket, but it's a good kind of um, shows you how to deal with a customer in, in a sense. And I hope you like my role playing. Obviously, you can tell that it was me doing the voice. I uh, I, I kind of went with um, Dr. Fauci's raspy voice. If you recognize that uh, or if you see that in that, <laughs> let me know. But that's kind of what I went with. It was the... Uh, uh, I think his name is Anthony Fauci, right? You guys know what I'm talking about um, if you're up to date on the current situation in the world. All right, guys. So let's look at this ticket. I have a, this a mock-up ticket that I created in this uh, service desk system, and it's called My Email Is Not Work. The uh, description would say, Hi, my email is not working. This is my link. And then they show you a link and there's a link right there we can click on it we can check it out that's perfectly fine and then we have an attachment of an error and if we click on that it gives us a lot of clues to what the problem is so i love seeing attachments of the errors because they can save me a lot of time when it, when it comes to working tickets and we already you know we can already guess what the problem here is because we've seen this type of website before many many times chances are we all use this type of website and we can see immediately why mail is not working their email is not working and if we click on the link sure enough it's not working because it's broken but as as we can see here we we know that we are just missing the l there so if we just type in l there just a sec type in l we can see that the email is working so we can simply come back to the customer or user and just say hey this is the correct link which is perfect and great this is easy ticket to do and it's no problem right the situation what i wanted to talk about is related to when a user or a customer reports a link not working of a website that you're not familiar with at all so we can fix this one easily just by adding l but when we go to a website for example imagine if this was the problem here this link up here Imagine if that was the problem. How would we even know that this part of it is not missing? Just that eight. How do we know that? So we won't. We won't know that. It's not like we know every hyperlink for each website to know for sure whether the user is using that specific link. I mean, it can extend to, as far as we know, unlimited length. So how do we deal with that specific issue? So let's pretend that this is a website that's not google.com. That's something totally different. Now we have to reach out to the customer. And preferably, this issue I would handle preferably over the IM or instant messenger if available within that company. If not, you may have to call the user and talk to them directly. That might be another option. And the way I would go approach this, I would reply to the customer. I would say, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about broken a link. And then if, if it's, again, if it's a website that we're not familiar with, we don't know for sure. Because the thing is, though, we click on the link and we also get the same error so we don't know whether they're using the correct link or not or if the website is down for sure so we have to figure out first whether it's the broken link because 90 percent of the time it's the wrong link that they're using and it's not necessarily their fault or anything like that we have to make sure that we're respectful towards the user or the customer because this type of stuff happens you know especially if they're pushing back saying that it's not you know, let's, you know, there, there's, there is the correct link, but that's okay. We're going to get to that part here. So, hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. I have your ticket about broken link. And then we can say, um, if we're suspecting a wrong link that they're using, is anybody else in your group having this issue? 
Or we can say, is anybody else in your group able to access this website? All right? So we can send that off to them and wait for their reply. But you know, since since it's a website, we don't know. We we kind of want to resolve this as quickly as possible. We don't want to necessarily wait for them to receive an email from the ticketing system for the notification. Wait for them to reply this and that. That I mean, that's fine if you know or if they happen to be watching their email all the time. But chances are they're not. This is what I'm saying. You might want to reach them over the IM if possible, or if you want to call them. So. A lot of times they come back and say this, customer, yes, that is the correct link, right? So they may come back and just say that. Then then what do you do? And if you're still suspecting uh, that it is the, you know, that it, that it is the wrong link, you can say, can you please check with one other person just to be sure and then they might come back and say uh usually after a little bit because they are you know chances are they are probably checking you know and then um you know if they come back and say yes it's working for them so this is your clue right here immediately. We immediately have like even higher suspicion that it is indeed a wrong link, a wrong link that they might be using. If is if this is working for somebody else and not for them, and it's obviously not working for us, that's because I, Irvin, and the customer, and the customer, we both have the wrong link that was provided by the customer and then if they keep saying if they keep insisting they are using the same link as me you can say can you please show me the screenshot of a working website so you got to be you got to be very careful with this you got to be kind of uh, systematic in a way but also respectful at the same time you can't just tell them no you are using the wrong link that's not that's not the way you deal with uh, customers or users on the help desk so customer would you know reply with screenshot and then you would look at that screenshot and then chances are that that screenshot will have that clue to you of what the correct link. So you're looking at it and then you're like, well, you are, unfortunately, you are using the wrong link because you're missing like an eight. Or in our case of the email here, you know, we can go back to this. If we look at it, we can say, well, in this case, you're missing an L so that indeed is the wrong link unfortunately and that would resolve that sure at some point you will come across an issue where it's a website that it, it you know the website is down for everybody so and and that's different you know if you you know especially if you're familiar with the website you'll know yeah this is not normal this and that but in this case this is how you deal with a customer or a user that simply has a wrong link for whatever reason. It happens. You just gotta be respectful and be systematic about it and very professional about it. This comes up a lot on help desk, wrong link tickets. It's very, very common thing. All right, guys, I hope you I hope you like this video. I tried to make it as as a real world example as possible and explain it in a way where it's easy to understand. Please let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I have lots of help desk videos. that are very, uh, very useful, very popular. A lot of people like them. And I hope you have a wonderful day, okay? All right, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Oh, wait, wait. I almost forgot to mention, guys. I have a lots of written stuff that's related to help desk, network administration, system administration, all kinds of IT 
topics. I don't even remember how many I got, but it's on my website. It's at CosmicNovo.com. So if you go there, you can see that I have a bunch of different written versions of all kinds of different IT stuff that you can read. If you're if you would if you would rather read um, some of this stuff, then you can certainly do so on my website. So in my recent video, I was installing Windows 10 on the laptop that I've upgraded with an M.2 drive and my excitement and happiness went quickly from that to being very angry at trying to install Windows 10 on it. I do realize that this version of Windows 10 is 1909. I feel like things changed or maybe I missed something. Please let me know. This video that you're about to watch is completely unedited aside from the part of me just adding this intro, but everything else is just straight through without cuts and my experience was not not very good installing windows 10. It, the, the stuff and the amount of things they were making me do just to get into the windows 10 was very infuriating at some point and uh, i hope that doesn't translate to you guys but i just wanted to share it you know this is unedited uh, fairly long clip so here you're going to watch me basically install Windows 10 on this laptop. Alright, here it comes. Uh, now we're going to see how quickly we can install Windows on it. Keep in mind that the USB stick that I put on there is uh, that I plugged in, it's a very old one. That is super slow too, so but you know, I digress. We'll see how fast we can install operating system on it. If it takes too long, I'll certainly uh, edit that out, but hey, uh, who knows? Uh, maybe it's going to be pretty quick. All right. You know, to select new install, by the way, if you're just, there's our drive. I'm going to create a new partition. I'm just going to leave it a default because I want to use all of it. And what was I going to say? So it creates a bunch of different partitions. One just has to be like that for... Um, just the way operating system works. Do you want to proceed? Yes, and uh, yeah, very important. Otherwise, you won't be able to boot. And I get that question a lot from uh, my video on installing an M.2 adapter. Um, very popular video. I want to say it's almost 400,000 views at this point. People always ask me, "Can I boot? You know, can I boot OS through it?" Well, if your computer supports uh, UEFI, then yes. Uh, that's that's definitely possible but not just the regular UEFI either sometimes you gotta have the most recent one most recent version I'm gonna get what was it the most current one 1.3 or 1.4 I'm not sure but um, this one is uh, definitely going fast considering it's it's loading from a USB 2.0 on a really old thumb drive that matter of fact I think I washed one time in my pants because it's one of those that you put on your keychain you know um, it, it it fell off the keychain and it stayed in my pants in my pocket but uh, I still use it it's an old 32 gigabyte drive it's slow but hey that's going pretty fast so I'm happy with that I um, what we're gonna do here I'm going to do a fresh install I'm going to install Crystal Disk, and we're going to run that right away. Matter of fact, I'm not even going to install any drivers for this Samsung NVMe. I'm going to test it without any Samsung drivers installed. Whatever Windows gives me, I'm going to test it with that. What happens, happens, right? And I'm going to make sure I disable uh, any... I'm going to put basically a laptop this into airplane mode so there's no Wi-Fi um, enabled. I'm only going to enable it just so I can install Crystal Disk, but I don't want any updates to start doing because that's the first thing that happens once you install a fresh Windows copy. Oh yeah, that's what I was going to say. Windows 10, if you already had Windows 10 on the computer, you can just reinstall it. And if you get that pop-up, do you want to register and whatnot? Uh, don't worry about that. As soon as you get on the internet, it's going to be, it's going to register it, you know, so because it knows it's hardware based. So it's okay for you to install a new hard drive. I mean, they know that you're going to install a new hard drive because it knows. Um, it's, it's basically going to know that it's the same computer and it's the same key, same key and same license. So you don't have to worry about, oh, am I going to be able to reinstall Windows on it? Yes, you can. I will definitely get a pop-up. Do you want to register it or, you know, this and that? But as soon as I get to the, on the Internet, 
get on the internet it's going to work. Um, same thing if you're doing a fresh install on a brand new computer if you have a Windows 7 key you can also use that to um, you know to activate your Windows. That's what I meant to say. Register, activate, not register. You know, it's it's different. That's activate. Registering Windows is basically creating a Windows Microsoft account to register your product. But how long have I been speaking? This is almost done. It's 95%. And um, that's getting ready files for installation. We'll see how long it takes to install uh, everything else. But so far it's going really fast, considering it has to read from something super slow. But that's okay, you know. I, I think it's going to be really fast anyways. Wow, it instantly installed features. Uh, it, there's, there can't, you can't get any updates because it's not connected to the internet. And wow, that's it's going pretty fast. Let me do a little zoom out action here, so you guys can see the little progress bar down there. Oh wow, it's already done. Oh my god. Oh wow. Okay, okay. See, it's gonna restart up there. Oops, sorry about that. I meant to shake the screen. I just accidentally hit the, the tripod. So it's rebooting right now. And should I unplug it? No, I was thinking about my USB stick. Hopefully it doesn't because it's gonna hopefully it doesn't try to boot from that again. I, uh, well I'm just gonna let it be. If I have to remove the thumb drive in a second here, I'll certainly do that. All right, come on, baby. Come on. Come on, baby. Let's make it happen. Let's make it for the people. Let's make it happen for the people watching. By the way, guys, since we're waiting on this, come on, man. Click the like button. Click the like button. I know you got one second. Okay, so it's trying to reinstall it again. So I'm just going to pull the, hard, the uh, thumb, thumb drive out real quick, and I'm going to cancel this. It's what I should have done right away. So once I once it, this happens it's it's going to it, it's done that that was what was it I'm gonna to have to check maybe three minutes or something like that maybe three minutes to install from a slow thumb drive man I'm very optimistic to see how fast this is gonna go wow did you see that that went quickly all right now usually also, whenever you create a new like a login account for somebody, that can take a while too. Basically, your login ID. Whenever you, you know, trying to do something on the computer and you got to have a login ID, we'll see how fast that goes. I suspect here very shortly it's going to come up to that window where it's going to ask me, "Do you want to activate all these Windows 10 features and whatnot?" Which I personally like to disable but for the sake of moving this along I'm just gonna leave it enabled later on I can disable it I um, I don't like I don't like all that you know too much data being sent over the internet to Microsoft or anybody else and I like to keep things as private as possible all right the screen went dark and they rebooted once more. Let's give it a sec. Give it a sec here, guys. Give it a sec. It's almost there. It's almost there. All right. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. I'm going to sound like... Uh... <laughs> here we go. I was going to say I sound like uh, Elvis, but I probably don't. Elvis Presley. There it is. Cortana. I'm Cortana. No, Cortana. No, come on, Cortana. Here, a touch of Wi-Fi there, and we'll have your PC ready for all you plan to How do I get an exit out of this? Use your voice or the keyboard along the way. Come and on, Cortana. Like to stay quiet, just select the little microphone icon towards the bottom of your screen. Yes. Come on. Come on, Cortana. All right, cool. Sure. Skip. And uh, let's do, I do need to connect real quick to my Wi-Fi, which is this one. I'm going to put my password in. I think that's right. 
Sure, sure. Come on. Let's see how fast we can do this. By the way, by the way, this is like one of the record times for installing Windows 10, honestly. This is all real time. I haven't cut once. I haven't cut even one time. I can't wait to see the uh, the test, the crystal disk test on this. I'm really curious. I don't want to see what's new on Windows. Come on, man. Just, just get in there. Just a moment. All right. I'm waiting. All right. There it is. Nope. I'm not going to use Microsoft account. No. No, 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 no. Come on. I don't want to use this. Come on, man. Back. Let's just do that. Couple, man. I don't want. To, look, I hate this. Get a new one. Get get a new. Create account. I'm trying to create a local account, and it's being so so difficult. They changed it. Create an account. No. I'm not. Can't believe I'm spending so much time on this. This was, it was never like this, but I don't want to create a Microsoft account. This is ridiculous. Oh my god. Fine. Fine, create a new account. Unbelievable. Yes, I know. I already have it somewhere else. I'm not gonna... This is ridiculous. I'm gonna create a local account later. My god. I'm just gonna put whatever... Oh, I probably shouldn't. Otherwise, I won't be able to log in. No, no. I had enough spying of you. See what I'm talking about? Get out of here, man. I'm just going to put in whatever. Jeez. Can't believe it's making me do all of this crap. I'm just going to pick whatever. Unbelievable. And now it's... Look, this is so stupid. Now it's asking me for my phone number. Five 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 five. Amba. Unbelievable, man. This is so ridiculous. It didn't do this before, I'm telling you. Oh, now he wants a pin? Now you want a... F oh. Man. Zero, 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 zero. Zero, 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 zero. Oh my god. Can't believe you're making me do this crap. Unbelievable. I'm sorry guys, I didn't know it was gonna turn into this. What is the do you the more No. I didn't know it was gonna it it's this is I did, I did not think it was going to take more longer than installing the Windows operating system. I hate you, Cortana. This is so stupid. Oh, look, of course it's going to... No. Mm. Decline. Um, oh my, look at all this crap. Now look at all this crap. I wasn't going to talk smack about them, but look at all this crap. All of that stuff is, is spying on you. And trying to advertise to you and trying to sell you their service. I understand you gotta have a business. But man, this is too much. Ridiculous. Ridiculous. My god. It really ruined my day, this 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 crap. Hopefully the benchmark of this. And I'm I guarantee you I will disable all of that stuff. I just don't have time to show you guys this right now. But I'll disable all of those services. 
everything, everything's going to be disabled. This is ridiculous. I, man, I'm, I'm this close. I'm this close to switching to Linux. This close. It's ridiculous. It may take several minutes. I better not. I just put in a new, new hard drive. New solid state M.2 PCIe NVMe drive. I hate you, Microsoft. Look at this. Wants to restart immediately. Hell no. Where's the store? Stupid store. I have to go to stupid store to install this thing. Search Crystal Disk. Come on now. Can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. Where is a Crystal Disk? I know it's there. No. Come on, I know it's your stupid thing. Oh my god. I misspelled it. There it is, Crystal Disk app. Look at that. They made it so difficult to find. No. Get. Can't believe it, man. I have to jump through all these hoops. Come on. Install. All right. This is insanely ridiculous. All right, I'm going to do Okay, airplane mode is on. I can hear the laptop going doing overtime. So there's something going on here. Something is using power. Can you see that? Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. This is an example of a help desk or a call center phone call in which you deal with an angry customer. So this is incredibly important to know because you got to have the skill in order to resolve their issues. Sometimes a customer is so angry that you got to deal with it in a special way so that way you can resolve this issue without it being escalated to your manager. So this is an incredibly important video, not just technically, and I'll show you what the problem is with the computer, but also in a way to deal with it so it's a social video in a sense. All right, guys, let's have a look. But before we do that, please take one second to like my video. This really makes a huge difference, and that way I'm not going to play any ads for you. So what's going to happen, I'm going to show you the customer's phone call, an example phone call, and then I'm going to pause the video and show you how do I fix it, and most of all, on how I dealt with this angry customer. Again, thank you so much for your support, and let's enjoy. Thank you for calling Tech Support. My name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Oh my God, look, I need you to fix my computer, all right? Look, everything is broken. I can't open anything. All right, sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you with this. What seems to be uh, the issue? You know, I'm you, trying I... to open up these Word documents, you know, all my Excels, nothing is working. It's just it, the, the icons kind of changed. I, I don't know. When I click on it, nothing happens. It just doesn't want to. Look, I need this fixed right away because I got important things to do, all right? All right, sure, sir, hey, sir. Sir, no problem. I'm sure I can help you. I'm sure we'll fix this for you. Just, uh, uh, just give me a few moments here. Right? I hate to do this to you, but can you please give me the PC name? That way, I can help you as fast as I as fast as possible. All right. That way, I can possibly take over your computer and just do it for you. All right. P PC name. What is this PC name thing? There should, sir. There should be uh, um, an icon 
on your desktop or something that says PC information or maybe a sticker on the computer that with a PC name. All right, all right. Let me let me see. Hold on, hold on. Let me see. Oh, I, I, I see it. I see it. I see a sticker here. All right, great, sir. Can you please give me that? That way I can just help you real quick. All right, it's uh, 3570COTAFL. All right, thank you, sir, very much for that. All right, all right, I'm going to make sure that I look at your computer. Okay, so what's going to happen is I'm going to uh, request to take control of your computer, and all you got to do is just click accept if there's a pop-up or anything like that. Just make sure you click accept on that. All right, all right, all right. All right, I see it. All right, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for accepting that. All right, I'm going to have a look now, and I'm going to fix it for you. All right, don't worry. Just, just hang tight, please. All right, all right, all right, all right. Let's pause the phone call for just a moment to see what's going on here. And you can see that the customer here is trying to open these documents and it just keeps asking for something to open it with. Uh, these are Excel and Word type of documents. You can see they are uh, extension on them is ODT and ODS. These are basically um, uh, open office type of documents. They can also be opened with regular Microsoft Office, but in this case, we're just going to reinstall open office in this, and this is going to resolve the issue. So let's go ahead and do that real quick. Of course, in a business type of environment, you would have a different type of tool, but in my case, I'm just going to install the executable that I've downloaded with open office, and this will fix it. Okay, sir. Hello, sir. Thank you very much for holding. Look, I, I found the problem for you. Uh, I just need a few moments to fix it but I guarantee I will fix it for you. The thing is though, the uh, Microsoft uh, Office or uh, the software basically used to uh, open these programs for you uh, is removed for some reason. I'm gonna have to reinstall it. Unfortunately, this may need a restart. Oh my God. Sir, I'm really sorry, but I guarantee you this will fix it. Um, it, it may restart, it may not, but if it does, it shouldn't take too long, but I guarantee you will fix it, all right? So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to reinstall it, and then it should work for you. Just give me a moment here. All right, fine. All right, sir, I'm initiating it right now. It's happening, and uh, it, what I'm just kind of waiting for it to install, um, just, you know, just ask you real quick, do you need to save anything just in case the computer decides to reboot on you? Because a lot of times when you install these big programs, it likes to reboot for some reason. I don't want you to lose anything else, you know? All right, let me check. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Go ahead. Go ahead. You're fine. You're fine. All right, sir. Thank you very much. And thank you again for being patient with me. I guarantee this will fix it for you. You just need a few moments and possible restart, but it should be good to go. And uh, hopefully this, this computer is fast, so that way we can get back to them real quick. So I'm just going to keep clicking next. And so far, it's going really quick. And again, a uh, business you work for may have different type of tool that deploys these type of applications. You might want to go in there and do a repair or whatnot if it is Microsoft Office. But in this case, um, it is open office. But either way, we're going to resolve the issue. All right, that was really quick, which is good. That means we can get back to the customer real quick. And you can see now that we can open these uh, just documents. These are just fake documents that I created for the sake of video. And you can see now that it's working. All right, let's get back to the customer. It looks, oh, well, it looks like it installed and uh, I don't see any reboot uh, requirements. So I think you're good to go. Um, you want to check it out before I... Let me, uh, let me have a look real quick. All right. All right, all right, looks good. All right, good. All right, thanks. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. All right, no problem, sir. I, you know, I, I understand the frustration. It, it happens, but you know, you're good to go now. Is there anything else I can help you with? No, nah, I'm good. Thanks. All right, thank you for calling Tech Support. You have a good day. All right, you too. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. There you go, my friends. That's how you handle a, an angry customer. I, uh, I made this video as best as I can in order to show you guys how to do it because it is kind of awkward to, uh, uh, I guess pretend to be the tech support and pretend to be the customer as well in order to create this type of video. So I hope it came out good. Let me know what you think in the comments below. If you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I also like to see when people just say hi. I really like that too. And uh, if you want to check out my channel, I have a bunch of different videos on help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, and all kinds of other IT stuff that you can learn from. And I also have, if you're interested in this type of stuff, I also have more 
videos in this type of format where it shows you how to deal with certain issues and technical issues that you may come across as a help desk technician and again if you're doing just call center type of stuff these videos are also helpful all right thank you so much for watching please share this video if you have a second click the like button i really appreciate that as well thank you again and you have a wonderful day bye bye The second ticket is about email not working. It's a very particular one because it does have an error that comes up. So pay attention to that error and then we're going to work through it together. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Koboman. Today's video is about help desk tickets. Most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what Help Desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to Help Desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. Next one is my email is not working. By Mr. Mike Moser again. Oh, okay. This is an interesting one. You will get this quite a bit. And um, if you guys want to guess, I'll pause briefly by talking about it and you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be. This is the pop-up the user gets, but but first, uh, email's not working. I gotta assign it, assign it to myself so I can get credit for it. So that way I can get paid when my boss look at, looks at the statistics of how many tickets I've done. So it is, my email is not working and then it says Outlook is asking for my login and password. Why do you why do you guys think that happens? If you're watching this in my premiere video, why do you think this happens? So they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this. You know, they see this pop up. This is what happens. And it looks to be I'm trying to open it here in a bigger there it is. And it looks to be asking for their login ID and password, right? And it talks about credentials here. So that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is, and we're going to ask the customer this. Hello, my name is Irvin with PCA Support. And by, you know, chances are, uh, the Mike Mike Moser here uh, already knows us, knows who we are, so maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case. But, you know, if you don't know him, keep doing it. It's part of the job. I have your... Sorry, guys. Ticket about email not working. Did you, by chance, change your password recently so guys this is exactly what I'm suspecting here is that either his his password Mike's password expired and he changed it while he was already inside the window some companies provide a provide you with a a way to reset your password especially if it's a single sign-on meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use which can for which you can change the password on just a website like one of the websites will use that single sign-on that single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login so when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on also known as SSO it's going to ask for your domain login if your domain login's password expired that day it's going to ask you to change that password. When you change your password on the website, your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away. What do I mean by that? Your computer that you're logged in, you're still logged in with your old password. So what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your, 
new password before you open up other programs. If you don't, you get this pop-up. This is what happens. And maybe, also, maybe, he locked himself out out of the computer. So we're going to concentrate on that. And with the reply, I suspect it's going to be 99% chance that this is the issue. What we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password. Because maybe they forgot the password, typed it in 10 times, and then now they're locked out. And their Outlook doesn't have their current password. You know, But this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password. Or it hasn't, again, replicated on their local computer. The websites that use the password are fine, but the system itself hasn't received the new password. And that's the issue here, most likely. So we're going to go inside of Active Directory. And this is my virtual server here. And I'm just going to log in real quick here. I'm going to open up Active Directory, Windows Admin Tools, and Active Directory Users and Computers. The company you work for doing Help Desk may have a web just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as i'm doing right now it may not give you direct access to active directory at all which is normal which is unfortunate but it's normal so you may have different means but you are basically doing exactly what i'm doing and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case so what i like to do is you see the uh, users folder on the right hand. So instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is, and uh, I know I can see him there, but th this could be populated with thousands of users. We don't know. So what I'm going to do is right click the folder. I'm going to click find. And then in, in search here, I'm going to type in Mike Moser. We can also ask him for his login ID, what he uses to log into the computer. And here he is. We found them right away. We don't have to search through thousands of different names. We found them right away. We're going to right-click him. Right-click him. And then we're going to click Reset Password. So we're going to change the password. We're going to give him a new password. What I like to do is give him a simple password. Like, what is today? Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. Again, Tuesday. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is a, going to be a temporary password. This is why it's so simple. I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's going to change it right away. And you can see here that there's a check mark already. It says user must change the password at next login. The user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect. So they're going to change it. As soon as I tell them, okay, your new password is Tuesday, one, two, three, four, five, six with capital T, they're going to be forced to change it right away and hopefully to something way more secure. Uh, but this is what I like to do. Uh, it's up to you. Some places don't allow this to according to the group policy, but this is what I do typically. Um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this, then, then I'm going to use that. But this is what I like to do as, as it is. And I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account. So in case he's locked out, it's going to unlock him. I'm going to click OK. It says the password has been changed for Mike Moser. And I'm going to tell Mike, hello, Mike, I have changed your password. Go ahead and type it in again. Or what I would actually say, go ahead and lock your computer like this. Lock your computer, Mike. And then do Control-Alt-Delete. And then type in your new password. And then it's going to force him to change the password at that point. And that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the, uh, whatchamacallit, with Outlook. He should no longer get this Outlook pop-up at all. Because now, Outlook, since it's part of Windows operating system, once you install it, once you have it installed, it becomes part of Windows operating system, it will detect the new password. And even if it doesn't, even if it comes up again, he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this. 
what I also like to do is tell them to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards. That way, it's going to ensure that everything in the background running, whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products, including Office. If you may, keep in mind, Outlook is part of Office. So if you have anything else running, you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect. So I tell them, just reboot the computer. It's going to flush everything, you know. And that's the simple way of dealing with this. And I'm going to add external node here and say resolve issue by password reset. I'm going to keep it simple like this. And this will resolve this issue. I guarantee it. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. I am trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic. I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced, tier two, tier three, system admin, network admin, and whatnot. I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel, just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. It has a lots of written material you can check out. And especially if you are interested in help when it comes to getting that job. So interview questions and answers. I have a lot of that stuff. All right. Thanks again. Please share a like and leave a comment. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hey guys, here we go again. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. We're continuing where we left off. Our previous video was about Outlook issue. Today, it's going to be about a printer. I'm going to work the printer ticket. I'm going to show you how to install a printer for a user and how you can also communicate that with the user in a proper way so it's not confusing because there are multiple things you actually have to get from the user in order to do this properly. It's a really good video for a help desk. That being said, it's based or it comes from my large video that I made that's about two hour long training specifically for help desk. If you want to check that out, it's right there. And that being said, please take one second to like the video. I know I say this every video, but thank you so much, guys. You're awesome. All right, let's get into it. By the way, if you're still with me, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys so much. One more ticket, guys. It's this one here. It says, I need help installing a printer. Very common one. Very good one. We're going to work on this one. I need help installing printer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired. Uh, but we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to fight through we're almost almost done here i'm trying to install a printer but it's not working we're going to reply to the customer I say hello my name is Irvin with help desk what kind of printer are you trying to add local printer or network printer now this can be confusing to to the user to the customer because what i'm actually trying to figure out it's actually are they at home are they working from home are they trying to add, add a local printer or are they trying to add a network printer which is actually in an, an office but to them, network printer could also be a local printer. Sometimes they don't know, you know, but that's okay. We're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on. But we can also say also, can you please send me your PC name with, and you know what? Let's 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 hold off on this part of it, because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial. So if they first reply and say, and usually I, I like to be more proactive, but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user, because sometimes users can't 
and this is not their fault necessarily. This is just how human mind works. They can't multitask. If I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer for somebody that works from home? This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be no problem. You know, they some people are not allowed to print either, depending who they are, but chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a a, there, there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins. Chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff. Companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues. So we got to be careful about this. We got to find this out. Um, if possible, I would call them and talk to them. Uh, if not, I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email. I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we, we need to find out. But in this case, let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply, say, okay, in that case, can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add let's do this I can add the printer for you however I need your PC name to take control remotely. So you got to word this the best way you can because we, you know, we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them. And we're going to do this. So let's kind of go over it again. Okay, I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control of, control remotely. And can you please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add? So of your PC remotely. So we need to know their PC name. And I didn't want to say, can you send me your PC name or IP address? Because I'm already asking for IP address for their printer. And I don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part. I want them to give me PC name and the IP addresses of the printer. IP address of the printer trying to add. You see what I'm saying? Keep it as simple as possible, but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner. Once we get this information, we're going to go to their computer and here we are at their computer again. Uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson. And the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed, we're going to go to the search bar. And you, can, you can get to this through the control panel as well. But I'm going to say devices and printers. Here we go printers and scanners, devices and printers. We want to get to here, guys. This is this is where you can see device number, and I'll show you a different version of it, which is was the typical one. But this is the what I call Mickey Mouse version of Windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing, where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already, and they would all be here. All right, and then if it's not here, which we don't see one, we can simply click add a new one. So now it's looking for, what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network. And if it doesn't find one, we can simply click here, the printer, uh, here I'm looking for 
the, pl the printer that I want isn't listed. Other way of going to this here is control panel, devices and printers here, and we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before. This is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here. It's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers. So every device, you know, whether it's a USB or, or whatnot, or monitor or, you know, the headset that we talked about earlier. And of course, if there are any printers, they will be listed here. But of course, there is a button. Guess where we need to go? We're going to click on the add printer. And this is the same thing we looked at earlier, but this is just how it looks like. That's how it used to look like before, before Windows 10 Mickey Mouse looking stuff, you know. And uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing, which doesn't make sense to me. Why not just keep it the way it is, where it's just one place for one thing? You know, anyways, that's a different video. Okay, so it's not going to find anything. What I'm going to do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed. So same thing we did earlier. And then here you can add the printer multiple ways, where it's a Bluetooth wireless local printer, blah, blah, blah. Select anything that you want. But in this case, we're going to select a network printer, which is going to be added using TCP IP address or host name or an IP address that we got from the customer. And here we're just going to type it in, for example, 168.2.1, whatever. It's whatever the static IP address is for that printer. It's going to have to be a static IP address because, you know, it's a printer. It doesn't we got to have a static IP address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time. And then we're going to leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use. What that does, it pings the printer and says, hey, I'm trying to add you, but do you have a driver? And then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer, it's going to have that driver. It's going to automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it, you know. Same thing when you're adding a local printer, you may have to download the driver, install the driver, but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer. You know, once you click next, it may if it doesn't find if it doesn't find the driver, and it's going to bring you to uh, nothing's going to happen here, so I can't really show you this at this time. But what happens? It's it's going to say, okay, I found this IP address. I know it's a printer there, but which one is it? And then you go through a list that's available there and you select which model like for example Xerox blah 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 and you select and you tell it which printer there is that, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect so if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically you're gonna have to ask the user can you tell me the name and model of that printer so that way you can get those drivers and install them properly once you do that it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default, kind of like this. So if you see one like that, just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants, he or she wants, and then make sure it's set as default. See, it have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle. Okay, and now we're going to add external or internal note I should say added printer as requested Irvin and I'm going to close the ticket well there you have it guys thank you so much for watching this uh, short premiere video I know it's short I wish I could uh, make them longer uh, I will do that sometimes as well but these short ones, I can at least take a break from my work, from my main job, so that way I can hang out with you guys. In case you have any questions, uh, feel free to uh, leave them in the comments below. I'm sorry if I missed your uh, questions. I know it happens really quick sometimes. And if you do still have a question and need me to answer it, please leave it in the comments below. All right, guys, that's all for today. I'll see you next time, maybe even tomorrow. We'll see. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I want to talk about a specific VPN issue that you will come across 
that can quickly go downhill unless you handle it in a proper way. What I'm talking about is simply somebody calls in and says, can you reset my Windows login password? You need to stop right away. If they're on VPN, you can't just reset their password because it can go quickly downhill from there. You can make a lot more problems for yourself unless you follow these exact steps. So this issue happens a lot when person's password expires. Their password expires and suddenly they cannot get onto VPN. They can typically log into their computer, but they can't get on their VPN because they don't get that prompt to change their password at all. And they can't just do control alt delete. This is where you can usually click change password or it would just it would just force you to change the password. They can't do that because they're not on VPN yet. They are disconnected at this time. So the only thing they can do as they typically do is just call help desk and ask for a password reset. But we gotta make sure that we don't just jump into resetting until we do a couple of things first. Let's have a look how I handle this call and I hope you like my role playing. Uh, if you do, please take a second to like this video. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, guys. So user decides that they need to change their password, so they need help with that. So what they do is they pick up the phone and call the help desk. And it goes something like this. Hi, my name is Bob. Can you uh, reset my password? I'm having a lot of trouble logging in. Can you reset my password? Sure thing, sir. I can reset your password. So this is something you would normally say to anybody who calls in and asks for a password change or a reset. So what can you do with that? The thing is, though, you have to keep in mind that when he's on VPN, he will not be able to take that temporary password that you've given to him and change it to his permanent password. Well, why is that? He's not connected to the same domain that you're changing his password on. So the question we need to ask him first is, are you able, sir, are you able to get on VPN? No, I, uh, I can't. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm not on VPN. I can't log into VPN. That's why I need you to reset my password. Sure thing, sir. But keep in mind that unless you're on a VPN, uh, me changing your password is not going to help you. Now, just to make sure, are you already logged in to the computer? Oh, uh, no, not not at the time. It's not at the moment. Uh, you want me to log in? Yes, please, sir. Uh, please log into the computer and make sure you stay logged in. Uh, I can't give you a temporary password uh, because the system is set up in such way where you can't change it to your permanent password until you're connected with your VPN first. And in order for you to connect to the VPN first, I got to give you a permanent password because it just won't work. You can't use your temporary password to log into the VPN. And once you are logged into VPN, uh, you can go ahead and update all your other systems by simply locking your computer and then unlocking your computer with your new permanent password. Unfortunately, yet again, I can't give you a temporary password because of the current uh, setup and the system setup situation that we have. And um, that's the only way I can help you with that. I hope that works out for you. No, that will that'll work out for me. I just, uh, you know, thanks for telling me that. I'm going to make sure that I use this per permanent password. And then I just want to make sure I can get on right now. Thanks for your help. Sure thing, sir. I, I just wanted to make sure that you can get on VPN as a, as a number one thing. Uh, so that way, you know, you can get back to work or do whatever you need to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, is there anything else I need to, you need help with? No, I'm okay. Thanks for your help. I appreciate it. Yeah, you have a nice day. All right. Thank you, sir. And you as well. Have a good one. Bye-bye. And there you have it, my friends. The only thing left to do here is show you footage from one of my videos on how to reset a password in Active Directory. Let me know if you like my puppeteering. I know you can probably see my mouse pointer moving the hands up and down. I hope this is something that people uh, might uh, find enjoyable. I uh, just 
kind of kind of a overview of what we've gone over. The number one thing to keep mind in our mind here is that if somebody is trying to connect to VPN, they need to have a working permanent password. If their password has expired, they obviously can't change it uh, when they are not connected to the VPN. Because remember, when you call help desk, you give them a temporary password, at which point they get a notification or forced to change it to a permanent password. That doesn't happen when you're trying to connect to the VPN. And if you're not on VPN, you're not going to be able to get that notification or that prompt at all. So you got to give them a permanent password. And if they decide to change it afterwards to something else, they can. So this is something you can mention as well. All right. Thank you so much for watching. And again, here is my video on how to change passwords and Active Directory. All right, let's go ahead and open up Active Directory. And within Active Directory on the left-hand side, you can see a folder that's called Users. If you select that, if you select Users, you can see that a bunch of different users and groups show up in there. So you can scroll down and look for that login or the person's name. However, the easiest way to look somebody up is if you right-click the Users folder and select Find. In here, you can type in the name of the user, and he said Irvin underscore C A N. So it's going to click find now. And here it is. We found the user. We can simply select it, double click it, and it should pull up user's account. So let's see what's going on with that. He said he can't log in. So the next thing we're going to look up is the password. So we're going to click on the account. If we suspect that user is locked in the account tab here, we can simply click on the check mark like this where it says unlock account select apply or okay and this will unlock the user's account now we can get back to them and let them know to try again well there you go my friends this is how you fully handle a help desk call in which you would unlock user accounts of course there are other things you can look at if you go to the account you can make some changes to it when it related to password if you want to change their password you can change it here if you select user must change password at the next logon is something what i would um, uh, highly recommend in a business environment so this is a part of security you want the user to have their own password so I highly suggest that you check user must change their password at the next login because after you change it, you give them a temporary password, they should be able to set their own. In order to change the password, we have to go back to the users folder and then find the user and then right click it and then select reset password. However, this is kind of counterpoint to what I said earlier that you know, if this is populated with thousands and thousands of users, it may not be easy to find. However, if you do right click on the users folder, select find, and do the thing I told you earlier is to type in Irvin CAN so we can find this user here. Since we found it already, we don't have to dig through the actor directory. A lot of people actually don't show this on their videos when they show how to reset the password. Is that now, since you already found it, you don't have to dig and kind of like, you know, your eyes are starting to dry out because you're trying to find this user, you can just find it here and then right click and reset password. And we're going to change the password to something temporarily. And then again, make sure this is checked. User must change the password at the next login. And then if their account is locked as well, you can check that as well. And then just click OK. And now it says the password for Irvin has been changed. All right, guys, I hope you find this video useful. Please share it with your friends. Let them know about me and ask them what they think. Are these videos useful to you? I think they are. I appreciate you watching. Have a good day. And don't forget to ask me any questions that you may have in the comments below. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye-bye.
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is all about tickets, tickets, tickets. Help desk tickets. We're going to work on some of the most common ones that come through the system. So if you're into help desk, by the end of this video, you will know how to work help desk pretty much. I mean, there are going to be some of the most common things that will come across. I promise you that. So it's going to be a longer video. This is why it's going to be a premiere video. So if you want to interact with me on the right side where the chat is, you can too. But if not, well, sorry to have missed you. But if you have comments or questions, feel free to leave them below as well. I'll gladly help you out with whatever you need. One thing to keep in mind, the way I teach IT is very particular, very proactive, and very easy to follow. This is what kind of separates me from other people, which is perfectly fine. People have different ways of teaching things, but the way I do it is in a very proactive way. Not only do I talk about on how to fix a computer problem, but also how to deal with the customer at the same time while you're doing so. So I hope you like that type of style. All right, that being said, please take one second to like this video. I really appreciate it, guys. Thank you so much, and let's get into this uh, awesome video. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you can see that there is a lot to do here. We have what looks to be 12 tickets that we're going to work in this entire session. So keep in mind, if you're watching this while it's premiering, while this video is premiering, I am in the chat box as well. So if you want to interact with me, ask me any questions while we are watching this video together, feel free to do so. I am available to answer any of the questions that you might have, or if you just want to say hi, that's perfectly fine too. I more than welcome that. I love to hear from you guys. Okay, so we have a lot of tickets, guys, and now we have to prioritize. Of course, we have to use common sense here, and we're going to go for the tickets that came in first. The way we can tell is by looking at the date and time, but we can also look at the uh, ticket number. So that being said, we're going to select this one, which is ISD 15. We're going to work that one first. Of course, if you see a ticket that says big system outage, make sure you prioritize that because it's affecting more people. It's more it's going to impact more people so you make sure you prioritize that otherwise you just work tickets in the uh, order received all right first ticket we have here it's called PDF files don't open of course make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it the title of this one says PDF PDF files do not open or don't open and in the description, it says, for some reason, PDF files do not work. So what do you guys think the issue is here? I'm going to allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer. But I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time, but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this. While you guys do that, I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Hello. My name is Irvin with, why I can't spell today, with help desk support. I have your ticket about PDF files not working. Can you please send me your computer name or IP address? So when I reply to this customer and I click save here, it's going to send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about. And the reason for that is because in this situation, we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue. Uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it, but it's preferable, if possible, for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it. If you have to, that's fine. Of course, this is going to depend on the company that you work for. You know, it depends on the, what the requirements are, but chances are if you're help desk, you're going to take control of their computer, take a look at the problem, and resolve it as quickly as possible. So for that to happen, 
for us to use remote desktop, we're going to need their computer name or IP address. Both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely. So in this case, PDF files do not work. So number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed. So, so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files. A lot of times that's the main thing. Or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files, but chances are this is what's happening. Second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing. You may have Adobe installed on the computer, but if if it's still not, or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens, that means we need to change the uh, file association. We're going to change that right now. Now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers, follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted. In this case, all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email. However, they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via, um, via you know, via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message. Uh, some, you know, most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply. Whatever their preferences are, make sure you, fo make sure you follow that to the T. Very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with. In this case, we send them an email, and once we get a reply, and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer, uh, let's say we do get a reply, and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them. Maybe the customer said that the PC name is C O B U M A N one. So what I'm going to do in that case, I'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file. So I'm going to say users PC name is Kobuman1. So I'm going to use that to access this Kobuman1 PC and then see what's going on. All right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed, which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up File Association, which is also known as Default Apps in Windows. Um, there is also a file association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down, and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension. So if we scroll down, it should be here. Here we go. O, and then we're coming. Uh, we're approaching P. So should be here shortly, PDF. There it is, PDF. We can now see that PDF, in this case, is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge. We simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go, problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser, which is fine too, you just ask them what they want. All right. All right, that ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note, changed file association. Sorry, guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly. But good thing we have that red underline thing. I can just right click, change file association to allow PDF to change file association to resolve PDF issues that's fine we know what we did so if anybody else looks at that whether it's your boss or you know somebody has to refer to it to that ticket and see what you did they'll know what you did so 
issue resolved we're going to close this ticket as such so yeah keep in mind follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to very important stay very professional when you're working tickets uh, for any company and always be polite all right moving on so we're going to work on this number 16 we worked 15 so we're going to work this one it says website is super slow and then in the description it says every website i open is super slow so what could that be guys tell me if you're watching this in a uh when it, if you're watching this while it's premiering see most of the time when we think of websites running slow we think of internet right we think of internet and yeah that's that's one of the most logical things we can you know consider as causing the problem which would be slow internet right but internet may not necessarily be slow maybe there's something going on on the computer that could be causing this again this is one of those things we can uh resolve in my opinion the best way to resolve it is to actually take a look at the system again so we're going to go in here again to say hello my name is Irvin we're contacting the customer again with tech support I can help you with slow website issue can you please provide PC name or IP address so that I can take a look we're going to do it like this guys so as I said the main thing to kind of consider as a website running slow and in this case every website is running slow it's not just a specific website so it's not an issue with just one website it's all websites yes internet could be running slow and that could be the main reason but there could be also something in the background that's taking up this uh, this uh, bandwidth for the internet or not just necessarily in internet because in this case user or customer might be considering internet as in every website that they access while a lot of websites might be internal so even even if it's just um even if they say that every website is is running slow that may not necessarily be the case so not, that's one thing that to that you might want to consider checking is that you could be just internal websites so let's say they have five different websites that are only for them for that business so that's the first thing i would check and ask as well uh, when I'm as, as a follow-up after I get their PSA name is it all website really or is it just the internal ones that you use most of the time because sometimes users don't know the difference between internet and intranet while the uh, intranet is uh, being you know the internal websites anyways there are other things that could be causing it so if it's just a local network that's causing the issue that's something to consider so let's again pretend that we got a same pc name cobbleman1 is user's pc name we got an internal note and the way you put these notes in it's going to be up to you as long as you make sure that everything you do is listed in there uh, professionally and and in in a in, in a descriptive manner so that when somebody looks at it they can tell exactly what you did I know I keep repeating myself on these things but it's very important guys so we're going to pretend that that's the that's the PC name uh, simply because I, I don't want to show everything on this main PC because this is your main PC that you're working with so in this case we're role-playing okay here we are at users computer again the same PC name that we're going to use so I, I made videos on this too before but yeah, make sure that you know check and, and you know double check to see which websites are slow. If it's an internal network, um, if, if it's internal websites, then there's an issue with your network. You may have to contact the network team. 
that's another issue but a lot of times it's just the updates that are coming down for some reason and it could be related to the fact that maybe user hasn't uh, turned hasn't uh, left the computer on or didn't or turned the computer off when it's not being in use so whenever they turn it on it tries to install all these updates and as you can see there is an update here waiting to happen and then of course you can also open up their task manager and just look at their performance see if there's anything taken up bandwidth and here we are just kind of looks like by default we have selected ethernet um, adapter and then we can see what kind of activity we have going on right now right now it looks to be you know just normal usage because I'm using RDP remote desktop so you will expect to see this type of usage but nothing crazy we know that this is not even one megabit per second speed so you know this seems normal and then you can test the websites see what's going on and to kind of go about it in that way look at the processes see if there's anything working in the background that's taking up a lot of CPU power they can also make it seem like the websites are running slow if the CPU utilization is really high that could be the problem if you see that look at what is causing the what is using the CPU bandwidth or CPU power in that case and then um, resolve that issue in in that manner but you know again internet is running slow check their bandwidth speed you can do a bandwidth test to see what's going on I don't want to do it right now because it will re reveal my current IP address but you can go to Google and just type in bandwidth test you can do a bandwidth test if that looks sketchy you can look into that there are many other things uh, that, that can cause this but the ones I've mentioned here are the main reason for this to happen so just kind of look at these things see if there is anything actually on the computer causing the problem if everything looks fine on the on the computer itself like this this is perfectly normal that could mean that there is some kind of a network issue in which case I would possibly uh, I would possibly route this ticket to tier 2 so that way they can reach out to the network people so network team they would reach out to the network team and say eh, you know there's something going on but the chances are you would have multiple users reporting the same issue that's you know but you can also look if you have a setup in the in, in the in the system for your company there might be a place or just like a web page that keeps track of critical issues that are happening right now you can check that page to see if there are any network issues this and that this is a really good start to get you going in the right direction to make sure that there's nothing going on with the computer first because that's your job your help desk tier one and maybe tier two but this is your job to make sure there's nothing going on on the PC that could be causing the problem and move on from there all right in this case we're going to role play and just assume that there are no issues there are no issues at the moment this also happens uh, you know a lot of times where somebody reports slowdowns with the websites but then if it if it was some kind of a background process like updates or you know something in the background that required extra bandwidth or even CPU bandwidth and uh, it may seem like you know website issue but it could by the time you get to it it might be just fine so yeah again I can't stress this enough check all these things first before you put a note down like this at the moment um, and then depending on your environment what I do which I'm allowed to do at my current employer I can say I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours to monitor so I'm allowed to do this um, at my level uh, some help desk places they don't want you to keep the tickets open at all in which case you may have to close the ticket right away so I'm going to leave this ticket open for the time being I'm going to change its status to waiting for support waiting for support well that's us we can't do that so I'm trying to think here you know what since I don't want to see uh, appropriate status here I'm just going to leave it and waiting for support 
the, the ticketing system I use at my work has something a lot more specific things that you can actually select. But since we're limited with this current ticketing system for demonstration, I'm going to leave it waiting for support and just kind of keep track of it. It's assigned to me. I'm going to keep track of it. That's what matters. So we're going to move on from this ticket here. Okay. Let's see here. The next one is ISD 17. It says my documents are missing. All right, let's have a look. And again, we're going to make sure that it's assigned to us. Very important. And uh, it says here, my documents are missing. I found that my documents are missing. Very simple. So this person or this reporter is saying that their documents are missing. We're going to have to figure out which documents are they talking about. So I'm going to reply to the customer. Again, follow the instructions given to you by the customer on how they prefer to be contacted. I'm going to say, hello, this is Irwin with PC support. I have your ticket about missing files. Can you please provide your PC name? So I actually done a video on this already and for that I'm going to actually cut into that so you guys can it, it, it's the same deal as this I just want to kind of use it because this is going to be a very long video as you guys already know so I'm going to use my previously made video that's literally dealing with this same issue so I'm going to just kind of plug it in there and then we're going to continue after that but for now I'm just going to leave it at this and I'm going to close the ticket but yeah, again, I'm going to show you the video of, of something that I've done exactly like this. So you guys can know how to deal with that. So I'm going to close it completed. And we're going to now concentrate on this second ticket. All right, let's click on this ticket. This ticket is called I am missing internet shortcuts folder. And then if you look in the descriptions, we can see that it says internet folder is missing from my desktop. So in this case, there is a folder or there was a folder on their desktop that you know it was with deleted or just simply gone who knows maybe it was moved somewhere that happens sometimes too user would just accidentally you know for example they would like if you look at over here they would drag it somewhere and it would go god knows where you know so typically you would say hey can you check your recycle bin go inside of your recycle bin and check if it's in there you know this and that and yeah definitely do all of that stuff but if it's not there and you know it's just one of those things that you may have a copy of, you know, let's say you can't find it and then but you can find a copy of, you can ask them, hey, does anybody else have a copy of it? Maybe I can copy it over because it's just Internet shortcuts. We can certainly do that. Again, we're going to have to uh, get some information from them before we can proceed further. But we're going to role play. And then first thing, of course, we're going to do assign our ticket, assign a ticket to ourselves. And then we're going to reply to customer. Hello, this is Irvin with US, or you can say tech support, doesn't matter. You know, let's, let's do tech support with tech support, or, you know, you can say help desk, you know, whatever your situation might be. Can you please provide your PC name so that I can restore your folder thank you thanks you <laughs> thanks Irvin. okay so now user has been asked or you can call them you can talk to them again we're going to go back to the user and we, you know we're going to get that pc name and in this case we're going to pretend that the same pc name is couple man so we're going to keep doing that the PC, let's do this, user's PC name is Cobleman1. All right. So kind of same thing. And I'll, I'll show you something else just in case this doesn't work. Uh, we can go back into his, uh, you know, desktop. And then we can just copy paste whatever it is that, that they need. So let's pretend that uh, actually, let's go ahead and just create a quick folder called, 
internet shortcuts or f and now we're just going to copy pasta onto his desktop okay now let's go to his computer now we're at his computer and we can say hey can you please check to see if the internet shortcuts is back and sure enough there it is i uh these are just the typical ones that i go for when it comes to resolving issues like this real quick whenever i'm working tickets whenever you know i work as a business system analyst but i do work on tickets especially nowadays now that we're working from home so they need more assistance so this is what i do mostly nowadays uh, simply because different times you know different times guys so now i'm just gonna finish our my ticket here you know made a copy of internet folder to desktop whatever you want to put in there as long as it's and detailed enough so that if somebody looks at it like your boss knows what you did and i'm going to resolve this and mark it complete okay now that we're done with that type of ticket let's move on to this 18 here it says I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle Database, installed. On my computer, I'm going to assign it to myself and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. All right. It says I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer. And same thing repeated in the description, and it's this guy named Mike Moser. All right, Mike, so you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third party software, and this guy is in this case Oracle Database is a third party software, no matter how you look at it, we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them. So what we're actually going to do, and preferably you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone. This is how I prefer it. You can do it any way you like. You can send an email, a reply to them. You can send them an instant message and see, uh, see if you can get more information. But what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install oracle database on their computer without permission so here's here are a couple of different things that could be happening here mike here mike moser he may already have a license to install oracle db and he already maybe has requested it over requested it through proper channels and maybe he just doesn't know how to install it and he already has all of this all of these permissions so we're going to ask him this we're going to start with this hello you guessed it my name is Irvin you're going to be doing this a lot except you're going to be using your own name of course <laughs> with PC support I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB do you have or let's just do this there are many ways of doing this did you request a license for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before i install this software i have to check to see if it's on approved software a list so if you send a message to him like this it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say hey i already have it i already have it i just need it installed 
meaning that I already have it approved. Of course, you have to check that real quick. And then sometimes you may have to install it manually. But also, he, Mike, might actually already have it installed. Might, might, might even have it installed already on his computer. In which case, he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as help desk uh, tier one would be able to do. But if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk, you should be able to configure software. In this case, Oracle database, uh, you may need like things like uh, database driver installed or something like that. And I'll show you that as soon as I, uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I, you know, kind of talk about this part of it. But when it comes to help desk tier one, you have to make sure number one, that it's approved and number two, that you install it for them in whatever that might be. You may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers and you may help them. You may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software. Subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name, and remember we use Kobuman1 as a computer name a lot, that it has that computer, Kobuman1, subscribe to Oracle DB. So what in, in, in that case, it should automatically install itself. But it also, what he might mean is actually configuration. So I have to check that. But if, when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one. Now, let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database. I'm just gonna, it's, it's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration, this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself. And it's done here under one of these. So let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver, it would be somewhere in here. And what happens is, is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here. You know, for example, in here, you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there. And then you configure it, whatever the system that you want. So you would just click add and then you would select which one you want to use. And then you go in through the configuration, set up the ports, IP addresses, uh, server names or whatever it needs to be. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it. It just depends on the level and the requirements for the company. Again, this is possibly help desk tier two, definitely desktop support. Uh, person would actually deal with this okay I'm gonna go back to that system all right but in this case we're gonna assume that he just wanted it installed so we went ahead and installed it I'm gonna add internal note install well let's do this let's do this subscribed PC to Oracle DB means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed. And then I'm going to do this installed software as requested. Okay. And now we're going to close the ticket as complete. All right. Easy peasy. Moving on to numero number 19. My computer is freezing twice a day. Oh, that's an interesting one. Okay. And my computer is freezing twice a day. So this kind of related to our, to our uh, websites are kind of running slow. Websites are running slow, excuse me, uh, ticket in the sense that chances are that this is just Windows updates causing the problem. So I believe I have a video on this. I will show you uh, kind of a clip from that on how to check for issues like this where the computer is causing problems. So I'm just going to plug that in in here. Uh, and uh, because it talks about the exact same thing, what you should uh, check in order to see why a computer is running slow and why it's happening in this case twice a day. So I'm gonna cut the clip into that, then we're going to continue with our ticket number 20. In the meantime, I'm just going to go ahead and close this ticket. But then again, don't worry, I'll show you how to do this and how to check on this.
ticket and how to resolve it. Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video, we take a look at a call handling for a help desk tier one, in which case user has a slow computer. I will show you the call handling and I will show you what I did to resolve the issue as well. Friends, if you have a one second, please click the like button. I really appreciate it this way. I'm not going to bother you with any ads at this point. I really appreciate that. It means a lot to me. Thank you so much. So let's get to it. I'm going to play the call and at certain times I will pause the call itself and show you what I'm doing on the backhand in order to help this user. This was going to be a fun video guys. Let's get into it right away. Thank you for calling Help Desk Tier 1 Support. Uh, my name is Irvin. How can I help you today? Hi, my computer is running really slow. Is there something you can help me with this? For some reason it's just so slow today that I can't do anything. No matter what I do, everything, everything is really slow. Sure thing. Uh, what, what's going on? When did you start having this issue? It started happening this morning. It was fine yesterday. And then today, for some reason, it's just very, very sluggish. I can't do anything. I really need this uh, to be fixed so I can do my job. All right, no problem. I can have a look uh, to see what's going on. Can you give me your PC name? My PC name? Uh... Yeah, it should be it should be under your PC information, or even there might be a sticker uh, on your computer or something like that. That it'll be either combinations of numbers or letters. If you can give me that, please, I'd appreciate it. Sure, I think I see it here. Um, it says T M C three five six five eight three zero. All right, thank you very much for that. Uh, sir, do you mind if I uh, take control over your computer just for a moment? I want to see what is going on and see if we can uh, uh, figure out what's causing this issue for you. Sure, go ahead. All right, let's pause the phone call just for a second here. So the user is talking about a slow computer. So it's a slow computer situation. So what is the major reason for a slow computer? In a business environment, most of the time when a computer is slow, it's because of an update. So let's get a look at the updates that we can look up here. And we're going to just type in updates and check for Windows updates. And sure enough, guys, we have some pending restarts for an update for a Windows 10 update. So what typically happens is that Windows tries to update or the computer itself tries to update overnight but for some reason it's not able to do so when the computer is not being used meaning that it tries to do this in after hours when the computer is not being used but chances are if the computer was turned off shut down asleep or any of those reasons it probably couldn't install these updates so now we got to get back to the user and let them know that this is what was the cause of this and explain to them what we can do to resolve this issue of course, if your company has a specific tool that pushes updates to your computer, you would also check that to see if anything failed because it's not just Windows updates that could be causing this, but updates for other software and chances are uh, there is a different way to control that within the company that you work for. You would, it would be company specific, so you have to check that as well. Other reasons for a slow computer is highly unlikely in a business environment. You know, for example, like not enough RAM, this and that that that's not usually what happens in a business that's something that home computers may have issues with for a business type of computer they're going to be up to spec and the main reason for it to be in slow is updates of course there is another reason you know being a virus but getting a virus in a business environment is so unlikely it's unbelievable so updates main thing let's get back to the customer and tell him about that all right sir so what i found is that uh, you were, your computer was trying to get updates, but it's not able to. So at this time, we need to reboot your computer so you can finish uh, Windows updates. This typically happens whenever uh, your computer is either asleep and it can't get a chance to get its updates overnight. Usually, computers get updates overnight when people are not working during, um, you know, after hours where you know it's not a you know peak business hours or anything like that. So, but sometimes when the computer is asleep or turned off or if it's shut down, uh, it may not be able to get its updates. So what we got to do is just kind of wait for it to finish its updates. And I have a feeling once we reboot it should be done it'll probably be much faster but yeah that's what usually happens and uh, that should resolve your issue so go ahead and reboot and if that uh, 
If that doesn't work, then uh, we can help you further. See if that works. All right, I'll give it a shot. Um, all right, I'll go ahead and reboot now and then see what happens. All right, great. Thank you so much for doing that. I appreciate that. Okay, looks like I'm uh, looks like I can log in now. All right, great. Go ahead and log in and we'll see how it goes. Now keep in mind we just rebooted the computer, so it may be a little bit slow in the beginning. But it should be fine afterwards. Uh, you know, usually when we're rebooting the computer, it kind of clears the memory. So in that case, it may take a little bit just to log in, but afterwards it should be fine. Okay. All right, I'm logged in. Great. All right, let's see. See if see if uh, see if it's running any better for you here. All right, I'm checking. All right, so far so good. Tell you what, it's definitely faster than it was uh, this morning. I don't... Okay, yeah, it, it, it seems to be fine now, so... Uh, let me see if I can pull up my email and a uh, couple other systems that I use just to make sure before I let you go. Sure thing, no problem, sir. Take your time here. Okay, okay. I I think I'm good now. Thank you so much. It, it's... Uh, I appreciate your help on this. Hey, no problem, sir. Again, you know, sometimes this just happens whenever computers shut down. Uh, the best thing, the best advice I can give you uh, is that whenever you're at the end of the day, whenever you're done using the computer, just go ahead and like reboot it or sign off. Because sometimes the computer won't even update properly, even if you're signed into the computer for some reason. But the best thing to do is just to reboot the computer. And uh, that, you know, that should... Uh, kind of a, be a, a proactive thing we can do here to kind of prevent this type of thing from happening. All right, will do. Thank you so much. I appreciate your help. All right, no problem. Have a good day. Thank you for calling uh, Tech Support. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it, guys. That's how you handle this type of call. I hope you find this very useful. This is a real-world example, guys, so I hope you really do find this useful because this is exactly what's going to happen whenever you do start doing your help desk tier one tech support. All right, guys, so let's take a, a, a brief break. This is a good opportunity uh, for us to take a, uh, I suppose, couple of minute break if you guys uh, want to, you know, run somewhere real quick and come back uh, if you're watching this as a premiere along with me. And uh, I hope you guys are liking this stuff so far. I believe it's very valuable because I'm showing you real life stuff that actually happens. I, uh, I've i said this before and I know you guys that, that are watching me uh, on a regular know that I normally work as a business systems analyst. and But right now, in this current situation we're in, working from home, I'm mostly doing tier, tier 1, tier 2, and tier 3 or whatever <laughs> help desk. But tech support in general for whoever might need issues. So this is a real world experience. And um, if you like it, please click the like button and, and share this video with your friends if you have time. If you don't have time, for me, if you just click the like button is also very, very, uh, uh, very helpful. And I really appreciate that so much. What do you guys think so far? If, you, if you're watching this in a premiere uh, during the premiere of the video, please uh, say, you know, please, you don't have to, but if, if you want to say something in the chat, I more than welcome it. Otherwise, feel free to leave me a comment uh, in the comment sections um, below. And uh, if you check out my channel, there's going to be a lot more stuff, not just how to teach you, not just teaching you the help desk uh, job, but also how to get these type of jobs. They could be help desk, desktop support, system administration, network administration, uh, project management. Uh, I, I, there's so much. I think I have almost like 400 videos and they're all longer format, similar to this. I do have hardware videos if you're into computer hardware and stuff like that. I do have those. Um, they're pretty popular as well. Okay, that's it for our break. Let's go ahead and continue and uh, just kind of power through these tickets, guys. We got to make sure we work these tickets. All right, moving on to uh, ISD20. 
And this one says here, I close my documents without saving. Oh boy. You love to see these type of tickets because there is there is not a whole lot you can do with this. The problem is you guys know this. If you haven't saved something, it chances are it's gone. There are a few exceptions. Some programs automatically create a save file and it creates a copy of it, in which case you would go through and 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 um, see if you can recover it like that. Another thing is, and these are things we have to think about before we even before we even reach out to Mike, you know, before we even reach out to this user. We have to think like this, proactively think, very proactively, because we're going to have to try to see if we can recover any of its, any of this stuff. The biggest issue here is, and we're going to have to confirm this, is that they close the document without saving. And if there is no automatic save feature in that program, there's nothing we can do. However, sometimes people will actually do the opposite. They would save the document and overwrite what's in there already. So I guess what I'm trying to say is maybe there is a backup of that same file somewhere that they can look at and compare and see which one is more valuable to them. Because this is a really awkward situation. you got to be very careful with this. So we're going to reply to customer because in reality, there's really not a whole lot we can do to help this customer, unfortunately. Hello, my name is Irvin with Help Desk. Let's do tier one like this. And you guys can do um, whatever you like, you know, as long as it's appropriate. I have your ticket about closing a document document without saving it did you happen to save it somewhere else or or did you just close the window see this is you you can't I'm gonna put a smiley face there because chances are we're gonna to have to tell him here that, that we can't help him so sometimes it's okay to use these emoticons to kind of let prepare prepare the user that once you give them the bad news is that it's not your fault per se. So I'm going to send this. It would be different if they just delete an entire document, which, you know, we, we touched on previously. And that there will be places where you can, you know, restore it, whether it's just from Windows Restore Point. Because what happens is when you create a Windows Restore Point on a computer, it also creates copies. And if you set it up to do it regularly, it'll create copies and backups of every file that you've uh, created and edited at some point. So you can go back and pick an older one and, you know, this and that. But in this case, they literally just close the window as far as we can tell. So when they come back and say, yes, I closed it without saving my work that I typed in all day, then we, we may have to say, unfortunately, we don't sorry about that guys. Unfortunately, we don't have a way to recover that file once you close the window like that it is gone 
forever. Not smiley face. So, and to make them feel better, you can say, however, I can take a look at your PC to see if I can find a time-based backup. Saved backup. But I am not 100% sure there is something there. So you got to give him something. You can word it any way you want. Just make sure you're very understanding and polite about this because chances are, again, that, that there's nothing you can do about this. So do all you can to help them out. See if you can find it. And if not, then, you know, it's just tough luck. You know, what can you say? Don't, don't tell this to the customer. Just be polite, but do the best you can and, to, to you know to help them out that's all you can do in this take it and then once once you do it you just close it I mean this is one of those situations you will come across that that happen that simply happen you know part of working help desk is to actually be in these awkward situations occasionally not all the time but occasionally all right guys let's move on number 21 here is the Number 21, computer shuts down multiple times a day. Now, I'm going to have to refer this one to uh, being related to either, well, okay, l let me ask you guys, what do you guys think this might be? To give you a little moment to, or, you know, to give some people a chance to actually answer this if you're watching this as a premiere video. Uh, while you guys give me a reply, I'm going to assign it to myself and I'm going to reply to customer and I'm going to ask them, hello, well, I'm going to say who I am first, with PC support, when your computer shuts down does it give you any error or does screen simply go dark or 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 nothing happens you know what let's leave this this is way more descriptive and it's to a point so all right, um, going to have to refer you to uh, my video here, or part of the video where I talked about updates, because this can happen when if it's just a regular update. You get an update and it wants to reboot multiple times. This happens usually when computer's been turned off overnight and now it's getting updates. That's number one reason. Number two reason, bad hardware. If they come back and say, it, it just goes dark. You know, screen goes black, nothing happens. It's just, it shuts down multiple times. Then chances are that this is hardware issue. In this case, we would have to say this. Um, it sounds like it could be a hardware issue. Uh, we will need to perform a let's, let's be very descriptive hardware diagnostic on this computer so we're going to have to say this and we're going to have to run hardware diagnostic there are different ways of doing this on for example some computers I want to say HP's maybe some Dell's when you reboot the computer and when you hear the boop, the boop, <laughs> the beep, when it's posting, you can press, for example, I don't know, F8, F9, F11. I forget exactly which key it is, 
but it gives you to kind of a boot menu, but also gives you an ability to perform hardware diagnostic. In this case, if the computer just shuts down like this randomly, no warning, nothing, it just goes dark, it's a hardware issue. To me, there is no doubt about that. There is nothing else that it could be. But it could be overheating, so the computer could be just dust, dusty inside, dirty, maybe uh, what's his face needs to be uh, changed like the the uh, heat sink and um, the fan maybe they need to be taken off cleaned out the thermal paste that connects to the CPU needs to be changed and uh, yeah stuff like that when it comes to heat the second thing is that happens mostly and causes this shutdown is hard drive hard drive simply starts going bad and it just shuts, randomly shuts down. So it's either either one of those things at random. So I guess what I'm trying to get at is that you have to do some kind of a hardware diagnostic. And then that's going to depend on what kind of tools you have available to you as help desk. There might be something else you have to do when it comes to resolving this issue. These This user may have to actually take their computer to a designated office or place where they would physically bring their laptop to if this is a person that is working from home for example if they're not if they work in an office environment their local IT support um, their local IP support I, 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 IT not IP uh, information technology support or tech support will have to do a diagnostic and figure out what is going on with their hardware Every office will have one of these guys, maybe not there, but maybe a guy that travels between locations that will deal with this. Chances are if it's hardware, if, it, if their computer is under warranty, maybe even a technician from, for example, HP or Dell would uh, check on this and see what's going on when it comes to possible hardware issues. So that's how I would go about it. There's really nothing for me to show you here uh, because you would literally just do a diagnostic. For example, you open up a menu and you select test hardware. If it's one of those type of diagnostic software or if it's pre-boot software or you can specifically tell it test hard drive, test RAM, test motherboard. It's as simple as that. And it will tell you that there are issues with that. And you can also look at device manager and look at um, at there. This is what you could also do. I'm sorry, I'll have to actually tell you what to do. I'm going to go to the computer and um, and let's let's do this here. Let's do this here because I don't want to leave this one just without actually showing you something and not just you know I don't want to just explain it. I'm going to say this users PC name is Cobbleman one. All right, let's go to it. All right, here we are at Cobbleman One. We're going to go to the device manager. I'm sorry, we're going to go to event viewer. Uh, we can also do this in the event viewer. What we're actually looking for is Windows logs, Windows system logs, and we're going to look for errors that come up. And these are typical errors that show up when there's a hard drive going bad. So we're going to just, I'm going to find something here that kind of looks similar to it. I forget, I forget the exact, um, when, uh, the event ID, but it will be blatantly obvious to you when it comes up. See, this computer doesn't have any errors as far as I can tell. See, it will be related to something like this. You see, it says NTFS file system is healthy, no action is needed when there is something wrong there would be a red icon here that tells you that there are some issues going on here you can also go to a reliability monitor I talked about that in my previous video see here are some warnings here something like this but it will be red there it is errors here we go there are always errors guys see these are all talking about different things uh, some most of these are actually a normal but what you're looking for is a source as in and then look at the source here and then look at the file system 
Anyways, this is stuff you would be looking for specifically when it comes to file issues. See, this one doesn't have that. Um, obviously, there's nothing wrong with this PC when it comes to NTFS file system. But when it comes to source, this is what you would kind of look for and see if there are any errors coming up like that. And they'll be very descriptive, just like the, the one I showed you earlier here where it talks about NTFS file system. It would say there is an issue with, you know, some kind of NTFS uh, file system issue so it's very it's going to be very apparent and then in the description you can see just like every time you click on something here you can see the description of what's going on here so this is what you're going to have to look for and there'll be a lot of them if trust me if there are if there's an issue with hard drive there's going to be a lot of them here and then you can just go to a reliability monitor reliability monitor Eh, it's being stupid. Control panel. Reliability monitor is inside of. Where is our? I think it's security maintenance. And where is it? Security network. Man, I recently did. I'm getting tired, guys. This video is getting long. <laughs> I'm getting tired. I think it's probably been an hour. Maintenance. It's here somewhere. Reliability monitor. Here we go. Security and maintenance. View of reliability history. There it is. Reliability monitor. So I was in the right place. I just didn't see this reliability mon uh, button. And you may have seen like, stuff like this. You see this hardware error right here, actually. You see that? There's a red X. And that's how it's going to look and the uh, event viewer as well hardware error let's see what this one talks about see there is an error and it's going to be something similar to this anyways guys i don't want to de beat the dead horse as they say on this on this issue so what we're going to do is simply um, run the diagnostic or have somebody else at local level to actually do the hardware diagnostic so i'm going to add internal note here and i'm going to say a routed issue to local PC support to trouble shoot hardware issues <clears throat> save and I would route it from here but I don't see that option in this system, unfortunately. Anyways, I would rather to take it to, to the other uh, support people to troubleshoot it. So in this case, I'm just going to close it as completed so it, so it leaves the system. But yeah, make sure you route it to the proper people. All right, so what's next? ISD22, I believe, is the next one. And it says USB drive not working. Let's have a look. <clears throat> Okay, we're going to assign it to ourselves, of course. It says USB drive not working, and it says nothing happens with the USB stick inserted. And um, the way we're going to handle this is going to be based off whether uh, the business that uh, customer is working for allows for external media to be plugged in uh, whether it's headsets or USB drives or any type of external storage so that's going to be a factor here um, most likely so what do you guys think the issue is here it says nothing happens when USB stick is when USB stick is inserted so what do you think might be the case I mean Maybe the USB drive is not working, but there might be something else. What do you guys think? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a uh, it's another one that we may have to handle in a particular way, uh, depending on the situation that we're actually dealing with. We know that it's a USB drive, and that they're trying to insert it into the computer, and nothing happens. So here's what's going on. Either the USB drive is not working, simply it's broken, or 
USB drive needs a driver which is kind of unlikely because most of the USB drives uh, that I've encountered it's simple plug and play you guys seen this you plug it in computer says wait while we configure your drive and then it configures it and then it asks you what do you want to do now with this drive how do you want it to open and then you can tell it okay just open it up as a folder or something like that or a third thing where the company uh, or a company that this user works for simply does not allow any external media to be plugged into USBs meaning that the USB port is disabled so it could be one of those things and uh, if that's the case there is nothing we can do about it we can inform the customer that their company doesn't allow for USB sticks to be used but the way I would say it first I would uh, if, if it's a case this is this is assuming that this is the case that it's not allowed for this company uh, for for company um, or if it's not allowed by the company to use USB uh, ports this is what I would say hello my name is Irvin with tech support unfortunately our company has USB ports disabled as part of company company security policy which is perfectly fine we can say that uh, but you know I have to assume that there are situations in which it is allowed let's say this is somebody high somebody high up for example this is some kind of manager or director level and for some reason it's okay for them to uh, have or to have access to USB ports and use anything that they want then that will be different you know but in most large companies it's set up to detect whether it's a USB port or uh, I should say whether it's not USB port but whether it's a USB drive versus a USB headset or something like that and in, in which case it would know you plug in a headset and it would just work but still, once you plug in a USB drive, it would not work. So that's certainly possible. But sometimes you would also get a warning once you plug in a USB drive. It says, hey, just so you know, we you can use a USB drive, but we're going to scan everything that's on it. And once you plug it in, it starts to scan that's everything that's on it, which is, which is fair. You know, you're using a company's computer and then you plug it in a USB drive. So that's simply that's what's going to happen but in this case we're going to say this to um, our user and we're going to say if you need further assistance please let me know which I don't necessarily like to leave it open-ended like this because I'm going to close the ticket but if we're trying to be nice about it and kind of trying to let it let them down easy because it's not our fault we already told them we you know it port is disabled as part of security policy I wouldn't necessarily leave this open-ended like this because that implies that you possibly could help them if they say well can you enable it for me uh, but we're going to say this but when it comes to USB ports, this is something controlled by security team. We want to put it on them because they're, they're the ones um, that, that are uh, placing these restrictions on the USB ports. We can assume again that they're okay, and then we can go inside of their computer. You know, the typical thing we've been doing so far, you know, asking what their computer name is, and then we go inside of their computer, 
like so you can go to this PC and see what's what's inside of it what's plugged in and what's not so and then if if there is no USB drive visually that comes up we can go to our device manager let's see right click the desktop uh, the uh, Windows icon go to device manager then we're gonna we can check for USB storage we can see there is an unknown USB device there so and this could be what you know customer is talking about this is could this could be what user is talking about nothing happens when they plug it in and we can see that when it comes to visually seeing uh, what's going on we can see that there is indeed nothing happens but inside of the system inside of the system we can see that there is an issue windows has stopped this device because it has reported uh, a problem and it's a code 43 now I know exactly what the problem is here and we can certainly fix it As a matter of fact I'm going to fix it as I am talking to you right now um, this is actually on my next computer so what I'm going to do is actually a plug in and I want you to pay attention to what happens here I'm going to plug in because the USB thing stick that's actually plugged in over there is one of those that allows you to use different kinds of uh, storage uh, SD cards or s storage devices so you can put in like a SD card of certain size like a micro SD or whatnot so I'm gonna take one of those and plug it in over here as I am talking and I hope you guys can hear me and I'm going to plug it in hopefully And I should something should be happening right now and there it is you see how it switched over I actually plugged in a storage device into this USB stick and um, now it came up as you can see here as a USB drive right there so yeah I mean you basically go through the troubleshooting and if I had to yeah I could have just gone in and just like updated this you know the uh, whatever it needs to be updated the the uh, device um, uh, driver if needed be and you know just go basic to the basic troubleshooting of fixing the USB but chances are really high that it's simply disabled by the computer by the computer's uh, local security policy by the company's policy so keep that in mind all right so as you can see guys I am actually trying my best to uh, recreate the problem as much as I can it's not easy uh, because I have to literally recreate the problem for each thing that we talk about here but it's my pleasure this is I, I really want to make sure that you guys can learn as much as possible when it comes to dealing these actual issues that happen all right so I'm going to add internal note and I'm gonna say notified I'm going to say notified user of company security policy in regards in regards to USB ports they are disabled by default we're going to say that it's not by default on the computer but by default when it comes to security policy for this company and I'm gonna close it like that and of course if you just ended up fixing the USB drive then that's what you're gonna to have to do whether it's fixing it to show up like that or whether you need to go inside of the uh, disk management and create a partition on it format it to fat 32 this and that you guys know how to do this that's one of those things that uh, uh, should be self-explanatory but the biggest issue here is whether it's allowed uh, to use a USB external storage because when you think about it guys imagine if you worked for some company and there's some sensitive data on the computer and you take your own personal USB stick you plug it in and you just copy everything over of course it's going to be um, a big no-no okay moving on <clears throat> we got four more to work Remember, this one in the middle here is something that we're waiting on uh, when it comes to uh, to see what's going on. 
And the next one is ISD23. I'm going to click on this here. It says, I can't hear people on my headset. And it says here specifically, people can hear me in meetings, but I can't hear them. So this is issue not with the microphone, but with their speaker on their headset specifically. So again, typical thing that, we're, that we kept doing, that we are doing so far. This is Irvin with help desk. I can help you with headset issue. May I take control of your computer to fix it or to resolve the issue or whatever you want to, um, however you want to say it. If so, please send me your PC name or IP address. Now, something, something that I haven't mentioned before, customer may need help with finding what their PC name is or IP address. Uh, I'm going to mention that real quickly here as I go and uh, as we go into the computer, into user's computer and check the settings for their headset. But we're going to do this, users. PC name is Kobuman1. We're going to stick to that. Okay, so here we are inside of the user's computer. We know that he can't hear them. They can hear him. So it's not a mic issue. It's just a speaker issue. So it's very simple. You go in here and if you click on the icon here, of the audio icon next to the clock you can simply make sure that it, that it is selected in this case we can see that speakers is selected plantronics 610 which is good if we right click it we can go to sound settings inside of sound settings we have to make sure that the output is selected as speakers plantronics 610 uh, six, in this case six uh, c610 i'm sorry and then that the input is indeed selected for the same headset. We can definitely double check that with the user to see if that's the correct one because they may have multiple things. What I like to do is go to actual sound control panel, which is right here. Open it here. Make sure there's nothing else installed. The way I check that is by right clicking in the blank space and click show disabled devices. There are no other devices on this computer enabled, so that's good. If there are, uh, consider right clicking and disabling it like this so that way it doesn't conflict with the other one but of course make sure that the headset is enabled like this make sure that the microphone is enabled you see how there is another thing here we can ignore that because it's disabled check the microphone levels just to be sure if that's if everything else checks out here and you obviously saw that something else was selected as the output which is the speakers then you switch it to the headset and then it should work fine if still not working you may have to go inside of the app that they're using for uh, for their uh, for uh, for their meetings so whether it's zoom meeting webex meeting google meeting or skype or whatever it is go inside of that and check to make sure that the proper audio equipment is selected in this case plantronic c160 so whatever their headset is, we're going to make sure that that's selected for input and output, microphone and speakers. Very, very self-explanatory. If you want to see a more detailed with an example, with a different example of actual software going inside a software and changing it. Recently, I made one about Zoom and I have one about WebEx as well. If you want to check that out, I do have that on my channel, but I don't want to go into that too much. In this part of it because we are just working on the ticketing systems so what we're going to do here we're going to add internal note and say I have configured 
the headset and test it. Make sure it's tested before you let the customer go. That's it. This is a very simple one, but very common one. We're going to close the ticket. Okay. Very simple one. Oldie but goodie. Oh, that doesn't make sense. I don't know why I said that. Anyways. <laughs> All right. Here we go. Uh, ISD 24. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Uh-oh. We all know what that means. <laughs> we all know what that means. Let me know if you know what that means. I know what that means. <laughs> so, here we go. My computer shuts down with blue screen. Computer stops working randomly and shows me a blue screen with a smiley face. Blue screen with a smiley face. Let's see what that is, guys. Blue screen with smiley face. I'm just stalling here to give you guys... <laughs> uh, with with sad, smiley face, sad face, I guess. I'm stalling to give you guys a chance to tell me in the comments if you're watching this as a premiere, what the, what the issue is. So, all right, we're just gonna play. This is what it looks like. This is what it looks like, guys. This is a blue screen of death. Blue screen of death. So. We're going to go back and we're just going to make sure uh, we're going to talk to the customer. What I would do is actually try to reach out to them um, kind of more uh, more personally in the sense that I would, well, would either probably call them and, and uh, talk to them and to make sure that it is indeed a blue screen of death. And I'm going to add internal note. I'm going to say talked to user and to confirm that the issue is blue screen of death and then i'm going to recommend to user to recommend it to user sorry guys i'm getting tired <laughs> so i'm misspelling quite a bit to user to take computer for hardware diagnostic um, to her local PC support. So again similar to what we had earlier where computer just shuts down randomly nothing happens and where we talked about sending user to local pc support that will check on their on their hardware they're going to do hardware diagnostic because that's what it is a blue screen of death i found that 90 percent of the time is hardware related and a lot of times it's ram or hard drive it, it can be other things as well but it nonetheless it's hardware we're going to want to test the hardware as help desk we really can't do a really good job when it comes to you know handling this type of stuff because help desk is just like go 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 let's resolve these issues you know as quickly as possible if we can't resolve it um quickly and in this case we don't we can't necessarily test your hardware properly unless we have specific tools given to us uh, there's nothing else we can do but to tell them that uh, somebody at their local office will have to take it. Their, her local PC support is going to have to handle it. Or if the computer is under warranty, uh, their technician, HP technician, Dell technician, Lenovo technician will have to test it. She may have to take it to their store or whatever it is. It depends on how it is set up for the business that you're working for. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. And then... I'm going to say routed ticket to local PC support. May not be the case. Maybe it, you know, if, if, if we've referred her to the vendor, 
then we we want to specify that whatever the case might whatever the case might be it's definitely um, hardware issue and we need to do a hardware diagnostic on it okay moving on I'm going to close this ticket <clears throat> and go back we got a couple of more to do next one is my email is not working by mr. Mike Moser again Oh, okay this is an interesting one you will get this quite a bit and um, if you guys want to guess I'll pause briefly by talking about it and you guys can get a chance to actually guess what the issue might be this is the pop-up the user gets but but first uh, emails not working I gotta assign it assign it to myself so I can get credit for it so that way I can get paid when my boss look at looks at the statistics how many tickets I've done so it is my email is not working and then it says Outlook is asking for my login and password why do you why do you guys think that happens if you're watching this in my premiere video why do you think this happens so they open up Outlook and the first thing they see is this you know they see this pop-up this is what happens and it looks to be I'm trying to open it here in a bigger there it is and it looks to be asking for their login ID and password right and it talks about credentials here so that's what we're going to kind of concentrate on because chances are what happened is and we're going to ask the customer this hello my name is Irvin with PC support and by you know chances are uh, the Mike Mike Moser here uh, already knows us he knows who we are so maybe we don't have to introduce ourselves in this case but you know if you don't know him keep doing it it's part of the job I have your sorry guys ticket about email not working did you by chance change your password recently so guys this is exactly what I'm suspecting here is that either his his password Mike's password expired and he changed it while he was already inside the Windows some companies provide a provide you with a a way to reset your password especially if it's a single sign-on meaning that company can have a single sign-on credentials set up for every system that they use which can for which you can change the password on just a website like one of the websites will use that single sign-on that single sign-on is going to be your domain login or your computer login so when you go to a website that requires that single sign-on also known as SSO it's going to ask for your domain login if your domain login's password expired that day it's going to ask you to change that password when you change your password on the website your computer is not going to reflect that password necessarily right away what do I mean by that your computers that you're logged in you're still logged in with your old password so what you have to do is actually do a Windows L and lock the computer and then type in your new password before you open up other programs if you don't you get this pop-up this is what happens and maybe also maybe he locked himself out out of the computer so we're going to concentrate on that and with the reply I suspect it's going to be 99% chance that this is the issue what we're going to do is actually go in and reset their password just to kind of get it going for them in case they forgot the password because maybe they forgot the password typed it in 10 times and then now they're locked out and their outlook doesn't have their current password you know but this mostly happens when they change the password and they don't know their new password or it hasn't again replicated on their local computer the websites that use the password are fine but the system itself hasn't received the new password and that's the issue here most likely so we're going to go inside of Active Directory 
and this is my virtual server here and I'm just gonna log in real quick here I'm gonna open up Active Directory Windows admin tools and Active Directory users and computers the company you work for doing help desk may have a web just like a website or a tool that basically what it allows you to do is the same thing as I'm doing right now it may not give you direct access to Active Directory at all which is normal which is unfortunate but it's normal so you may have different means but you are basically doing exactly what I'm doing and that is changing their password and unlocking their account just in case so what I like to do is you see the uh, users folder on the right hand so instead of searching through here to see where Mike Moser is and uh, I know I can see him there but th this could be populated with thousands of users we don't know so what I'm going to do is right click the folder I'm gonna click find and then in, in search here I'm gonna type in Mike Moser we can also ask him for his login ID what he uses to log into the computer and here he is we found them right away we don't have to search through thousands of different names we found them right away we're going to right click him right click him and then we're going to click reset password so we're going to change the password we're going to give him a new password what I like to do is give him a simple password like what is today Tuesday one two three four five six again Tuesday one two three four five six this is a going to be a temporary password this is why it's so simple I want to give a user a simple password to change because he's gonna change it right away and you can see here that there's a check mark already it says user must change the password at next login the user must log off and then log on again for a change to take effect so they're gonna change it as soon as I tell them okay your new password is Tuesday one two three four five six with capital T they're gonna be forced to change it right away and hopefully to something way more secure uh, but this is what I like to do uh, it's up to you some places don't allow this to according to the group policy but this is what I do typically um, if my company requires me to do something else or disables my ability to change this then, then I'm gonna use that but this is what I like to do as, as it is and I'm going to do a check mark here where it says unlock the user's account so in case he is locked out it's going to unlock him I'm going to click OK it says the password has been changed for Mike Moser and I'm going to tell Mike hello Mike I have changed your password go ahead and type it in again or what I would actually say go ahead and lock your computer like this lock your computer Mike and then do control alt delete and then type in your new password and then it's gonna force him to change the password at that point and that should be good enough and should fix that issue with the uh, whatchamacallit with Outlook he should no longer get this Outlook pop-up at all because now Outlook since it's part of Windows operating system once you install it, once you have it installed it becomes part of Windows operating system it will detect the new password and even if it doesn't even if it comes up again he'll know what the new password is and he can just type it in and you can guide him through this what I also like to do is tell him to go ahead and reboot the computer afterwards that way it's going to ensure that everything in the background running whether he has email open in the background or any other Microsoft products including office if you May, keep in mind Outlook is part of Office so if you have anything else running you may have to close all of it in order to, for it to take effect so I tell them just reboot the computer it's gonna flush everything you know and that's the simple way of dealing with this and I'm going to add external node here and say resolve issue by password reset I'm gonna keep it simple like this and this will resolve this issue I guarantee it I'm going to close the ticket as completed 
All right. Excellent. <clears throat> By the way, if you're still with me, thank you so much. I appreciate you guys so much. One more ticket, guys. It's this one here. It says, I need help installing a printer. Very common one. Very good one. We're going to work on this one. I need help installing printer. <laughs> Sorry, guys. I'm changing a little bit here because I'm getting a little tired. Uh, but we're going to, you know, I'm, I'm going to fight through. We're almost, almost done here. I'm trying to install a printer, but it's not working. We're going to reply to the customer. I say, hello. My name is Irvin with help desk. What kind of printer are you trying to add? Local printer or network printer? Now this can be confusing to, to the user, to the customer. Because what I'm actually trying to figure out is actually, are they at home? Are they working from home? Are they trying to add, add a local printer? Or are they trying to add a network printer, which is actually in an, in an office? But to them, network printer could also be a local printer. Sometimes they don't know, you know, but that's okay. We're trying to find more information about it and see what's going on. But we can also say also, can you please send me your PC name? with and you know what let's 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 hold off on this part of it because what they reply here next is going to be very crucial so if they first reply and say and usually I, I like to be more proactive but I don't want to be I don't want it to be too much for the user because sometimes users can't and this is not their fault is this is just how human mind works they can't multitask if I'm asking you too many things at once, it may be confusing. So I'm going to wait for them to reply to this. And they may say, well, it's my local printer at home. Or it's printer at the office. Scenario number one, local printer. Question number two, are you allowed to install a printer, local printer for somebody that works from home? This is another security issue. This has to be approved and allowed by your company. You should know this, or if you don't, ask a coworker, ask your manager whether they're allowed, whether you are allowed to install local printer for them. And I'll show you how you can do that. If it's a network printer, then that should be a no problem. You know, they, some people are not allowed to print either, depending who they are. But chances are they are allowed to print on a network printer because it's at the office. You know, there's a... If there, there are recycle bins there that are security recycle bins. Chances are that will recycle sensitive material and all that stuff. Companies don't really like to actually have printers around uh, because of security issues. So we got to be careful about this. We got to find this out. Um, if possible, I would call them and talk to them. Uh, if not, I would find a faster way of actually asking multiple questions like over IM and not necessarily over email. I would not handle this over email because there are more things that uh, we, we need to find out. But in this case, let's pretend that they want to add a network printer and then we're going to say after they after we get their reply, say, okay, in that case, can you... Please send me the IP address of the printer you're trying to add. Let's do this. I can add the printer for you. However, I need your PC name to take control remotely. So you got to word this 
the best way you can because we you know we're doing multiple things here and we're trying to get multiple pieces of information from them and we're going to do this so let's kind of go over it again okay i can add the printer for you however i need your pc name to take control of control remotely and can you please send me the ip address of the printer you're trying to add so of your pc remotely so we need to know their pc name and i didn't want to say can you send me your pc name or ip address because i'm already asking for ip address for their printer and i don't want there to be any confusion on the customer's part i want them to give me pc name and the ip addresses of the printer ip address of the printer trying to add you see what i'm saying keep it as simple as possible but trying to get as much information as you can as quickly as possible in a easy to understand manner once we get this information we're going to go to their computer and here we are at their computer again uh, we're again assuming that we're using the same computer name that we used throughout this whole lesson and the way you would check to see what kind of printers they have installed we're going to go to the search bar and you can, you can get to this through the control panel as well but i'm going to say devices and printers here we go printers and scanners devices and printers we want to get to here guys this is this is where you can see device number and i'll show you a different version of it which is was the typical one but this is the what i call mickey mouse version of windows 10 that shows you more a large letter font type of thing where it simply shows you if there are any printers installed already and they would all be here all right and then if it's not here which we don't see one we can simply click add a new one so now it's looking for what it's doing is searching for printers and scanners locally and on the network and if it doesn't find one, we can simply click here, the printer I uh, here I'm looking for, the, pl the printer that I want isn't listed. Other way of going to this here is control panel, devices and printers here. And we can see right away that it looks totally different than what we were looking at before. This is actually showing us the whole thing that's on here. It's showing us the whole thing that's connected to the computer devices and printers so every device you know whether it's a usb or or whatnot or monitor or you know the headset that we talked about earlier and of course if there are any printers they will be listed here but of course there is a button guess where we need to go we're going to click on the add printer and this is the same thing we looked at earlier but this is just how it looks like that's how it used to look like before before Windows 10 Mickey Mouse looking stuff you know and uh, <laughs> they, they try to make everything look so pretty and that just created multiple places for the same thing which doesn't make sense to me why not just keep it the way it is where it's just one place for one thing you know anyways that's a different video okay so it's not gonna find anything what I'm gonna do is click uh, the printer that I want isn't listed so same thing we did earlier and then here you can add the printer multiple ways where it's a bluetooth wireless local printer blah 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 select anything that you want but in this case we're going to select a network printer which is going to be added using tcp ip address or host name or an ip address that we got from the customer and here we're just going to type it in for example 168.2.1 whatever it's whatever the static ip address is for that printer it's going to have to be a static ip address because you know it's a printer it doesn't we got to have a static ip address so everybody can connect to the same printer all the time and then we're going to leave it here where it says query the printer and automatically select the driver to use what that does it pings the printer and says hey i'm trying to add you but do you have a driver and then the, if it's like a more advanced or a newer printer it's going to have that driver it's going to automatically push it to the computer and it's going to install it you know same thing when you're adding a local printer you may have to download the driver install the driver but then you would just simply search for the specific name of the printer you know once you click next it may if it doesn't find if it doesn't find the driver and it's going to bring you to 
Um, nothing's going to happen here, so I can't really show you this at this time. But what happens, it's, it's going to say, okay, I found this IP address. I know it's a printer there, but which one is it? And then you go through a list that's available there, and you select which model, like, for example, Xerox, blah, 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 and you select and you tell it which printer there is, that, that which type of printer that you're trying to connect. So if it doesn't query and download the driver automatically, you're going to have to ask the user, can you tell me the name and model of that printer? So that way you can get those drivers and install them properly. Once you do that, it's going to automatically <clears throat> set it as default, kind of like this. So if you see one like that, just make sure that it's set as default as the one that she wants, he or she wants, and then make sure it's set as default. See, you have that uh, green um, circle with a check mark in the middle. Okay, and now we're going to add a external or internal note, I should say, added printer as requested. Irvin. And I'm going to close the ticket. And the last one we have there, remember, is the one that we're waiting to see if anything else is going on with that. So remember, this is the one we worked on earlier about, and there were there are no issues at the moment. And I will keep the ticket open for 24 hours um, in case it goes down again. Guys, thank you so much for watching. Um, I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm suspecting about two hours. I appreciate you stopping by, watching, and I appreciate your nice comments. I appreciate your uh, support, clicking the like button, sharing the video, telling your friends about me and all that. I, I, I can't express how much I appreciate that and how much I enjoy making these videos. Um, this particular one was extra long a bit. It was, this one is a little bit exhausting. I don't usually make videos this long just from one. One usually I make uh, from like one, uh, one sitting. I usually make videos about half hour long each tops. And, uh, but it's okay. I don't mind doing this because it's a special video and I really wanted to make this particular video for you guys. If I didn't answer any of your questions, feel free to leave a comment. I'll get to you as soon as I can. Thank you so much. Take care and you have a wonderful day. Thank you for watching. Bye-bye. Hey, what's up, guys? My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Let's keep it moving. If you watched my previous videos, you know that I've been on a roll with these help desk uh, tutorials. We're going to keep it moving with third-party software. You have to be allowed to install third-party software, meaning the biggest issue here is obviously having a license. You got to have a license to install third-party software. The second thing is whether it's allowed by the policy in relation to the company on how they deal with security when it comes to type of software. Because some software may be a risk to the company and we don't want to install that and you don't want to lose your job. So it's incredibly important that you uh, are very careful, especially as help desk, but what you take from this video is that you got to be careful when it comes to somebody requesting software. There is a procedure for that and that, that procedure has to be followed. As simple as that. So let's have a look at how that goes. I need to have Oracle DB, Oracle Database, installed. on my computer. I'm going to assign it to myself and we're going to work it. We're going to keep it going, guys. We're just going to keep it going. All right. It says, I need to have Oracle DB installed on my computer and same thing repeated in the description and it's this guy named Mike Moser. All right, Mike. So you got to be careful with this because when it comes to installing third-party software, and this guy is, in this case, Oracle Database is a third-party software, no matter how you look at it, we have to make sure that it's okay for you to install this for them. So what we're actually going to do, and preferably 
you'd want to talk to the customer over the phone. This is how I prefer it. You can do it any way you like. You can send an email, a reply to them. You can send them an instant message and see, uh, see if you can get more information. But what would you guys do? How would you guys handle this? You got to be very, very careful because we can't, we can't just install Oracle database on their computer without permission. So here's, here are a couple of different things that could be happening here. Mike here, Mike Moser, he may already have a license to install Oracle DB. And he already maybe has requested it over, requested it through proper channels. And maybe he just doesn't know how to install it. And he already has all of this, all of these permissions. So we're going to ask him this. We're going to start with this. Hello. You guessed it. My name is Irvin. You're going to be doing this a lot, except you're going to be using your own name, of course. <laughs> With PC support, I have your ticket about installing Oracle DB. Do you have, or let's just do this. There are many ways of doing this. Did you request a license? for this software software or and you know we can send this or depends how how it is on your in your business in your setup in your business you can also say before i install this software I have to check to see if it's on approved software list. So if you send a message to him like this, it kind of gives it almost like open-ended in the sense that customer may reply to you and say, hey, I already have it. I already have it. I just need it installed meaning that I already have it approved. Of course, you have to check that real quick. And then sometimes you may have to install it manually. But also, he, Mike, might actually already have it installed. Mike might, might even have it installed already on his computer, in which case he may need help with configuration, which is not necessarily something that you as help desk uh, tier one would be able to do. But if you're doing desktop support or tier two help desk, you should be able to configure software. In this case, Oracle database, uh, you may need like things like a uh, database driver installed or something like that. And I'll show you that as soon as I, uh, I'll show you that briefly as soon as I, you know, kind of talk about this part of it. But when it comes to help desk tier one, you have to make sure number one, that it's approved and number two, that you install it for them, whatever that might be. You may have a program that handles pushing of the software to the computers, and you may help them. You may need to help them subscribe their computer to this piece of software. Subscribe meaning that basically um, you tell the system that his computer name, and remember we use Kobelman 1 as a computer name a lot, that it has that computer, Kobelman 1, subscribe to Oracle DB. So what in, in, in that case, it should automatically install itself. But it also, what he might mean is actually configuration. So I have to check that. But if, when it comes to just simple installation, you should be able to handle this as help desk tier one. Now, let me just show you briefly what I mean by setting up Oracle database. I'm just going to, it's a little bit slightly off topic, but I do want to show you if when it comes to configuration, this is done through administrative tools here on the computer itself. And it's done here under one of these. So let's say you're installing or configuring Oracle database driver. It would be somewhere in here. And what happens is, is that you would have uh, the Oracle driver in here. 
you know, for example, in here, you would have a Oracle driver that's already in there, and then you configure it whatever the system that you want. So you would just click Add, and then you would select which one you want to use, and then you go in through the configuration, set up the ports, IP addresses, uh, server names, or whatever it needs to be. So if you're not comfortable with that, that's fine. You don't necessarily have to be the guy that does it. It just depends on the level and the requirements for the company. Again, this is possibly help desk tier two. Definitely desktop support uh, person would actually deal with this. Okay, I'm going to go back to that system. All right, but in this case, we're going to assume that he just wanted it installed. So we went ahead and installed it. I'm going to add internal node. Install. Well, let's do this. Let's do this. Subscribed PC to Oracle DB means that we told the internal system to go ahead and push and the internal system or internal setup has approved it for it to be installed. And then I'm going to do this installed software as requested. Okay. And now we're going to close the ticket as complete. All right. Easy peasy. And there you have it, guys. Just make sure you follow these basic rules when it comes to dealing with this. And it's not going to be a problem for you in the future. Thank you guys so much for watching. Please don't forget to like, share, and leave comments. I'm sorry if I missed any of your comments during the premiere. And uh, yeah, I'm not trying to ignore anybody at any point. But if I... If just in case, if I do, I apologize. You can always leave a comment below and I'll gladly answer any of your questions or if you just want to say hi. All right, guys, I'll see you next time. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Hi guys, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Today's video is about help desk tickets. Most common help desk tickets that come through the system. It's based off my video that I made recently for training purposes. It's about two hours long if you want to check it out. It's an excellent video for people trying to get a feel of what help desk is about. Topics are going to be based off of that. So what I'm doing is, is taking parts of that from the videos and creating separate videos for each topic because in that video there are 12 separate issues that are most common to help desk. I hope you guys like it. Please take a moment to click the like button. Every time you guys do that, I really appreciate it. And I know you guys do it too. Thank you so much. First topic is going to be about PDF file not working. It's an interesting one. Pay attention on how I deal with this and also how I deal with the customer when it comes to communicating this issue with them. Very important. First ticket we have here, it's called PDF files don't open. Of course, make sure that you assign the ticket to yourself when you're working it so you can get credit for it. The title of this one says PDF, PDF files do not open or don't open. And in the description, it says, for some reason, PDF files do not work. So what do you guys think the issue is here? I'm going to allow a few seconds here in case you're interacting uh, live with me or watching this video to uh, for you to give me the answer. But I'm going to also keep it moving at the same time, but give you a little bit time to answer uh, before I actually give you the answer for this. While you guys do that, I'm going to reply to the customer and I'm going to get some information from them first. First, I'm going to introduce myself. Hello. My name is Irvin with, why well, I can't spell today, with help desk support. I have your ticket about PDF files not working. Can you please send me your computer name or IP address? So when I reply to this customer and I click save here, it's gonna send them an email and it's going to ask them this information that I am inquiring about. And the reason for that is because in this situation, we're going to have to access their computer with remote desktop in order to resolve this issue. 
Uh, sometimes we can fix these things just by telling them on how to fix it, but it's preferable, if possible, for you to actually fix it and not necessarily tell the user how to fix it. If you have to, that's fine. Of course, this is going to depend on the company that you work for. You know, depends on the, what the requirements are. But chances are, if you're help desk, you're going to take control of their computer, take a look at the problem, and resolve it as quickly as possible. So for that to happen, for us to use remote desktop, we're going to need their computer name or IP address. Both of those things are valid for us to use in order to access their computer remotely. So in this case, PDF files do not work. So number one thing that usually happens is that PDF reader is not installed. So, so Adobe program is not installed that allow us to view PDF files. A lot of times that's the main thing. Or there are alternative software that they can be used to view PDF files, but chances are this is what's happening. Second thing that can happen is that it's file association thing. You may have Adobe installed on the computer, but if if it's still not, or if the PDF files are still not using um, Adobe Reader to open or nothing happens, that means we need to change the uh, file association. We're going to change that right now. Now keep in mind that when it comes to dealing with users or customers, follow the instructions that they have on the ticket on how they prefer to be contacted. In this case, all I did was reply to their request because I know that this will send them an email. However, they may sometimes specify they want to be contacted via, um, via you know, via phone or they just want maybe uh, some kind of an instant message. Uh, some, you know, most companies are going to have some kind of instant messaging system or they just want email reply. Whatever their preferences are, make sure you, fo make sure you follow that to the T. Very important because those are this is what user feels most comfortable with. In this case, we send them an email, and once we get a reply, and let's say you're uh, since this is a fictional customer, uh, let's say we do get a reply, and um, let's say maybe we are talking to them. Maybe the customer said that the PC name is C O B U m a n one so what i'm going to do in that case i'm going to add an internal note for us um, as in tech support people to have on file so i'm going to say users pc name is kobuman one so i'm going to use that to access this kobuman one pc and then see what's going on all right, now let's look at that system. All right, here we are inside of the system. I'm going to show you how you would check for this. First thing I'm going to do is just search for Adobe. Adobe Reader shows up right there, so that's good. We know Adobe's installed. If it's not installed, we're going to reinstall it, given that uh, your company allows for Adobe Reader to be installed, which chances are it will be. If it's still not working, I'm just going to open up file association, which is also known as default apps in Windows. Um, there is also a file association different window that kind of looks like this, but this is what it is now in Windows 10. As soon as this loads, we're going to look for PDF. So I'm just going to scroll down and we're going to look on the left left hand side here for .pdf extension. So if, if we scroll down, it should be here. Here we go. O, and then we're coming. Uh, we're approaching P, so should be here shortly. PDF. There it is. PDF. We can now see that PDF in this case is actually opened in uh, Microsoft Edge. We simply click on that and change it to Adobe Reader. There you go. Problem solved. Uh, some people prefer for PDF to be opened up in a browser which is fine too, you just ask them what they want. All right, all right, that ticket is resolved. I'm going to add internal note, changed file association. Sorry guys, I can't concentrate on spelling today properly, but good thing we have that 
red underline thing, I can just right click, change file association to allow PDF to change file association to resolve PDF issues. That's fine. We know what we did. So if anybody else looks at that, whether it's your boss or you know somebody has to refer to it to that ticket and see what you did, they'll know what you did. So issue resolved. We're going to close this ticket as such. So yeah, keep in mind, follow the rules of what the customer prefers to be uh, with the rules that in which customer prefers to be talked to. Very important. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you. I am trying to make as much as many videos as I can when it comes to this type of topic. I also try to branch out to other things that are more advanced, tier two, tier three, system admin, network admin, and whatnot. I have a huge collection of videos that you can check out that I've already made. Chances are, if you think of a topic and you wanted to ask me about it, please do in the comments below. But you can also go to my channel. Just go to youtube.com forward slash Kobuman. And there is a search button right underneath the uh, picture of the channel. There is a search button in there. So if you want to click on that and just type in the topic, chances are I have it. I also have a website called CosmicNovo.com. It has a lots of written material you can check out. And especially if you are interested in help when it comes to getting that job. So interview questions and answers. I have a lot of that stuff. All right. Thanks again. Please share a like and leave a comment. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. This is a quick desktop support tutorial on how to share an extra drive over the network. So why would you want to do this? If you want to have a centralized point on your home network and you want to share a drive that has, for example, some media files on it or some important files that you want to have quick access to or simply take up a lot of space, and you want to be able to sit and simply access it from another computer on the network, this is how you would do it. One way to do that is to share it. So let's go through this and how to do it. Let's say that this drive here is the drive I want to share. It's called new volume and it's under letter E. We're going to right click it and we're going to select properties. And then we're going to look for a tab that says sharing. We're going to select sharing. And then underneath what we're looking for is a button called advanced sharing. We're going to select that. And then we're going to simply do a check mark right here where it says share this folder. And uh, one last thing that we have to do here in order to be able to, you know, read and write on our share drive over the network, we have to change the permissions here, which is super simple. We're going to select permissions here. And we can see that by default, everyone is allowed to do so which normally is fine. And this is why by default, you can only read, but you cannot change or write or anything like that. And especially you don't have full control. So if you want to simply select full control and allow everyone that's on the network have access to this, you can certainly do so and that would solve your problem. However, I like to add my own login because I don't want everybody to access it. So in order to do that, I'm going to remove these. I'm going to leave it read only so that everyone can see it, but they can't make changes and I'm going to add my own login. So if, if I click add, I can add my own login name, which is used for this computer where this drive is located. This is incredibly important. You want to use the login for this computer. So login name for my computer is Kobuman zero. And I'm going to, you can simply double check by click check names if you want, but I, I know it exists obviously. So I'm just going to click OK. Now we can see that it's there and it's under the name of the computer, which is called Kobuman and the login name is Kobuman zero. So this is important to remember here that the name of this computer where this drive is located is called Kobuman. So before we leave this pop up or before we leave this, uh, box, we have to make sure that our login is selected and then we select full control. Because if you go down to here, we can still see that everyone only has read option. And then if we do select Kobo we can still 
see that it is full control this will allow us to create new files folders drop drag and drop anything we want and full access to it incredibly important all right now let's click apply and OK. After you click apply and OK, you can see that now this drive is being shared and it's indicated by two little guys here as an icon. Now let's go to the other computer and see what we can do to access this. Here we go. Here's our other computer that we're at. And now we just need to access it. So how do we do that? We remember the name of the computer, which is Kobuman, correct? We're going to type in backslash backslash Kobuman and then another backslash and we're going to type in the letter E which was the drive letter for our drive that is being shared over there. I'm going to hit enter and there we go. We have access to it. But wait, this is under everyone. Remember, we didn't put in our credentials at all. It may ask you at some point if you're doing this for the first time to actually put in your credentials but if you didn't get a pop-up, you'll be using it on the default, which is everyone. So how do we rectify that? I mean, it's great. If you got the pop-up, you can just simply put in your login information. But this is just us able to access it. Let's go ahead and create what would look like just like a regular hard drive. And that is called mapping the network drive. So we're going to select our computer and we're going to select map network drive. Now let me go back, make sure you're at this tab where it says this PC and then select computer up here and then select map network drive. And here we can leave the drive letter to whatever we want. And then we're going to type in again, backslash, backslash, name of the computer, which is Kobuman, and then backslash and then drive letter. One thing to make sure to do is place a check mark right here, which says connect to using different credentials this will let us specify the login we want to use with full control and with the pop-up here uh, we can see that um, i already tried this earlier but let's go ahead and this is how it looked like i'm going to click you know use different account and then i'm going to type in the name for the login on the remote computer which is kobuman zero and i'm going to type in my password and select remember my credentials you know, kind of remember to select that, click OK. And now we're inside of our drive. You can see now it comes up as a network location. Another way to do this is add a network location, but I just map it as a network drive. So now that we go inside of it, we have direct access to it. We can create new folder. We can go inside, create new files, drag and drop, whatever we want. And it's all great and dandy. This is also a good way to use a remote drive as a backup location if you are doing desktop support. For example, let's say you're you know, re-imaging a computer and you need a remote location to use as a backup for users' profiles. This is a good way of doing it. So you have a backup. Also, if you're replacing your hard drive or something like that, that you need a good remote place to quickly backup all your files. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, please share it or like it. If you have any questions, I am here to help you answer them. So feel free to ask me anything. Thank you and have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. In today's video, I will talk about Gmail in comparison to Outlook. Here's the thing. A lot of businesses are actually moving away from Outlook to Gmail, probably because of the operation cost when it comes to running Outlook servers and, and this and that. That's besides the point. The point is that I'm going to teach you on how to at least try to make Gmail look like Outlook, because what happens is a lot of users that are converted to Gmail from Outlook, they're going to look for similar features that are not apparent when it comes to using Gmail in comparison to Outlook. So these are the things I'm going to teach you real quick. So that way you can have an easier time dealing with the transition to Gmail for your business. And of course, this could also be very helpful if you're just trying to learn about Gmail for personal use. So let's look at some things that are actually identical when it comes to Gmail and Outlook. You can see on the left hand side, we have inbox and typical folders that come with Outlook. So when it comes to sent mail, drafts, 
um, you know, all email spam and trash. Um, when it comes to some other things like categories, social promotion, updates, and forums, these are not available in Outlook by default, right? So when it comes to the left-hand side functionality of Gmail, it's, I'd say, pretty identical when it comes to Outlook comparison. So, the, you know, of course, you can see that there is a button to compose, and that's kind of self-explanatory. You click to compose, and then you can create a new email just like in Outlook, right? So that's pretty similar. So what is here that it's kind of different that you kind of notice right off the bat? Well, you can see that Gmail kind of looks plain. And that actually Google has been working on a little bit. So the reason I'm actually mentioning this is because this is an older version of Gmail. So what we're going to do is actually switch over to the new version of Gmail, which is what most people are starting to use now. So on the right hand side here, there's a little cog here. So for the settings, you can click it and then select try new Gmail, which should be the very first thing that shows up. So it's going to be look different. There's a new icon that loads up and it looks look nicer and it probably has quite a more quite quite a bit more functions that are better from comparison to the classic gmail which you can also go back to if you really wanted to as well right you can see now that on the left hand side things got changed a little bit and this is why i didn't talk about them initially first uh too much about them initially because it's slightly different we have a couple of different buttons there that are different so let me go over these real quick just so you guys familiar what they are you know what the inbox is i don't have to tell you this where all the main the main email comes through just like in outlook the second thing is called start here you can see there's nothing there well the point of this is actually same thing as if you were to flag as an important email in outlook right except it's kind of groups it into one so the way you do that is just select a little star right you click on it and it's just called it starred all this is just kind of marked as important so if you go back to starred that that email is actually there you know that's like one way to marking like important emails so if i disable that it's not going to be in there again and here you can snooze emails meaning that you can uh, you know read them later basically so you can just set a different time and you can read them later and i'm going to go over this real quick and then we got the sent ones which is basic and we got drafts right so when it comes to that that's exactly what it said and of course you have an important tab which you can also use to um, mark other important emails if you want in my opinion i just use stared because i find it more convenient but if you want to explore this you can certainly do so and of course we get chats which is not available in outlook and we also got all mail right we have something like this similar in outlook so basically that happens in outlook whenever you search for something you can choose so let's say i'm searching for a test email then in the right hand side right here when it comes to outlook and let me show you here this is just something i was looking at previously this is a broken outlook but i can show you nonetheless if i type in test here i can use a drop down here and just say all mail boxes and it's going to search all of them right same difference when it comes to this here if you select all mail it will show all mail that is available so you can search through it right and of course you got spam and trash right all right moving on to other comparison things that we need to adjust so we make it look like outlook at least so that the users have an easier time transitioning over all right so the next thing that most people are kind of missing here is a preview pane right now if you select on this email from andy from google it's just going to pop it up and some people like this you know this is fine and whenever you click reply and by the way when i click reply here it will pop up on the bottom like so and it kind of looks like a chat box doesn't it this is one thing i don't particularly care for when it comes to google but it is their design but nonetheless it's similar when it comes to outlook except in outlook it a lot of times it's just another pop-up box um, of course if you have preview pane enabled which we will do right now um, it's kind of similar to outlook when it comes to that right so by default the outlook has a preview pane let me go back to inbox so we can demonstrate the preview pane so whenever you select an email you will have a preview by default 
the preview pane is on vertically on the right side in Outlook. So we're going to enable that. If you go to settings here, which is a little cog here, it's going to bring us it's going to bring us to our settings. So the next thing we want to actually look for is advanced tab, which is third to last right here. And this is why I didn't want to go through this on the classic version because it's a bit different. And you know, this one actually has more things when it comes to uh, settings. So it's going to be a third to last tab. And then we're going to look for our preview pane, which is going to be down here. So we're going to have to select enable for the preview pane and we're going to select save changes. Now it's going to reload Gmail and then we're going to have a, another button that we can actually use to create different types of preview panes, which is actually right here. If you look on the right hand side, if you hover over, it says toggle split pane mode. And if we do that, it's going to toggle the mode. However, if you do a little drop down here, you can specify which do you, which one you want. So if you select vertical split, this is how it's, this is how it looks like. So if you select on any of these emails, let's click on Andy's email. You can see that there's a preview pane just like in Outlook by default. Of course, you can change this to horizontal split and it's going to bring it down here, right? Some, some people like it that way, you know, so that's perfectly fine. Uh, but I'm just going to go back to default, which is this, right? This is how it looks like, looks like on default email from uh, Outlook's default uh, format when it comes to email preview pane, right? So if we go here and select reply, it's going to pop up with our little reply. And this is kind of what Outlook does. It just looks slightly different, but Outlook kind of does the same thing when you have preview pane enabled, all right? So let me go ahead and remove that. And I'll actually go back to the reply part of it just so I can help you out. Some, some very basic things that we actually need to work on when it comes to setting up our Gmail properly to make sure we have a smooth transition. Uh, but let me show you how to change something real quick, which I personally don't care for. And that is a default feature within Gmail that basically groups all the similar emails into one group of emails into just one. For example, let's see, here's a, a email from Google and there's another email from Google. Um, Gmail has a habit of grouping these similar emails into one group. So instead of just having two emails like this, it would say two just here. And then when you click it, it would expand and you have the ability to actually use other, you can see the other related emails that came through. And I don't like that because it kind of groups them together. Right. I like to see individual emails like so, right, just like it is in Outlook. So we have to make sure that this is disabled if you are like me and you don't like your emails grouped. Right. Um, so if you go back to settings here on the right hand side and then select settings, this one is actually going to be in our general tab. So we don't have to switch anything up here. And if we just have to scroll down and look for conversation view, and this is the thing that I was telling you about when it sees the emails that were the same topic are grouped together. It's going to group them together if you have things that are with similar topics, right? Or same topics, if you will. And it's disabled. Oh, it's, it's enabled by default. So if you want to disable it, just select conversation view off. And now all the emails will be individual. And that's how they would show up. And that's the way I like it. Because I simply want to keep track of every single email that comes through. I don't want it to be to group. I don't want them to be grouped because that way I can miss, especially if there's, you know, I don't know, 20 different emails related to the same thing. You know, this is um, the way I'm setting it up to have an Outlook default feel. So we're just going to keep going with that theme when it comes to this. So the next thing we need to do is set up our reply signatures, right? You know how we can have automatic reply signatures, same thing. We, we can set this up in Gmail and then we, if we go back to settings once more, right? We open up settings. It's still going to be in our general tab. And if we scroll down, if we scroll down, we just have to look for our signature tab. It's very simple. By default, it's turned off. But if we go here and select our radio uh, tab, uh, we're just going to click it, right? Radio button, I should say. And we're going to type in you know, the typical stuff that you would type in, you know, and then you can sign off, you know, at, I don't know, cobalman.com, you know, and then type in your phone number, you know, five, 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 let's see, five, 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 five. 
right? So typical type of signature that, you know, whatever you want, whatever is custom for you. Once you insert that, you can select save. You have to always select save if you want any changes to take effect. So if you go back here and we want to reply to Andy, we say reply, right? We can see that, you know, where, where's, where's our signature, right? You know, usually we would just say, thank you. And then we would type in body of the email, you know, and then blah, blah, right? And I'm like, okay, where's, where's my signature? I like my signature to be right after I type things right after the body i wanted to finish off there here's the problem with when you set it up by default it actually doesn't do that and i i personally do not like that so what happens is if you if i click here show trimmed content it's actually going to show it that it's, it's going to show it as in the last thing after the initial email sent to me which doesn't make sense to me whatsoever why should i sign off on an email that was already sent to me by somebody else I don't like that. I want this, I want this to appear, to appear right up here, right up here, right? And if you're like me, this is how you will do it. Let's go back to settings, right? Settings. And then we're going to scroll down once more. And the only thing we have to do now is select here, this little checkbox. And it says, insert the signature before quoted text in replies. And that's exactly what we want. Of course, we're going to have to save again. And now we go over here and try to reply to Andy. We can see that inserted our signature right where we want it. So if I type in, thank you, body of the email, blah, blah. I can see that my signature is inserted there automatically exactly where I want it to be. One last thing as a kind of a tip that a lot of people also ask is how to change this so it doesn't look so bright. I don't like it bright either. You know what I mean? So let's go ahead and change the art theme. But before that, let me talk about the calendar as one of the last things that I almost forgot to talk about. A lot of people, you know, like to use their calendar. I do. I love it. I love the reminders in Outlook. It's one of the best things of that are part of outlook in this case our calendar is on the right hand side here and this is only available i'm pretty sure in the new version of gmail so if you're using a classic one it means that it may not be there I, we can double check let's go back to classic real quick and hopefully it doesn't mess up my other settings and sure enough it's not there you know you have to kind of go over here and then look you know for the calendar so if we go back to new gmail we can see that our calendar is actually on the right hand side as soon as it loads i know i selected it there it goes okay now we have our calendar which is kind of similar as outlook except outlook's calendar is on the bottom uh like here you know that's where it's at and uh unfortunately it's on the right hand side when it comes to gmail uh, so uh, i don't think there's a way to move it unfortunately but let's go ahead and have a look how it lo you know just take a look how it looks like so if we select the calendar it's going to load whatever's available and it says welcome you know that's fine and now it's just going to show it as default just for our for today right so if you have anything set up here it's going to show it just for today or you can just click on previous day forward you know any type of days that you want to look at right this this is something i don't necessarily care for because if you if you go back to calendar here it kind of shows the whole calendar right in outlook so unfortunately the only way to actually get to the full calendar thing that i know of and i'll be very curious if you guys know a better way to go about this is to actually open in the new tab right so now you know now we have our calendar and we can actually change this to a different type of calendar that will show not just days or weeks but even months or a year so if you select that to months we can see there are what kind of looks like the google's calendar in comparison right this is how i like it right so you can do that and unfortunately i don't think there's a way to do it any other way to do it unless you actually open it 
in a new tab as in like a full window, right? So that's one way you can make it closer to how Outlook looks like over here, right? So as I promised, last thing we're going to do is change the theme so it's not so bright. If we go here <laughs> on our settings tab and then we select themes, we can choose from a bunch of different ones. I personally, I mean, there are a bunch of colorful ones. If, if you like that, then, you know, just kind of play around. I personally like really dark ones like this black one. And then when I switch to that, it looks so much better and easier on the eyes. In my opinion, of course, this is one of those personal preferences. So there you have it, guys. Now we have our Gmail set up to look as, as best as we could as the Outlook, right? All right, guys, I hope you like this video. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Share this video with friends if you like it. Leave a like if you like it. Hey, if you dislike it, click a dislike. That's fine, too. But again, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I have a lot of other desktop support, help desk, network administration, system administration, web development, and all kinds of other IT videos, including hardware, if you want to check that out. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. I wish you best of luck and have a good day. Hello, my friends. My name is Irvin, also known as Kobelman. In today's video, I wanted to talk about the program data folder. This is different from app data folder, which is something I talked about in my previous video. If you're interested in that, there will be a pop-up link right up here, also at the end of the video. It's totally different because it's not user specific. So what do I mean by that? So let's go ahead and find our program data folder. If we go to root of C, um, program data folder is actually within here, but you can't see it because it's set to be a hidden object. If you enable hidden items, program data folder will show up. So it's root of C and then program data. Once we go inside of it, you can see there are a bunch of different folders in here. So what is it? Th what is this used for? In my personal experience, especially when it comes to desktop support or PC support or any kind of administration, it's related to program data that it's not user specific. So for example, let's say we have an antivirus software, which in this case, this is it right here, ImmuNet. This is what I have installed on this computer. If we go inside of it, what we'll have will be just a simple data that's shared across all users that are using this computer. So you can see here, all it is, is just an installation part of it, right? So this is where it stores it. However, some older applications will actually have entire application installed within program data. And then it's then used and shared by all users that are using this computer. Again, this is different from app data, which consists of configuration files and it's found under local profiles. And again, I highly encourage you to watch the video on, on app data. If you go to inside of local profile, you can see the app data folder and it has local, local, low and roaming. This is all configuration settings and data for specific programs within these files. Again, this is on another video. And if you want to watch that, please do. So if we go back to local C and pro, um, root of C and program data, it will have similar files within here. And this could be anything from entire application that's shared across all users that are using this computer or configuration settings like so. You can see there's a bunch of them here, right? And this can also have just different executables that are related to any application that's being installed. This is what I typically see nowadays. And it can also have cache data and everything else. But the main thing to keep in mind when it comes to PC support, desktop support, or help desk is that it can have settings or even entire program within program data. So this is usually, again, this is usually older program that may exist. Again, this is used for shared data across all of the users that are using this computer. And most of the time it's just data that you don't have to worry about. Again, if you go in, into any of these, you can see that it's just mostly just temporary data that you don't necessarily have to worry about or backup because it's shared, right? So whenever user, you know, is logged into this computer and they're using new profile they will have access to that and every and if the user decides to move the most important part that are within uh, their local profile which would be in roaming will be carried over anyways right so there you have it guys now you know in the nutshell what program data consists of and what its purpose is all right, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please like it, share it, leave a comment. I'll answer any questions you may have. Don't forget to subscribe. Have a good day. Bye-bye. 
Hello my friends, my name is Irvin, also known as Kobuman. Welcome to Desktop Support Training Medley. This video serves as a training for someone who wants to do desktop support. So what I've taken is two of my very popular videos and created 18 various problems and solutions scenario for you to learn or test your desktop support skills. If you find that you can answer or deal with any of these issues on your own, well, congratulations, you are ready to apply for desktop support. If you like this video, please share it or like it. I really appreciate it and I wish you best of luck. Have a nice day. Welcome to top 10 desktop PC issues and problems. In this video, we will talk about top 10 desktop PC issues and how to resolve them. Of course, there are multiple ways to resolve any computer issues and the ones presented here provide an example of that. If you know a better solution, please leave me a comment. I would love to learn about other possible solutions for any of these issues. If you are interested in additional educational material, my channel youtube.com forward slash Kobuman has over 300 videos that you can enjoy. Additionally, if you'd like to support me, you can do so through patreon.com forward slash Kobuman link in description below. Number one, blue screen of death. Cause, typically caused by driver or hardware conflict. Solution, take a look at the dump file to figure out exactly what the cause of the error is. Alternatively, update hardware drivers, or consider the situation in which blue screen of death happen. For example, you've installed new hardware or software. Also, you might want to run hardware diagnostics. Number two, missing DLL files. Cause, typically caused by incomplete software installation. Solution. Reinstall software, find the missing DLL, and copy it to System32 and or SysWow6432 folder. Register DLL if needed through command prompt. Example, regsvr32 space and then the name of the DLL. Number three, software or application will not install. Cause, not enough drive space. Newer version already installed. You didn't install prerequisite software. For example, VC Red Disk X64, MS.NET, or DirectX. Or not compatible with the operating system. Solution. Free up space on hard drive. Look for previous installation of newer software. Install all prerequisites. Acquire compatible OS. Number four. Software or OS is running slow. Cause, lack of resources, such as RAM, CPU, or hard drive. Virus or malware infection, missing updates. Solution, open task manager and look for RAM, or virtual memory allocation. Any applications use all of the RAM? 
adjust virtual memory if necessary. Check CPU usage levels. Check your hard drive space. Through Task Manager, check the system processes and look for sketchy names using a lot of CPU or RAM. Virus can have similar name to common Windows components. Perform full system scan for viruses. If you have a virus that you can't remove, consider OS re-image or reinstall. Install all updates for your computer. Let them finish reboot. Updates can take up resources and time. As a side note, you can also upgrade to an SSD storage for a huge boost in OS performance. Link in description below. Number 5. Computer restarting multiple times. Cause software or Windows updates or a virus. Solution Let the Windows updates finish. Windows updates alone can restart the computer many times and take a long time. Run virus scan. Number six. Suddenly, applications or computer behaving abnormally. For example, software keeps crashing, missing files, or runs slow. Cause. Virus infection or hard drive going bad. Solution. Run virus scan. Check Windows system logs for NTFS system errors or other or other hard drive related logs. Replace hard drive if necessary. Number seven. Internet or website issue. Error. 404 page not found. Cause. Page is missing or deleted. Wrong website link or website is down. Solution. If specific page is missing, search the website for desired content. Double check the website link because it may have been changed. If all pages are 404, contact website owner. Number 8. Computer is running hot. Overheating. Cause. Poor airflow. Not enough system fans. Dust or dirt accumulation. CPU fan not working. CPU heatsink is loose. Power supply unit fan is not working. Computer case is open. Overclocking, room or ambient temperature is too high. Solution, add system case fans. Clean your computer from dust. 
If CPU fan is not working, replace it. If CPU heatsink is loose, attach it. If power supply unit fan is not working, replace power supply. Close the computer case. Stop overclocking. Lower room temperature or move the computer. Number 9. Low memory RAM or hard drive storage. Cause. Too many programs open, such as games, video editing software, large Excel spreadsheets, and etc. See Task Manager. Hard drive storage too small. Solution. Close application that use too much RAM and only use one at a time. Perform this cleanup to free up space. This should remove recycle bin, download folder, cache data, temp files, old operating system restore points. Alternatively, you can purchase more RAM or add a second hard drive link in description. Number 10. Very slow internet. Cause. Too many downloads at the same time. Too many computers sharing internet connection. Bad Wi-Fi signal. Virus or malware infection. Solution. Limit downloads. If too many people are sharing internet, you can limit or set max speed in router for even distribution of bandwidth. Check Wi-Fi signal distance and adjust in router. Check PC for virus or malware infection. Reset router. Call internet provider. Question number one. When using a remote desktop, you come to realize that the remote computer is not reachable by using a host name. What would be the troubleshooting steps to take in order to resolve this issue? Keep in mind that the remote computer is turned on and on the same physical network. First, I would check to see if the remote computer's host name is part of the same domain. Also would check to see if the remote computer is enabled within the main if it has been added. Second, I would try to ping the computer by using the host name. If an error comes up, it would determine my next step. For example, if message is cannot resolve host name, I would try pinging the computer using its IP address. Third, I would check for possible DNS issues if computer is reachable with IP address. If using IP address, I can connect to the remote computer or use remote desktop session, it could indicate a replication issue of the DNS server. Lastly, if I have physical access to the computer, I would check the DHCP settings or look at possible hardware issues or LAN connection issues. However, this is unlikely if computer is reachable by IP address or if it has been part of the network for the same time. Question number two. A user has transferred to another department within company and their local profile is missing many files 
and desktop icons. What do you think the issue could be? First, I would ask the users if they move to another computer, which could mean that their files are stored at another machine. It could also mean that the new computer does not have the same software installed and icons for those would not be present. Second, if user has not moved to another machine, I would check the Active Directory if any GPO or domain profile restrictions for users' new department are affecting the ability to create, view, or edit files, which could also be the reason for not seeing certain desktop icons. Third, user may have received a new domain login ID, which inherently does not have access to previously used local profile, which has the old login ID attached to it. Lastly, if any of the situations described apply, I would act accordingly to resolve the issue. If users' files are located somewhere else, and if permitted by the company's policy, I would transfer them back to user. Same goes for any software that is missing. Question number three. Your office receives a new printer, and now it needs to be configured for everyday use by a specific department in your building. How would you go about installing this printer in direct IP printing setup? First, I would unpack the printer and make sure that it has all parts and cables. Then I would connect and plug in the printer into power and network port available at designated location. Second, I would make sure that this new printer has a static IP address assigned to it and acquire a driver package for a specific model of the printer unless the printer is set up to push the driver automatically and upon request. Typically, printer would push the driver. Third, Active Directory needs to know of the printer added to the domain and this can be done by assigning a printer hostname and adjusting GPO settings that allows the users of that department to use that printer. If driver has to be pushed separately, this can be configured as well. Lastly, I would notify the users of the new printer and its IP address and assist accordingly. Question number four, what is the best way to install OS on 100 computers manually, meaning you don't have an option to boot over the network or any automated systems available. First, I would make sure that all computers are connected to the network and turned on. Of course, if these are new computers and I have an option to image them before deploying, I would try to keep them in the same area for easy access. Second, I would acquire host names for each machine so they can be added to domain. This can be assigned through Active Directory. Third, because booting over the network does not work, I would create multiple OS install media to use, for example, CD or USBs. Afterwards, I would manually boot to inserted media and execute OS imaging process. Lastly, upon image completion, I would ensure that each computer has a host name attached and is added to domain or workgroup. In addition, I would install any software required per department templates or requests. Let's just pause for a few seconds here. As you may have noticed, all of these questions require you to explain your way of doing things. I also have top 20 desktop support questions and answers that talk about specific technical aspects of the interview link in the video description below. Question number five. From a desktop support point of view, how would you deal with user migration to a new domain? How would you deal with users affected by this change? First, I would make sure that users and their management is aware that this change is coming and how it will affect them. Second, I would choose a few machines to be converted ahead of time for testing purposes. This can be communicated with the network team. 
Third, I would reach out to department managers to coordinate the switch so that the production impact is minimized. This would involve application and website access testing on the new domain before converting everyone else. Lastly, once all testing on a new domain is successful, a green light would be given to convert all other host machines to the new domain. Question number six. The entire building is switching over to the gigabit network and you are to assist with this process. How would you handle this project? First, I would work with the network team to decide on the new IP network ranges and make sure that certain machines receive static IP addresses. Second, if any network cables need to be upgraded, it would be coordinated with members of desktop support and the network team. For example, CAT5E is a minimum cable rating for gigabit speeds. Third, if any changes affect printers and other static devices such as servers, this has to be communicated to users and make appropriate changes to each machine. Lastly, the most important thing would be the testing part before deployment because there is a chance that certain applications require firewall exceptions for their IP or our range of IP addresses. Question number seven. One day you come into work and find that major systems are down. However, you also see that ticketing system has 50 plus unassigned or unworked tickets. How would you prioritize and how would you go about dealing with both problems? First, I would ask which systems are down and how many users are impacted. This will determine which issue to work on first. Tickets would be the last priority. Second, if multiple system issues are related, then I would handle this issue on my own, if possible. If issues are not related, in that case, I would recruit help from coworkers and possibly assigned individually if manager is not present. Third, I would proceed to troubleshoot the issue and get as much information as possible before reaching out to any other support groups that manage specific aspects of systems affected. In this case, support team is essential to resolve major issues that are not at immediate access to myself or desktop support team. Lastly, once issues with major systems are resolved and the bulk of users are back to work, then I would concentrate on resolving tickets unassigned. Of course, it goes without saying that during crisis issue, all of the management would be notified of progress and solution, and lastly, the root cause. Question number eight, explain a situation in which you had to deal with difficult problem and how you went about resolving it. First, an example of which I had difficulty resolving happened all the time, and this is due to not having immediate access to systems involved. Anytime I had to deal with a server network or website issue that I don't have access to, I would have to involve other groups or members of IT IT team to assist. Second, a more specific example would be a web-based systems application stopped functioning which affected 500 plus users and since I don't have access to the application server, the support team for that application was immediately contacted because the issue was affecting multiple users which means the issue is not local due to that fact. Of course, the first thing I would look at is the error information that would provide clues to what the issue may be. Third, I would gather all information related to the system outage, which would typically include number of users, specific errors, example computer IP addresses affected, time the issue occurred, and also test to see if issue persists using alternative methods. To make sure that this issue res is resolved as fast as possible, this information is crucial. Upon having this information available, appropriate support teams would be contacted. Lastly, 